Inshallah, tonight we're starting a new series. So sorry about my voice. I'll do the best I can. Recovering from a cold. Um, the, the title of the class is Selected Readings From and Reflections Upon um, a world-famous text um, on prophetology called Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Iyad ibn Musa rahimahullah ta'ala. <clears throat> Um, the, and we'll start promptly at 7 uh, every week, and then we have to end right at 8. Uh, so I'll go through the text, and you can ask questions as they come up. Just raise your hand, inshallah ta'ala. Um, so the, the, uh, the text is four parts. Uh, the fourth part of the text is on the ahkam, the legal rulings. Uh, we're actually going to skip this part. It requires a lot of uh, contextualization, a lot of commentary. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this class. Uh, the first three parts we will touch upon. The first part is concerning the descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the Quran and Hadith. It's four chapters. <clears throat> the second part is concerning the rights which people owe to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's four chapters. The third part is concerning belief in the Prophet, so aqidah, prophetology, uh, the wajibat, the mustahilat, and the mumkinat, the ob obligatory, the inconceivable, and the conceivable attributes of any Prophet, really. And that's two chapters. So the first part has four chapters, the second part has four chapters, the third part has two chapters, so that's ten chapters. We have ten weeks. So we'll take a chapter a week, inshallah ta'ala. Um, we're not going to read through the entire chapter, it's just not enough time, so I will highlight some basic or main points, textual highlights of each chapter. Um, the main thing is just to read the text. Millions of people have this text sitting on their bookshelf at home, but people don't read books. Uh, that's just the human condition. The vast majority of books around the world are never read. So a gathering like this is simply an opportunity for you to relax and listen uh, to someone else reading the text, inshallah ta'ala, or at least a portion of it. <clears throat> so we'll begin, inshallah ta'ala, the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we talk about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we have to be sort of weary of our uh, intentions, um, that we should be, uh, we should sit um, uh, in a respectful way, we should pay attention. When Imam Malik ibn Anas was approached by students, they would ask him, let's study fiqh, and he would immediately begin giving them lessons. And they would ask him to study hadith, he would actually go and take a shower, he would put on clean clothes, he would apply perfume, uh, and he would, he would uh, he would teach the hadith, the, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with the utmost respect and reverence. <clears throat> and he expected his students to also have that type of reference, uh, reverence. Inshallah ta'ala. So chapter 1, <clears throat> Allah's praise of him and his great esteem for him. So he says here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ A messenger has come unto you from among yourselves. This is the famous ayah in Surah At-Tawbah, ayah number 128. The commentator here actually has a, a footnote saying that there's a, a variant reading of this ayah. مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ means from among yourselves, but there's another reading um, which is not as strong. It's a shad reading. So it's um, anomalous. It's, uh, it has the strength of a hadith. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفَسِكُمْ أَنفَسِكُمْ Rather than أَنفُسِكُمْ Both are correct in meaning, but أَنفُسِكُمْ is tawatur. It's multiply attested, so only this can be recited in prayer. But أَنفَسِكُمْ is the superlative of nafis, which means precious. So the ayah can be understood. A messenger has come unto you. Uh, from the most precious among you. That the Prophet ﷺ is the most precious of human beings. <clears throat> now, Qadi Iyad says, 
Allah informs the believers or the Arabs or the people of Mecca or all people, according to different commentaries on the meaning of these words, that he has sent to them from among themselves a messenger whom they know, whose position they are sure of, and whose trustworthiness and truthfulness they cannot but recognize. So reputation and integrity are extremely important. Um, it was Aristotle who said that there are three modes of effective persuasion. If you want to persuade someone of a point that you're making, you should have a logos, and that's basically strong reasoning. You should make sense. You should have pathos, which is an appeal to emotion. So you're not sort of monotone. I'm very monotone, I guess. Uh, that's why it's important for there to be some sort of emotional connection with the speaker. And then ethos. Ethos is uh, the integrity of the speaker himself or herself. That this is extremely important. The Prophet Wasallam, he was nicknamed by the Quraysh before the Wahi, before the, the descent of the Quran. He was nicknamed as Sadiq al Amin. <clears throat> so, this is someone who is recognized amongst all the Arabs as someone who is truthful and trustworthy. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him in the Quran to remind his people Faqad labithtu fikum umra min qablihi, that indeed I have lived an entire lifetime before this. In other words, look back at my life. There was nothing that they could point to in the past and say, now you're claiming to be prophet. What about when you did X, Y, and Z in the past? What about that? And this is a problem people have today. Even people who make toba and they move on, there are other, there's always going to be people who are going to look in their past. What about when you said this or did that? Right? The prophet's reputation is without question. <clears throat> no one can point to anything in his past. So this is something that they recognize. He says, therefore, since he is one of them, they should not suspect him of lying or of not giving them good counsel. There is no Arab tribe without descent from or kinship with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. <clears throat> this, according to Ibn Abbas and others, is the meaning of his words, except love for kin. So he's, he's mentioning, he's, he's, uh, he's partially quoting an ayah from Surat Shura, Chapter 42, verse 23. It's a very famous ayah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Say, so the qul is an imperative to the Prophet sallallahu Say, I do not ask for any type of reward for this except for love of kin. And Ibn Abbas says, the meaning is something like, O oh, Quraysh, you should keep good relations between you and me because we are all kin. In other words, if the Prophet ﷺ is honored, then Quraysh will be honored because he is from the Quraysh. Other exegetes like Ibn Ajiba and Imam al-Qurtubi, <clears throat> they say that this ayah is a reference to the Prophet's Ahl al-Bayt, a family of the Prophet ﷺ, that this is an imperative in the, in the Quran to love the Prophet's family. Imam al-Shafi'i said, uh, Ya ahla bayti Rasulillah, hubbukum fardun alayna fi kitabillah. O people of the prophetic house, uh, love of you is obligatory upon us according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he is the noblest, highest, and most exalted of them. And then he asked a rhetorical question, how much further in the ayat can praise go? Then Allah continues the ayah. This is again ayah 128 of at tawbah Then Allah goes further by attributing to him all kinds of praiseworthy qualities and greatly praises his eagerness to guide them to Islam, his deep concern for the intensity of what afflicts and harms them in this world and the next. So, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ And then, عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِدْتُمْ There is coming to you a messenger from among yourselves, it grieves him that, that you should perish. Harisun alaykum. He's deeply concerned over you. He's, he's very covetous over you. And the ulama say here, many of the ulama say here, that this part of the ayah is general, it's am, that this concern of the Prophet ﷺ is for humanity at large. And then it becomes more intimate, more khas. Bil mu'minin ra'ufur rahim. 
He is to the believers compassionate <coughs> and merciful. So there's a special type of mercy the Prophet ﷺ manifests for the mu'mineen, for the believers. Of course, there's a famous hadith in Bukhari, is one of my favorite hadith, which uh, exemplifies this. Um, that a man broke his fast in Ramadan. He came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, my wife and I couldn't control ourselves. We broke our fast during the daytime in Ramadan. As uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, free a slave. And he said, I can't afford to do that. And then he said, you have to fast for 60 consecutive days. And the man said, I can't even fast three days of Ramadan. <laughs> and he said, uh, then you have to feed 60 people. He said, I don't have anything. With what? And so the Prophet ﷺ, he went out and got him a big basket of dates. He said, here, take this and feed people. He said, you know, there's nobody more poor than my own family. And then the hadith says, فَضَّحِكَ nabi." The Prophet ﷺ, he smiled until his molar teeth were showing. And he said, then feed your family with it. Right? بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ rahim." <clears throat> One of the men of knowledge, Al Hussein ibn Fadl, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him with two of his own names. So, Ra'uf al Rahim are two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are given to the Prophet. So, this is, um, this is the sort of uh, goal of this life, the telos of this life, what, what philosophers call the final cause of our lives in the earth is to become a saint. The goal is wilaya. The Quran says, Kunu Rabbaniyin. Become lordly. In other words, to mirror the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a human level. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman. No one can be ar-Rahman. Right? That is the, the most compassionate and absolute and infinite sense. But we can become people of Rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Al-Afu, the one who forgives. And we can have that type of personality to forgive people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is As-Salam. As-Salam does not mean the peace. As-Salam means the perfect when it relates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can strive for perfection in our akhlaq. Every one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can appropriate right, uh, uh, into our lives. This is called, this is called takhalluq. Right? Even a name like al-Jabbar, the compeller, how do we appropriate that name? How do we, the compeller, are we supposed to compel people? Well, if somebody commits a crime, the ulama say, then we compel that person to stand trial. Al-Mutakabbir, the one who deems himself big, right, are we supposed to manifest this name? How do we manifest? I asked one of my teachers, and he said, imagine someone's insulting you, but you don't return the insult. You walk away. You deem yourself better than his action, not better than the person. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the heart. In that sense, we can manifest the name of Allah al mutakabbir And there are many ulama write books on this topic. Al-Ghazali has one, Imam Suyuti, and many, many others, Ibn Ajiba. <clears throat> The Prophet Sallallahu Rahim. It is related <coughs> by Sayyidina Ali that he said the words of Allah from among yourselves means by lineage, relationship by marriage and descent. There was no fornicator among his forefathers. From the time of Adam, all of them were properly married. There is no zina in the direct ancestry of the Prophet Sallallahu Many of the ulama also maintain, and there is a difference of opinion about this, Many of them also maintain there's no idolatry in the direct ancestry of the Prophet <clears throat> <clears throat> There's a hadith that's quoted by Imam al-Haddad. The Prophet ﷺ is quoted to have said that I was passed from pure loins to radiant wombs. Pure loins to radiant wombs until I manifested. Of course the Quran says, إِنَّمَا الْمُشْرِكُونَ najis. The mushrikeen are filthy in the sense, spiritual sense. <clears throat> There's the question of the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Azar clearly is a mushrik according to the Quran. 
Well, there's an opinion that this is not his biological father. The biological father of Ibrahim السلام, was not Azar. It was a man named Tariq. And this is what Ibn Hisham says in his seerah of the Prophet وسلم, that his name was Tariq, and this is actually also, although this is not a definitive source by any means, but Israelite tradition, the Torah, the book of Genesis, also mentions his name as Terah, not Azar. So when Ibrahim السلام, says, Ya Abati to Azar, Ab, your uncle can be your Ab. So many of the ulama maintain that this is actually his paternal uncle. It's not his biological father. In the Quran, they use the ayah as a proof text when Ya'qub asked his sons on his deathbed, Ma ta'buduna min ba'di, what are you going to worship after me? And they said, Na'budu ilahaka wa ilaha aba'ika Ibrahim wa Ismail wa Ishaq. We will worship the God of your God, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Ismail, who is their uncle, and Isaac. <clears throat> so they use that also as, but there's a difference of opinion about that. <clears throat> Ibn Abbas said that the words of Allah, when you turn about among those who prostrate, so this is in Surah number 26, a Shu'ara, verse 218 and 219, الذي يراك حين تقوم, the one who sees you when you stand, and you're turning about in those who make sajda. Allah sees you when you stand to pray, and He also sees you when you turn about. Taqallub. Amongst those who make sajda, Ibn Abbas said uh, that the meaning of this is from prophet to prophet uh, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought you out as a prophet. In other words, a reference to the prophetic light that was uh, um, among the mu'minin from his ancestors. From Adam alayhi salam, the light moved to Seth, which, amid, uh, which um, uh, uh, found its way to Nuh alayhi salam, eventually to Ibrahim, to Ismail, eventually to Adnan, and eventually to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Jafar ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq, he said that Allah knew that his creatures <coughs> would not be capable of pure obedience to him. So he told them this in order that they would realize that they would never be able to achieve absolute purity in serving him. Between himself and them, he placed one of their own species, clothing him in his own attributes of compassion and mercy. So the, the language here is a bit mystical. It doesn't mean that the Prophet ﷺ is some sort of divine incarnation. The Prophet ﷺ is an exalted manifestation of Allah's attributes of beauty. That's how we can think of it. He brought him out as a truthful ambassador to creation, and made it such that when someone obeys him, they are obeying Allah. And when someone agrees with him, they are agreeing with Allah. Allah says, مَا يُتِعَ الرَّسُولُ فَقَدْ أَتَى Allah." Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 80. Whoever obeys the messenger is obeying Allah. There is a non-distinction in obedience. It is impossible to be in obedience to Allah and disobedience to the Prophet ﷺ. Their obedience is equal, yet there is an ontological distinction, meaning an essential distinction, meaning that the Prophet ﷺ is ontologically, essentially inferior to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet ﷺ is not a deity, he's not divine in that sense. He's not a god. He is the best of creation. Yet when one obeys the Prophet ﷺ, it is as if they are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the Prophet ﷺ only speaks the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of his speech is wahi. All of his speech. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ مَا يَنْتِقُوا In Surah Al-Najm. مَا means never. He never speaks from his hawa. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ Whatever he says is nothing but wahi, revelation. <clears throat> Even one of his companions, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, asked him, shall I record? Initially, he, he commanded them not to write down the hadith. But then later, when um, <clears throat> it was, uh, there, was, there was a clear distinction to be made between Quran and hadith, 
he had scribes that would write down some hadith. So one of the scribes asked him, what about when you're angry? Shall I write down the hadith when you're angry? Uh, and he said, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَنِي بِالْحَقِّ By the one who, who uh, raised me uh, in truth, the one, the, by the one who made me a prophet, لا يخرج منه إلا الحق. Nothing comes out of this, meaning his mouth, except the truth. <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ <clears throat> Does anyone know where this is in the Qur'an? Everyone has to know where this is. You know, if you meet a Christian on the Bart, he's going to quote John 3.16. Every Christian knows John 3.16. What surah is this? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ No. Good guess. Al-Anbiya, surah 21, verse 107. 21-107. This is a quintessential verse, the quintessential prophetological verse. We did not send you except as a mercy to all creation, to all the worlds. And he says here that many of the ulama, they point out that his very being was mercy because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a noun in the ayah and not a verb. He doesn't say antarhama or something. He doesn't use a verb. He uses a noun. And a noun or a mustar, an infinitive, describes the essence of a person. The essence. So if you use the verb, a verb could mean at some point in time, right? It's descriptive, but it doesn't describe necessarily the essence of someone. Someone could be merciful sometimes, and a tyrant other times. If the verb is used, rahmatan is the mustar, is a noun. <clears throat> and then also the statement. It's very strong in Arabic rhetorically. It's, a, it's an affirmation after a negation in Arabic. It's called the ifbat ba'da nafyin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have said that, you know, that I sent you as a mercy. But he said, we did not send you except as a mercy. So this is a very strong statement in Arabic rhetorically. It's like the shahada. We don't, our shahada isn't Allahu mawjud or something. Allah exists. Allahu wahid. It's la ilaha. There is no God illa Allah except God. If bad, bad nafyan. Affirmation after negation. Very, very strong statement. It's difficult to translate. Qadi Iyad mentions the hadith here from Al Bazar. My life is a blessing for you. My death is a blessing for you. Hayati khayrukum wa mamati khayrukum from the Prophet ﷺ. How is his death a blessing for us? Well, in his grave, ﷺ, he continues to supplicate for the ummah. And salawat are conveyed to him on Fridays by malaika. Uh, sorry, all the days except for Friday, they're conveyed to him. And on Friday, he actually, he actually hear the salawat. He says in the hadith, sound hadith, he hears the salawat with his own ears and responds with his own tongue. That's in this world. And then what follows after death is the, the great shafa'ah of the Prophet ﷺ on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is how we understand my death is good for you. He's, I mean, this is just the first two pages. <laughs> There's so much in this text. It's amazing. Let me see how we're doing. Any, any questions? Anyone need clarification? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. All right. Ah, then he quotes this famous ayah to Nur. This is an amazing ayah. You know, when I was 17 years old, a bit late, but it's the first time I read the Quran. <laughs> it's in English. I didn't know any Arabic. I didn't know Alif from Ba. I read the Quran and, <clears throat> you know, I, I think I understood every verse in the Quran. Probably half of it was wrong, maybe 90%. But I think I understood something from it, except for this verse. I had no idea what this verse was talking about. Ayatul Nur. This is also called the parable of the shining lamp. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. Allah is the light. In logic, this is called an analytic statement. So the, the predicate uh, is a definition, basically, of the subject. Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. It's also, it's also called a cataph cataphatic statement in theology. Cataphatic means a positive statement about God, as opposed to an apophatic statement, which is a negative statement about God. For example, وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٍ them is a negation. And that's the safer way to talk about God. It's to say God is not this or that, rather than God is. So cataphatic statements are rare, but we have them in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say whatever he wants about himself. So he says, Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> and the meaning of this, according to Suyuti, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of all light. <clears throat> the source of everything. And then he says, مَثَلُ nurihi." The similitude of his light, a light that he owns. This is not an analytic statement. This is a construct statement. Nurihi means a light that he owns. So the ulama here, they point out, Ibn Abbas, Imam al-Razi, Imam al-Suyuti, they say light here is a symbol for the Prophet ﷺ. That the parable, the shining lamp, has something to do with the Prophet ﷺ. The likeness of his light is like a niche. Therein is a lamp. The lamp is in a glass. Does everyone understand what a niche is? In these pre-modern homes, you would have sort of a dugout in the wall. You would place a lamp and it would light up the whole room. A lamp inside of a glass. That's called a niche or a niche. And both, of, both pronunciations are acceptable in English. So this is what Razi and Suyuti say. That the niche represents the sadr, the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. And the lamp within the niche is iman, is faith. And the lamp is in a glass, zujaja, that is the pure heart of the Prophet ﷺ. And zujaja tuka annaha kawkabun durriyun yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytuna. The glass as uh, the glass as if it were a, a glittering star kindled from a blessed olive tree. So the glass is so, uh, is so pure, is so shiny, right, um, that, it, that it, it looks like a, like a brilliant star, I meaning the heart of the Prophet is so pure, it's been so purified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the diseases of the heart. Kindled from a blessed olive tree. The olive tree here, according to this symbolism, is a reference to Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is a forefather of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La He's not from the Orient or the Occident. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the father of all nations. That's what his name literally means. Yakadu zaytuha yudi'u wa laulam tamsashu nar Whose oil would nearly shine even if no fire touched it. Now oil is that which is internal or natural to the lamp. That which is internal or natural to the human being is reason, is conscience. Conscience in Latin, con means with, and science means knowledge. Or fitra, there's an innate disposition. That the conscience or the prophet's sense of reason, his fitra, would almost come in, into the state of ma'rifah even before the fire touched it. And fire here in this symbol means revelation, wahi. That Ibn Kathir, he says, the prophet shone, he shined, even before the revelation touched him. Right? And this is what Bahira, the monk, noticed. When the prophet ﷺ was 10 or 12 years old, he traveled to Bostra with Abu Talib. And Bahira, the monk, he noticed there was something happening with him. Pre-prophetic miracles, irhas, they're called that through his intellect he would almost come to ma'rifah, to intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though the revelation never touched him. The sages from Ahl al-Kitab, they knew before the Qur'an there was something special about him. That's the meaning of it, even before. And then when the revelation does touch it, nurun ala nur, aqal upon naqal, 
reason upon revelation. So the lamp is illuminated with oil and fire. A lamp is illuminated with oil and fire, with that which is internal or natural to it, and that which is external or given to it. The heart is illuminated with reason and revelation, that which is internal to the human being, conscience, reason, and that which is given to the human being, revelation. This is true illumination of the heart, reason and revelation. There are people who reject the revelation and they worship the akala, the intellect. They think they can know everything. And this leads to a type of rigid rationalism. This leads to a type of denial of higher moral authority. That there's no moral authority over us as a nation or an entity. So we can make up our own rules. If it's good for us, then it's right. Relying on reason, you can justify anything. These people in our country, they're vermin. Let's exterminate them. It's good for us. Why not? It'll be good for us. And then you have people that lean on revelation and forget about reason. And they become these dogmatic literalists. Knuckleheads, as one of my teachers said. No akal. It's all knuckle. Knuckleheads. And they become extremely violent. Because they're looking at nos. They're looking at the text. And the text says this. That's what we have to do. Well, wait a minute. What about the maqasid? What about the aims of the sharia? What about the waqir? What about the reality of the world? How to implement? No, no, no. Don't think about that, brother. Just do it. Don't think. Just do it. Right? It's a big problem. Allahu <clears throat> alam. It's a beautiful ayah. Nurun ala nur. Allah guides his light to the Prophet wasallam. Whomever he will, Allah makes examples for people and Allah has knowledge of everything. Ka'ab al-Ahbar. And Ibn Jubair said, by the second light, he means Muhammad wasallam, The light of the Prophet wasallam. And he goes on to say, Sahala tustari. The lamp means his heart, the glasses, the breast, so on and so forth. What we just mentioned. Its oil would merely shine, i.e., his prophecy is almost evident to the people before he speaks, just like this oil. It's like uh, Abdullah, ibn, Abdullah ibn Salam, who was a rabbi or a junior rabbi, Bani Qurayda, Bani Qaynuka in Medina. And he just looked at the face of the Prophet. And he said, Ah, Araf to Anna Wajah, who lays to be what she cut down. I can, I recognize in his face, it's not the face of a liar. Araftu means to recognize something. There's something special about this man. Right? Hassan ibn Thabit, who was paid some money by the mushrikeen. So the mushrikeen in Medina um, that wanted to disbelieve in the Prophet wasallam, they outwardly said they were Muslim. They became the munafiqeen, but they were mushrikeen. So they paid Hassan ibn Thabit write a poem and, and insult the Prophet wasallam. And Hassan ibn Thabit, he said, he's just, he looked at the face of the Prophet wasallam. one instant he walked back and he said, that's it for me. <laughs> the one glance is enough. Right? It's mentioned in the New Testament also, like six or seven of the disciples of Isa a.s. Allahu alam. But it says in the text in the Gospel of John that they became disciples of Isa a.s. because they, because he looked at them. That was it. Just the nazar, the glance. Said, oh, that's it. This is the real deal. One of the saints of Yemen, uh, Abu Bakr bin Salim, he said that the, the people from the city, they come and they sit in my presence, and they're full of themselves. They think they know things. Now, our teachers say that one of the requisites of attaining knowledge is what's known as kenosis or tahliya. One must empty oneself of things, be like an empty vessel. Forget what you think you know and be ready to receive. So he said, they come in and sit in my presence and I'll say something and they argue and it's back and forth. They don't learn anything. 
Then he said a simple Bedouin will come who will, you know, urinate in, in public. But he'll come and sit in my presence and I'll give him one glance and it'll change his life. So the Prophet Sallallahu glance is powerful. The Bedouin who came into his presence and he started trembling uncontrollably. The Sahaba said, well, what's wrong with you, man? He said, trembling. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, relax, I'm not a king. I'm just a, the son of a woman who used to eat dried meat. This is how he described it. This is from his tawadu. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <clears throat> then here he talks about the ayah, وَرَفَعَنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ it may not exalt your remembrance. There's a long section here. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri who related that the Prophet وسلم, said, Jibreel alayhi salam came to me and said, My Lord and your Lord says, Do you know how I exalted your fame? Do you know how I raised your remembrance? And he said, Allahu alam. And Jibreel alayhi salam said that your Lord said, so Hadith Qudsi, إِذَا ذُكِرْتُ ذُكِرْتَ مَعِي Whenever I am mentioned, you are mentioned with me. In the Adhan, in the Iqama, in the Shahada. <clears throat> because a lot of people, they will confirm La ilaha illallah. Christians and Jews, La ilaha illallah. Even deists, like people who don't believe in a personal God, right? they're called deists, that there's a God, he's a creator, but he's sort of a watchmaker. He doesn't really care about what's happening on earth. He just kind of lets us do our thing, absentee landlord. They say, yeah, that, there's no God but this creator God. Fine. But Muhammad Rasulullah, this is what makes God imminent or close, loving, qurba. Qurb, ma'iyya. Uh, the fact that the Prophet the fact, uh, the fact that mention, huh? well, he mentioned the fact that mention of the Prophet is directly connected to mention of Allah also shows that obedience to the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is connected to obedience to Allah and his and his name to Allah's name. Allah says, "Obey Allah and His Messenger." <clears throat> Obey Allah means follow the Quran. Kitabullah. What does obey the messenger mean? There are people who say reject the Sunnah. We are Quran only people. Obey Allah and His Messenger. What does that mean? Obey the Sunnah. Believe in Allah and His Messenger. Aminu billah wa rasulihi. And he says here, Qadi Iyad says, Allah joins them together with the conjunction wa, meaning and which is a conjunction of partnership. And partnership here is a loaded term. Uh, don't get the wrong idea. Partnership not with respect to essence, attributes, or actions. No one shares in Allah's essence. No one is deity except Allah. No one has these qualitative attributes uh, that Allah has. Nobody, nothing other than Allah is omniscient, omnipotent, so on and so forth. Has ilm mutlaq, perfect knowledge. Think of the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam, Sayyidina Umar, he said that uh, the Prophet sallallahu said to him, Atadri man is sa'il, do you know who the questioner was? It was Jibreel alayhi salam. But he asked Umar, do you know who the questioner was? And Umar said, Allahu wa rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. This does not mean that Allah and His Messenger have equal knowledge. Right? Because I'm thinking of a number now between one and a million. You don't know what it is. I do, and so does Allah. Does that mean I have the same knowledge as Allah? Of course not. Also, the wow of conjunction implies an essential hierarchy. Allah is the foremost. He is the greatest. Then the Prophet ﷺ. He says here, it is not permitted to use this conjunction in connection with Allah, in the case of anyone except the Prophet Why? Because again, it is 
it is impossible for obedience to Allah to conflict with obedience to the Prophet ﷺ. With anyone else, it can conflict. If I say, for example, obey Allah and obey your Shaykh, what if your Shaykh disobeys Allah? It's conceivable. So it's, in, it's impermissible to make such a statement. Now there's another verse in the Quran, Obey Allah and the Messenger, wa ulil amri minkum, and those in authority over you. So this is understood as hierarchical and conditional. Obey those in authority over you as long as they obey Allah and His Messenger. Right? Remember Abu Bakr as Siddiq, his first day of his caliphate? He, stood, he sat on the minbar of the Prophet wasallam. He said, I've been elected, but I'm not the best among you. Obey me as long as I obey Allah and his messenger. And disobey me if I disobey. This was the first sermon. <clears throat> there's something in this hadith. There's a hadith here he mentions. Someone was speaking in the presence of the Prophet wasallam, And he said, Man yuti'illah wa rasulahu faqad rashada. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has been rightly guided. So he said, whoever obeys Allah and his messenger uh, has been rightly guided. And whoever uh, rebels against them, and he used the dual form at the end of the verb. <laughs> he said, hima, ya'si hima. Right? Whoever rebels against them um, has erred. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at him according to the hadith. This hadith is in Abu Dawood and Nasa'i and Muslim. And he said, Bi'sal khatib anta. What a bad speaker you are. So the commentary says the Prophet ﷺ, he disliked the two names being joined together in a way that implies equality. Because he used the dual form. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu Rasuluhu ahaqu an yurduhu. Allah and his messenger. It is more befitting that you should please them, but a, it's only who, a third person, masculine singular, pronoun is used. But the meaning is understood as both of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say huma. He doesn't use a dual pronoun. Because the dual form in Arabic implies a real equality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never refers to himself in the Quran uh, with a dual verbal form or a dual pronoun. There's a subtlety in the Arabic. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't, he didn't mind. مَا يُتِعِ اللَّهُ فَقَدْ رَشَدًا Whoever obeys Allah, wa and the Prophet, and the Prophet, wa is guided. Using the dual, he didn't like that part. Don't join me with Allah using a dual form in Arabic. It doesn't happen in the Quran. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a royal plural sometimes. He says, Nahnu, right? Inna anzalnahu. anzalnahu, right? Nahnu aqrabu ilayhi min habl al warid. We, this is, this is a it's called the pluralis magistatis, the royal plural, and it's understood that this is uh, a royal plural. It's used because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking from a position of majesty. It does not in any way denote a plural of numbers, a plurality of numbers or something like that. It is related from Umar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the Prophet, uh, that... Um, that he said to the Prophet, part of your excellence with Allah is that he made obedience to you, obedience to Allah. Allah says, whoever obeys the messenger has obeyed Allah. And if you love Allah, then, then follow me and Allah will love you. It is related that when this ayah was sent down, so this he's, he's quoting Ayatul Imtihan. This is called Ayatul Imtihan. Surah number 3, ayah number 31. 331. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibkum Allah. Say, if you love Allah, then follow me. 
then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. When this ayah was sent down, the people said, Muhammad wants us to take him as a mercy in the way the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. So then the very next verse, Allah revealed, Qul ati Allah wa rasul Say, obey Allah and the Messenger. So obey, not worship. It's not the same way the Christians revere Isa alayhi salam. It's not to worship the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Worship is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the previous umam, people would make sajda to prophets, but that practice is abrogated. Like we read in the Quran that the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they made sajda to him. This was not a sajda uh, for, for purposes of ibadah. It was for ta'zim. It was, it was for reverence. And this was permissible in the previous umam. It has been abrogated in our sharia. And if somebody does it and their intention is reverence, then it's haram. If their intention is worship, it's kufr. A, man, a companion kind of went into a state and he prostrated to the Prophet ﷺ out of reverence. And the Prophet picked him up and he said, we don't do that. So revere the Prophet ﷺ because he's worthy of reverence, because he has virtue. Nowadays, we revere skill and fame things like that. Some famous sports star dies and people can't sleep for a week. And there's you know, memorials in several different countries around the world for this person whose ethics are very questionable based on experience. As we said, reputation is very important. But we don't, we don't revere virtue anymore. People die all the time that are pious, that are wise, that are charitable, that are humble, that are selfless. We don't even know their names. But Allah knows their names. This is the most important thing. Not that people remember you on the earth. This is what the pre-Islamic Arabs wanted. They didn't believe in an afterlife. They would make dhikr of their aba. They would make dhikr. They would actually come together and start making dhikr of their ancestors. And they believed that by doing that, they would somehow live forever. That's how they're immortalized. But what we want is the dhikr of Allah. But the dhikr Allah akbar. But the remembrance of Allah of us is the greatest thing. Yes? Hmm. <clears throat> Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are aspects of cultures that are, that are problematic from our perspective. Um, I ran into this issue. I used to be a, I used to practice karate, and, uh, and you have to bow, literally make rukur, right, to your uh, sensei. Of course, my intention was never to worship anyone, but even to revere someone with such an act of genuflection is impermissible. There might be some difference of opinion about that. but um, So I, I just told my sensei, I said, and this is when I first started practicing the religion. So I was, uh, I, I didn't use a lot of tact, but I did, I was smart enough to say, you know, I'm not going to bow to anyone. And he said, oh, that's fine. You don't need to do that. You know. I mean, we, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, in, in this culture, if a man doesn't shake a woman's hand, people are offended. I told that story a while. I mean, I won't go into it now, but this happened to me one time, and somebody, this, this woman said, I'm so offended you didn't shake my hand. And, and then I turned the tables on her, and I said, my religion offends you? I'm so offended that you're offended. Yeah. So there are aspects of culture that we can certainly, like one of my teachers explained to me, like um, cultures are like different colored glass, glasses. In Islam, is like pure water. You can pour it into the glass, and you know the water, you know the water goes into the glass, so you have different color. What appears to be different colored water, but it's really the culture sort of interacting with the religion, and that's fine. But there are certainly aspects of culture that are problematic. The Prophet sallallahu he would speak out against them. There are aspects of Arab culture that he had no problems with that are actually very good. The Arabs were very uh, chivalrous people, 
Is it something that's dying now, chivalry? You know, you open a door for a woman now, and they, they, she wants to bite your head off. You know, offer a seat. This happened to me. I offered a seat to a woman on the board. I don't need your seat. Who do you think you are? Oh, sorry. All right. Um, and they were, they were very hospitable. They were generous people. But they're also prone to warfare. There are aspects of the culture that were extremely misogynist. They would practice wa'adul banat, female infanticide. And the Prophet spoke out against those aspects. You know, um, the Arab men didn't necessarily like to admit that they loved their wives. It's just sort of a macho thing. But they asked him, Ayyu nasu habu ilayk? It's Aisha. It's all. He mentioned his wife. Is that answered? No, that's the old one. Zakal Khiran. Sallallahu Sayyid Muhammad 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 Muhammad
Amazon, is it? Yeah. It's a beautiful translation. Aisha Abdurrahman Buley. Beautiful. Like I said, we're, we're just touching the surface of this text. I mean, I promised to do chapter one. We probably read 5% of chapter one tonight. And there, there requires a little bit of light commentary. But it's an extraordinary ocean of knowledge. so inshallah ta'ala we're continuing <coughs> this is our second week kitab al-shifa we're going to actually continue here with the first chapter uh, there's um, very important points that Qadi Ayyad makes in this chapter so we'll stick with it inshallah ta'ala we only did the first section last week which was nine pages and the first chapter is about 30 pages uh, so those who want to follow along in the English translation this is page 10 part 1 Chapter 1, Section 2. Section 2 is called uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as a witness and the praise and honor entailed by that. <coughs> so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he begin, uh, Qadi Iyad, he begins by quoting a verse from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is an exquisitely beautiful ayah from the Quran, which is in Surah Al Ahzab, uh, verses number 45 and 46. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadhira wa da'iyan ila Allahi bi idhni wa siraja munira. O Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news and a warner, calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his permission, and as a light giving lamp. So Qadi Iyad, he says in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endows his Prophet with all the ranks of nobility and every praiseworthy quality. He made him a witness over his community by the fact that he has conveyed the message to them. So one of the duties of a prophet is called tabligh. He has to convey the message. That is one of his special qualities. He is a bringer of good news to the people who obey him, a warner to the people who rebel against him. He calls for the oneness of Allah to worship him. He is a light-giving lamp by which people are guided to the truth. One thing to notice here from uh, a linguistic standpoint, according to Muslim philologists, all of these titles of the Prophet ﷺ in these two ayahs, they're all indefinite nouns. It's called ism nakira. And according to rhetoric, uh, the ism nakira denotes a degree of greatness that is outside of our frames of reference. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lam yakun illadhina kafaru min ahli al-kitabi wal mushrikeen munfakin hatta ta'tiyahum al that the, the uh, kuffar from the Ahl al-Kitab and from the Mushrikeen, they will not break away from their kufr until al-bayyina. That's a definite article. What is al-bayyina? Rasulun min Allah yatlu suhufan mutahara. A messenger from God, not the messenger of God. Like what a messenger from God uh, who uh, recites purified scriptures. So shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadhiran wa da'iyan Munirun. These are all indefinite nouns. <clears throat> In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Prophet sallallahu as a siraj. This word is used four times in the entire Quran. If you have a concordance, you can look this up. Three times, it's explicitly talking about the sun, the shams. And here, the Prophet sallallahu is called siraj. And then this noun is qualified. Thank you so much. I'm still having throat issues, so. I need to drink warm beverages. I'm not contagious. Inshallah, it's not Corona. This uh, noun is qualified by the adjective munir. Munir is a form for active participle, ism fa'il, which is related to the word nur, and it means something that spreads light. So a lamp that emanates light 
and illuminates those around him. So just as the sun illuminates those in its orbit, the Prophet ﷺ illuminates those in his orbit, uh, the Sahaba, and any who come into contact with him. Uh, Atai ibn Yasser said, I met Abdullah ibn Amr al-As and said, Describe the Messenger of Allah to me. He replied, Certainly by Allah, some of the characteristics by which he is described in the Quran can also be found in the Torah. Now, in, uh, in hadith or, or statements from the Salaf, where the word Torah is mentioned, even in the Quran, the Torah doesn't necessarily mean the first five books of the Christian Bible, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. The word Torah amongst the Bani Israel is a very loose term. In fact, Torah could, be, could signify uh, the, 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 the whole of their corpus of sacred literature. So, any, so, any, so Torah could mean uh, a Jewish sacred text of some sort, not necessarily the first five books of Moses. Anyway, so it says, <clears throat> according uh, to Amr, Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, there is a description of the Prophet sallam, in some sacred Jewish text. O oh, Prophet, we have sent you as a witness, a bringer of good news and a warner and a refuge for the unlettered. You are my slave and my messenger. I have called you the one whom people rely one who is neither coarse nor vulgar, and who neither shouts in the markets, nor repays evil with evil, but rather pardons and forgives. Allah will not take him back to himself until the crooked community has been straightened out by him. And they say, there is no God but Allah. Through him, blind eyes, deaf ears, and covered hearts will be opened. End quote. Something similar is reported from Abdullah ibn Salam and Ka'ab al-Ahbar. And both of these are scholars of Bani Israel who converted to Islam. Abdullah ibn Salam is a, is a celebrated Sahabi, and Ka'b al-Ahbar is a Tabi'i. Uh, this is, it seems like to me, this is a commentary, a paraphrase and a commentary of a passage uh, in the Hebrew Bible, which is called Isaiah chapter 42, um, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. It's also found in the Christian Bible. I believe that Isaiah chapter 42 is a clear Muhammadan typology, a foreshadowing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'll just give you a few highlights uh, from that chapter in the Bible. The Hebrew says, Hen abdi if machbo, behold my abd, my servant. So we're going to have a description of someone whose primary title is abd. And of course, the primary title of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Quran is abd. Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi. Alhamdulillah alladhi anzala ala abdihi al-kitaba. Tabarak alladhi nazzala al-furqan ala abdihi. And so forth. Fa'awha ila abdihi ma awha. This is his primary title. Behold my servant whom I uphold. The Hebrew of Isaiah 42 continues. Bikhri ratsa nafshi. In whom my soul delights. And then it says. Nafati ruhi alive. I've put my ruh upon him. The speaker is obviously God here. And he's saying that I have put my ruh upon this abd, my spirit of inspiration, my spirit of guidance, my spirit of revelation. Mishpat le goyim yotzi. He will bring judgment or law in order to the goyim. Goyim is a Hebrew word meaning Gentiles, non-Jews. The word in Arabic for goy, which is the singular of goyim, is ummi. Ummi. So the Prophet sallallahu is called an nabiyul ummi in the Quran. This has different meanings, the unlettered prophet or the Gentile prophet. This is one of the meanings of nabiyul ummi. The Gentile prophet, the prophet that was prophesized, the non-Jewish Gentile prophet, the universal messenger. And then it says, interestingly, again, Isaiah 42, Lo in the Hebrew, which means he will not raise his voice in the marketplace. And our mother Aisha, she described the Prophet ﷺ exactly with these words. La sahaban fil aswaq. He doesn't raise his voice in the marketplace. And this is an indication, this is a way of saying that the Prophet's character was very mild, mild-mannered, wasallam. And this is how he's actually described by Sayyidina Ali in the famous hadith in the Shema'il of Imam al-Tirmidhi, Sahlul khuluki, layinul janibi, that he's easygoing. Mild mannered. This is how he's described in the Torah, in this passage, in this sacred Hebrew Jewish text. 
And then it goes on to say in Isaiah 42, it calls this Abd Birit Am. Birit means Mithaq. And Am means Am, general, universal, a universal covenant. This, this Abd, this prophet, this unlettered prophet, this Gentile prophet, is Alamiyah. Right? وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رُسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا And then it says, Or Goyim. He is Or Goyim in Hebrew. If I were to translate that into Arabic, it would be Nurul Ummiyin. He is Nurul Ummiyin. He is the light of the Gentiles. He is the light of the unlettered. And then it goes on to talk about how the Kedarites are going to uh, adopt this prophet's message. The Kedarites are descendants of someone named Qaydar. Qaydar, according to Ibn Hisham, is one of the sons of Ismail alayhi salam. And Ibn Hisham, he traces the prophet's ancestry, sallallahu alayhi salam, all the way back to Qaydar or Kedar. In fact, in, in Hebrew, uh, a very popular way of saying Arabic is to say Laishan Qaydar, the tongue, Lisan of, of Qaydar. <coughs> And then Qadi Iyad, he quotes the ayah, the famous ayah in the Quran. الَّذِينَ يَتَّبِعُونَ الرَّسُولَ النَّبِيَ الْأُمِّ الَّذِي يَجِدُونَهُ مَكْتُوبًا عِنْدَهُمْ فِي تُرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, the Gentile prophet. Nabi al-Ummi also means the motherly prophet, like the nurturing prophet, uh, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and in the Injil and in the Gospel, commanding them to the right, forbidding them uh, from wrong, making lawful for them the good things and making unlawful for them the foul things, relieving from them their burdens and the fetters that are on them, those who believe in him and aid him and help him and follow the light which has been sent down to him, they are the prosperous. This is Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, verse 157. <clears throat> There's a famous uh, uh, Jewish scholar who became a Muslim, he's a 12th century Jewish scholar, his name was Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. A lot of people don't know about him. He was actually the son of a Moroccan rabbi. And he converted to Islam based on a dream he had. Um, and then he wrote this incredible book called Ifhamul Yahud, The Confounding of the Jews, in which he argues against Judaism and for Islam. And he argues for the uh, messiahship of Isa alayhi salam. It's a very interesting book. And there's an autobiographical element in his book, The Confounding of the Jews, by Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. So he tells us how he became a Muslim. He said that he was, he was sleeping, he had a dream. In his dream, he sees this very old man sitting under a tree. <clears throat> so he approaches the man, and the man identifies himself as the prophet Samuel. This is a prophet in the Old Testament. He might be mentioned in the Quran indirectly as a Nabi Ba'di Ba'da Musa, a prophet after Moses, peace be upon him. So then Shamuel, the prophet Samuel, begins to quote something from the Torah to Shamuel ben Yehuda al-Maghribi. And he quotes to him Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. This is a famous passage in the Hebrew Bible that says, Nabi Akim lahem so on and so forth. That, that God is the speaker and he says, I'm going to raise up a prophet from the brethren of the Israelites who's going to be like Moses, a prophet like Moses. And I shall put my words into this prophet's mouth. And, I, and whatever he says is only by command. Right? So then, uh, um, uh, Shamuel, he says to the prophet Samuel, that's you, right? We were taught that that prophet is you. And then he said that the prophet Samuel became angry and stood up and walked away from him. And then he said he woke up suddenly. And then he said he fell back asleep. And it was just before Fajr. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, bil ashar. The most true dreams are just before Fajr, during the time of Suhoor. So he says he fell asleep again, and he said he woke up, he had another dream, he's walking down a corridor into a courtyard, and a man passes him, and the man says to him, Ati' Rasulallah, obey the Messenger of God. And he comes into the courtyard, and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, and he said the prophet was very busy. He was preparing for a ghazwa, a military expedition. So Shamuel, he goes right up to the prophet, وسلم, and he says he takes the prophet's hand, and he says, Ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashadu annaka rasulullah. And he took great pride that, he, that the prophet himself took his shahada in his dream. Now, he couldn't actually voice 
uh, he couldn't admit that he'd become Muslim because it was a dangerous situation for him. His father was a rabbi. But years later he did. But he made it a point in his autobiography that I was able to say, Annaka, and I bear witness that you are the messenger of God rather than Muhammad Rasulullah. It's a very interesting text. <clears throat> Anyway, the, the dominant opinion is that, um, uh, or a strong opinion, is that many of the uh, descriptions of the Prophet ﷺ have been lifted from the Torah and the Gospel, and that the text has uh, been corrupted as tahrifu nas. Imam al-Razi doesn't necessarily agree with this and says, if you look hard enough, you'll find that there are, in fact, uh, descriptions of him. It, but it takes a sort of more sophisticated analysis. And then uh, Qadi Ayyadi mentions this beautiful ayah from Surah Ali Imran, verse 159, this iconic ayah, which sort of demonstrates uh, the description of the Prophet we've been talking about. The verse begins, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَهُمْ If you know something about Arabic, you know this ma is ma is za'ida, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ So it is part of the incredible mercy <coughs> from Allah, that you are lenient with them. <clears throat> if you had been harsh, If you had been harsh or hard-hearted, you would have seen men scatter from your presence. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them. In the ulama say, Pardon them means that, you know, if people transgress against you personally, just forgive them. If people transgress against the hudud of Allah, then ask Allah to forgive them. Make istighfar for them. And consult them in, 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 uh, in the affair. And this means the political affairs. The ulama ask a question here. Why would the Prophet ﷺ, whose speech is wahi and who has isma, why would he consult people about political affairs? So Imam al-Razi says he's doing this to simply set a precedent, right? Because he's the last prophet. Muslim leaders who come after him are no prophets. They could make mistakes. So he's setting a precedent that you have to con conduct your affairs through a shura, through a, a mutual consultation of some point, of some sort, uh, to ensure that uh, a tyranny doesn't arise. Wallahu alam. <clears throat> As Samarqandi said, Allah is reminding them that he made his messenger merciful to the believers, <clears throat> compassionate and lenient. <clears throat> if he had been harsh and severe in speech, they would have left him. However, Allah made him magnanimous, easygoing, cheerful, kind, and gentle. One of the names of the Prophet وسلم, according to Imam Suyuti, is ad the smiling prophet, the laughing prophet. Easygoing. He's able to diffuse situations. Even with some humor, he can diffuse situations. Right? One of my favorite examples, Hadith in Bukhari, very famous Hadith. The Prophet ﷺ is walking in Medina, his city. He's the head of state with Aisha and a group of Yahud. And there was some animosity between them during this time between the Muslims and the Yahud. A group of Yahud pass him by, and one of them says, Assalamu alaikum. And the Prophet ﷺ immediately responds, Wa alaikum. Uh, and uh, so, assamu alaykum means may death be upon you. Right? And this is an interesting, pr this is a good principle. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that the mu'min is mutawadir, but he's not dhalil. There's a difference. The mu'min is humble, but he's never humiliated. The Muslim does not humiliate himself. The Muslim has self respect. The Muslim is not a doormat. So, very quickly, he's wa alaykum. And then Aisha thought, that the Prophet didn't hear them correctly, right? She thought that the Prophet heard, Assalamu alaikum. So she turns around and she says, Wassamu alaikum, wa la'natullah, wa ghadaballah alaikum. Uh, and death be upon you, and the anger and wrath of God, and, and the curse of God. And the Prophet said, Oh, mahalan, mahalan, like take it easy. <laughs> take it easy. Inna Allaha yuhibbu rifq, he said. Is what he told her. In Allah, you have rifq fil amri kulli. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves uh, gentleness in all affairs. He's the head of state in, in Medina. You know, people get angry now because 
you know, they're at a grocery store or something, and somebody, you know, says, oh, look at this Muslim, you know, camel jockey or whatnot. The, the Prophet's in Medina. I mean, obviously, things like that, you know, should be addressed, but this is what you should expect. But in Medina, in his own city, when he's the head of state, this is happening to him. And look at his response. Man yuhram al-rifq, yuhram al-khair. This hadith in Muslim. Whoever is deprived of gentleness is deprived of good. <clears throat> so Aisha said, didn't you hear what they said? And he said, didn't you hear what I said? <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so continuing, Qadi Iyad, he quotes this verse, Al-Baqarah 143, Thus we have made you a middle community, so that you, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, would be a, uh, uh, would be, sorry, that you, uh, the Muslims, would be witnesses against people and so that the messenger would be a witness against you. Abu Hassan al-Qabisi said, in this ayah, Allah makes it clear the excellence of our Prophet and the excellence uh, of his community. The Ummah Wasata, the middle nation. This is verse 143 of 286, right in the middle of Al-Baqarah. So with respect to theology, I might have mentioned this here last time, or maybe it was the other masjid. Imam al-Razi says that with respect to theology, uh, we, are, we do not uh, practice what's known as tashbih, which is a Christian practice, the practice of the mujassima, the anthropomorphous. The Christians, they put Allah in his creation. They believe in incarnationalist theology, that God dwelled within his creation. Um, or the other extreme, Jewish theology, ta'atil, also mu'tazili theology, that God is so transcendent that they started to deny that he even has attributes. With respect to Christology, the, the Jewish position, with respect to Isa alayhi salam, the Jewish position is that he is a human, non-divine, false prophet. The Christian position is that he is a human, divine prophet. Divine. Right? So this is based on a doctrine or dogma they have called hypostatic union, that Isa alayhi salam is a human being with two natures. He's 100% God and 100% man. The Muslim position is that he was a human, non-divine prophet. So the essence is human, the particular is prophet. That's the what and the who of Islamic Christology. With respect to the practical aspect, the most virtuous lifestyle for Catholic Christians is to join a religious order and take vows of chastity and poverty. So to be poor and celibate is the most virtuous type of lifestyle. For Protestants, one is saved by faith alone. This is a doctrine called sola fide. But ultimately, good works do not factor in at all, at all. Uh, when it comes to one's salvation. So this leads to a type of antinomianism. This is one of those fancy words that academics use. Antinomianism means a rejection of sharia. People who reject the sharia, there's nothing to ground them. So they start making claims. For Jews, at least the orthodox and conservative, the most virtuous life is where one or a person tries to complete all of the 613 commandments mentioned in the Torah, a project that could take several lifetimes. So a lot of people don't know this, but Orthodox Jews believe in reincarnation. It's, it's, a, it's a traditional Orthodox belief. It's called Gilgul HaNeshama in Hebrew. In other words, the, the Jewish Sharia, the Halakha of Bani Israel, it is so vast, it's so cumbersome, right? that it takes several lifetimes and you have to do all the commandments. <clears throat> in Islam, there's a balance. According to the Hadith of Gabriel, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Islam in this context means outward submission. Iman meaning an inward submission, inward belief. And then Ihsan is the relational aspect. And if there's deficiency in good deeds, uh, then there's, there's purification in the grave. There's adab al-qabr. There's a hard hisab or hard reckoning on the yawm al-qiyamah. Uh, there's even, according to the Sunni tradition, 
uh, some of the muwahidun, some of the monotheists that were lax in their prayer and things like that, there's a purification in Jahannam. Uh, and they'll come out of that eventually. So good works means means something. U ultimately, we're saved by grace. Man qala la ilaha illallah bisidqin dakhal al-jannah. Eventually, inshaAllah ta'ala. So it's a middle way. The Prophet, the, the Quran says, eat and drink, but not to excess. The Prophet said, an nikah sunnati, faman raghiba an sunnati falaysa minni. Marriage is my sunnah, my normative practice. Whoever turns away from my practice is not from me. <clears throat> so these are all sort of the aspects of the umma wasata, ummatan wasata. <clears throat> Allah says in another ayah, in this the messenger is a witness against you and you are witnesses against the people. And then he quotes this fam famous verse, uh, verse 41 from an nisa فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ عَلَى هَا أُولَاءِ شَهِيدٍ How will it be when we bring a witness from every community and we bring you as a witness against these? And the Prophet وسلم, he, he had uh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recite this ayah. And when he got to this surah, when he got to this ayah, the Prophet began to weep according to the hadith. So he means balanced and good. Balanced community. Balance is always seen as something that's good. This is, you know, this is transhistorical, transcendental. Even if you go to Eastern philosophy, the way of the Buddha is the middle way. Uh, if you go uh, to Confucius, the middle way. Ancient Greek philosophy. Plato said "mede agan" in Greek, which means never in excess. And he's talking about good things, not bad things. <clears throat> Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. He quotes this other ayah here from Surah Yunus, ayah number two. وَبَشِّرِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَنَّ لَهُمْ قَدَمَ الصِّدْقٍ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ Give good news to those who believe that they have a sure footing with their Lord. Qatada, Hassan al-Basri, Zayd ibn Aslam. These are champions of the Tabi'een. They said the sure footing, the qadama sidqin mentioned in this ayah, Surah Yunus, ayah number two, chapter 10, verse two is the Prophet ﷺ. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, who is a Sahabi, said the same thing. Sahala Tustari said, it's the preordained mercy which Allah placed in Muhammad ﷺ. Sahala Tustari is a third century scholar from Persia. So you know he's really smart. <laughs> Persia, anyway. Um, there's another verse here. I, I skipped over it last week, but verse 256 of Al-Baqarah is right after Ayatul Kursi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever believes in Allah has taken hold of the firmest handle, Al-Urwatul Wuthqa. Al-Urwatul Wuthqa. Abdul Rahman al-Sulami said this is the Prophet sallallahu So he is sure footing and a firm handhold. So you can think of an analogy. Imagine a parable. Imagine you have to climb the face of a steep mountain. And you have a friend at the top of the mountain who throws down to you a safety cable. He says, tie this around your waist. So you tie the safety cable around your waist. And then your friend tells you exactly where to put your feet in your hands. Put your hand here. Put your foot here. Put your hand here. So in this parable, your friend at the top is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only a parable. Walillahi al a'la. The goal is to reach him. He throws down to you a, uh, a lifeline, a uh, safety cable. Habilullah. Uh, this is the analogy used. Hold on tightly, all of you, to the cable extension, the safety line, the safety rope, the safety cable, however you want to say it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends down for you. And then the hand holds and the foot holds. Qadam al sidqin al ulwatul wuthqa. These are the sunnah. These are the sunnah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the steep hill represents the dunya. How do we get through the dunya and meet our friend at the top, as it were? Because we have the Quran and sunnah. Hablullah, qadam al sidqin al ulwatul wuthqa. There are some who tie the rope around their waist and they reject the footholds and the handholds. I don't need this. I'll find my own way. 
So they start climbing and they slip, and then the rope right, catches them from falling. They climb some more and they slip, and the rope catches them, and they almost get to the top. The rope snaps and they fall, and they're doomed. Because there's no separating the Quran from Sunnah. It's an illogical position. The Quran says, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul. Obey Allah, obey Allah, which means obey the Quran. And obey the Rasul. What is that? Sunnah. It's an illogical position. It doesn't make any sense. It's like someone says, I only follow the Quran and they drink alcohol. You only follow the Quran? Really? <clears throat> Section three now. Let's see how we're doing on time. It's halfway there. Any questions? Clarifying questions or everything's okay? All right. Section three concerning Allah's kindness and gentleness to him. So Qadi Iyad, he quotes this ayah, which is ayah 43 of At-Tawbah, 943. Allah has pardoned you. Why did you give them leave before it was clear to you which of them spoke the truth and you knew the liars? So the Prophet is being admonished here, is reprimanded here by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this happens a few times, a couple of times in the Quran. Samarqandi said that, that Allah, that uh, that one of the people of knowledge said, Allah has protected, the meaning of, of Allah has pardoned you is that Allah has protected you sound of heart. Why did you then give them leave? He says, if the prophet had first been addressed with the words, why did you give them leave? If that was the beginning of the ayah, lima adhinta lahum, he says, his heart might have burst out of terror at these words. A direct reprimand from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed him first of pardon by his mercy so that his heart would remain calm. And only then did he say to him, Bima adhinta lahum. Why did you give them leave? So the Prophet sallallahu he gave some men permission to stay behind and not go out for the Tabuk expedition. So his point here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began the reprimand to his Habib by saying, Afallahu ank. Oh, I've already forgiven you, but why did you? Why did you give them leave? <laughs> and this is different. If Allah would have said, Ghafara Allahu lak, Ghafara, right? Ghafara, uh, according to Imam al Ghazali, this is one of you know, the names of Al Ghafir, Al Ghafur, Al Ghaffar. Ghafara means to conceal something, according to Imam al Ghazali, in its etymology. To conceal it, but it's still kind of there. But Allah Afu, Allah is the effacer. Afa Allahu Ank. Erased it completely. See, Mama Ghazali says this is more effectual. This is, this is more uh, soothing to the heart. That, that here, Allah began, Afallahu Ank. It's completely gone. But why did you give them leave? This shows the high station with Allah, says Qadi Iyad, which is not hidden from anyone with the least intelligence. It shows the honor by which he holds his prophet and his kindness to him. And if the whole of it were known, the heart would burst. The same applies to the words. We know that what they say grieves you. قَدْ نَعْلَمُ إِنَّهُ لَيَحْزُنُكَ الَّذِي يَقُولُونَ We know that what they say grieves you, gives you huzun. إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُكَذِّبُونَكَ وَلَكِنَّ الظَّالِمِينَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ يَجْحَدُونَ It is not you they call a liar, but the evildoers. It is the signs of Allah, the ayatullah, that they deny. So what is the ayah saying? The mushrikeen did not doubt the sincerity of the Prophet ﷺ. Imam al-Tabari, Imam al-Zamakhshari, they mention that they nicknamed him as sadiq al-Amin. That was their name for him. It's not a name given in the Quran or Hadith, although he's called Amin and Sadiq in sacred text as well. But this is before the, the Bi'tha. They claimed they claim that the Prophet was sort of sincerely deluded. But this was also just an excuse. This is not accurate as well, because the ayah said, يجحدون, They have juhud in Arabic. The, the verb yajhadun comes from the word juhud, kufur juhud, is to know something is true in your heart, but you just can't bring yourself 
to acknowledge it with the tongue. You hold the belief in the qalb, but it's not going to manifest on the tongue. Why? Out of arrogance or some sort of ulterior motive, desire, or out of spite, right? People who just can't admit they're wrong about something. Ali said that Abu Jahl told the Prophet, we do not call you a liar. We say that what you have brought is a lie. So Allah revealed this ayah. It is also related that the Prophet was distressed when his people cried lies against him. So Jibreel alayhi salam came to him and said, why are you distressed? He said, my people have called me a liar. Jibreel said, they know that you are telling the truth. Then Allah sent down this ayah. So this was very shocking to the Prophet ﷺ. These people who always loved him and trusted him and gave him these lofty titles, just suddenly accusing him of being a liar. You know, I don't know if I can give an adequate analogy. You know who Galileo was? He's an Italian astronomer from the 17th century. You guys know Galileo. Galileo probably had a 200 IQ and uh, he was a Catholic, and uh, so he was a genius. Everyone knew he was a genius. Imagine like he goes to some of his colleagues, and he says, you know, I think it's heliocentrism. I think the Earth is going around the sun. And they say, what are you, stupid? Imagine how that would hit him. How can I be stupid? I'm Galileo. You, you're, you've called me a genius my whole life, and now I'm suddenly stupid? It doesn't make any sense. You just don't like what I'm saying because it, there's, there's something about your doctrine that it doesn't sit well with you. It's like the uh, allegory in the caves that Plato gives in the Republic. These people sitting in a cave looking at shadows on the wall. One man gets up and he sees the actual forms, the, the reality of what's casting the shadows. So he goes back to the people and he says, this is fake. This is a reflection. Reality is outside. And they say, shut up and sit down. You don't know what you're talking about. They start beating him. So he sits down, but now he's blind. He can't see the shadows anymore. People just get, uh, they get comfortable in their ways. All right? So Imam at tabari says, the real reason why they rejected the Quran is because of their moral stubbornness. They did not want to be moral people. They enjoyed their hedonistic lifestyles. <clears throat> so the prophet's uh, theocentrism, but God at the center, his moral principles would compromise their positions of power and influence and pleasure. So most of the mushrikeen actually respected the Prophet They respected him, but they could not accept his message. Conversely, most of the Bani Israel in Yathrib, in Medina to Manawara, they, they respected his message. It's Tawheed, but they can't accept the man. Because he's not, he's not Jewish. He's Arab. And there was a prevalent belief amongst them. I mean, systematic Jewish theology wasn't born for another 400 years. But apparently, there was a belief that there are no Gentile prophets. The Hadith says that many of the Jews in Medina did believe he was a prophet. And Bukhari says that there's a, he relates a Hadith that they would sneeze in his presence on purpose. See him walk by. Ah, true. And then the Prophet would say, Yarhamukum Allah. I say, Ameen. Because they, they thought he was a prophet, but he's for the Arabs. He's not for us. Right. This type of thing. <clears throat> All right. Oh, by the way, that verse, we know, we know that what they say grieves you. It is not you they call a liar, but the evildoers. That's Surah Al An'am, chapter 6, verse 33. Now on page 14, then Allah consoles him. This is the second full paragraph. Then Allah consoles him and makes him rejoice by what he says about those before and the promise of his help to come. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu in the next ayah, ayah 34, Surah Al-An'am, وَلَقَدْ كُذِّبَتْ رُسُلٌ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Messengers before you were belied. فَصَبَرُوا عَلَى مَا كُذِّبُوا and they endured patiently that they were called liars. And they suffered. Until our help came to them. And then Qadi Iyadi mentions among the things that are mentioned about his special qualities, the khasa'is of the Prophet 
is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, addresses the other prophets by their actual first names, the ism alam. Ya Adam, Ya Nuh, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Musa, Ya Dawood, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, Ya Zakaria, Ya Yahya. But he never says Ya Muhammad in the Quran. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the title of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ayyuhal rasul. Ya ayyuhal nabiyu. Ya ayyuhal muzzammil. Ya ayyuhal muddathir. Section 4 concerning Allah swearing by his imminent, uh, by his immense worth. Allah quotes the ayah, 72 Surah Al-Hijr, La amruka, la in, la amruka, innahum la fi sakratihim ya'mahun. By your life, Allah takes an oath by the life of the Prophet, said, they are wandering about in their drunkenness. And Ibn Abbas said, I have not heard that Allah made an oath by the life of any other person. Allah did not create, originate, or make any soul that he honored more than the soul of the Prophet Allah says, Yasin wal Quran al-Hakim. What surah is this? Yes, I think that's good. The commentators disagree about the meaning of Yasin, saying different things about it. Abu Muhammad Maki related that the Prophet said, I have ten names with my Lord. I think this hadith is in the Shema'il as well. He mentioned Taha and Yasin. So these are from the Ayat Mutashabihat. Right? These, are, these are obscure verses that are not definitively established in their meanings. There are 29 suwar of the Quran that begin with these muqatta'at uh, uh, as they're called, these disjointed letters, alif lam mim, alif lam ra, hamim, yasin, qaf, noon, kafa, ya'in, sa'd. So Allahu alam, some, some of the ulama engaged in a ta'wil. Ta'wil is like a esoteric exegesis. But all of them say Allahu alam, nobody really knows. But that's the thing about a scholar, you say. Nobody knows, and they say, well, maybe it means this. Allahu alam. <laughs> Uh, Abdul Rahman al Sulami said, A Jafar al Sadiq, who was a great Imam of Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, by the way. Jafar al Sadiq is the sixth Imam of the Shia, but this, we, we claim him as a Sunni Imam. He was the teacher of Malik ibn Anas in Abu Hanifa. He was the great, great, great grandson of the Prophet, Imam Jafar al Sadiq. He said, The meaning of Yasin is Ya Sayyid. Addressing the Prophet ﷺ. There's a popular book that some of our brethren love called Kitab al Tawheed by uh, Muhammad Abdul Wahhab. Very popular book where he says that calling the Prophet Sayyid is not preferable. He quotes a hadith of Abu Dawood, but he classifies it as weak. But he says, nonetheless, he quotes the hadith that a waft, a delegation from Bani Amr, came to the Prophet ﷺ, and they said, Anta Sayyiduna, you are our Sayyid. And the Prophet said, As Sayyid Allah, Allah is the Sayyid. Then he continued, وسلم, don't let Shaitan provoke you. In other words, be careful about exaggerating my status. This is not a prohibition against calling him Sayyid. He is a Sayyid. In fact, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Inna ibni hadha Sayyidun. Who is he talking about? Imam Hassan, his grandson. How can Imam Hassan be a Sayyid, but the Prophet وسلم, is not Sayyid, or it's not preferable to call him Sayyid? The Prophet said in a hadith that is absolutely sound Bukhari and Tirmidhi, Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam, Wala Fakhr, I am the master of the children of Adam. And it's not a boast. This is the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about Yahya alayhi salam. And the maqam of Yahya is not the maqam of the Prophet Yahya is not even from the ulul azm in al-rusul. And Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya musaddiqan bi kalimatin min Allahi wa sayyidan wa hasura. That Yahya is called Sayyid. So if you know your aqidah, then it is preferable to refer to the Prophet وسلم, as Sayyid, because this is the reality. 
you don't know aqidah, and you're using terms for Allah and for the Prophet, then, right? Like the Prophet wasallam, he said, don't write down the hadith initially, so that's not confused with the Quran. But when you become familiar with the Quran, you become familiar with the hadith, then start recording things, record my hadith. You know, this is why when you make like, when you make da'wah to someone, you don't, you should, the first, you, sh you, sh you, know, you shouldn't be talking about jinn in, in, in your first da'wah attempt, right? You should talk about tawheed. Or you start, you know, giving expositions of the Sharia and things like that. You're going to lose people. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Alif Lam Mim." Dari kel kitab la rayba fi. Ibn Abbas said that these letters are oaths, qasam, by which Allah swears. He and other people have said various things. Sahala to study said, "Alif is Allah." Lam is Jibreel, and Mim is Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Wallahu alam. Section five, concerning Allah's oath to con to confirm His place with Him. So here, Qadi Iyad he quotes the entire surah al duha the translation says Surah 94, but that's incorrect. Surah 93. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and Imam Suti, by the way, he says about this Surah, Surah 93, al duha as well as Al-Inshirah, the Surah that follows after it. Imam Suti says in the Itqan that this is one of, one of three or four times in which the Prophet wasallam received a Surah through interior locution without angelic mediation. That this surah was placed directly into his heart, directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without the mediation of Jibreel alayhi salam. She translates, Your Lord has, so by the forenoon and the night when it is still, Your Lord has neither forsaken you nor hates you. So the, the Arabic doesn't say you. Right? Even though qala is a fi'il muta'addi. Generally requires a direct object. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't give a direct object because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never hint that he hates the Prophet. Why, was, why would Allah say this? Your Lord has not forsaken you, nor does he hate. And it's understood you, but he doesn't say that. It's because, according to the uh, tafsir, the asbab al nuzul, that there was a break in the revelation. For a few days or months, there's a difference of opinion. Some of the mushrikeen were making fun of the Prophet ﷺ, and they say things like, Inna Rabbahu wa da'ahu wa qalahu, his Lord has forsaken him and he hates him. Ma wa da'aka rabbuka wa ma qala, wa lal akhiratu khayru laka min al ula. What is later is better than what is former. That's literally what it says. The afterlife is better than a dunya, but the Arabic doesn't say dunya. Khayru min al dunya. You know, ula. It could mean dunya. The afterlife is better than the, the dunya for you. Or you can take it to mean what comes later is better than what's happening now. There's going to be Medina later. That's better. There's still going to be problems in Medina. That's life. But it's going to be better than now. And sofa. Sofa is used in Arabic for distant future. It's going to take some time, but eventually your Lord will give you something and immediately you're going to be pleased. But you have to go through some, some trials. According to Abu Nu'im, Imam al-Daylami, the Prophet وسلم, said, Lan arda wa wahidun min ummati fin nar. I will never be pleased while one person from my ummah is in the fire. When this ayah, ayah was revealed, um, that, Wala sofa yu'tika rabbuka fatarda. Soon will your Lord give you something and you'll be pleased. What will the Lord give him? Kawthar, a shafa'a. Um, make him head of state in Medina. All of these things come in the future. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is that the Allah? No. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, 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 he gives us three rhetorical questions. 
He gives the prophet three rhetorical questions as reminders of past blessings. And this is a good way of dealing with depression. The prophet was a little bit down during this time. And psychologists say that a good way of coming out of depression is just remind yourself of the blessings in your life. Sit down and just think about the blessings. What's happened in the past? Alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa. Were you not, uh, did he not find you an orphan and give you shelter? His father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. His grandfather died when he was eight. Abu Talib raised him. Abu Talib was the means by which Allah sheltered his prophet. And the prophet returned the favor, by the way. When Abu Talib was much older, he had some financial issues. And he couldn't take care of all of his sons. So the prophet said, give me one. He said, here, take Ali. Sayyidina Ali was raised in the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet in the house of the Prophet This is a bad translation that she made here. Did he not find you misguided? That's a terrible translation. Dalan here does not mean misguided. It means to be searching for something, wandering. Well, is it written? Oh, shut up. That's good. I have an old edition. Any questions? Yeah. It signifies um, a type of a type of greatness in that object itself. And this is something that the pre-Islamic Arabs, the, the shu'ara, the poets, would have recognized. So the, the Quran is not poetry, but it is poetic. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is appealing to the, the initial audience of the Quran. And so the initial audience are 7th century Arabs that are extremely gifted in poetry. Right? Now the interesting thing about the Quran is, according to Imam Baqilani, it doesn't fit any of the meters of Jahli poetry. This is what Al-Baqilani considers to be sort of an element of the ijaz of the Qur'an, element of the sort of inimitability of the Qur'an, is that it's just unclassifiable. Right? The Arabs didn't know what to do with it. But pre-Islamic Arab poetry had these types of oath statements, oath clusters as they're called. Right? Um, so it, it appealed to their sort of tastes, and they knew that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking an oath by something, then that thing must be great. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only takes oaths 
uh, by great things in the Quran, and we can only take oaths by Allah. Because Allah, we don't take oaths by anything else. Any other questions? I just want to finish this part right here, inshallah. Yes. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I don't know if I need to repeat the question. Just comparing the, the afu that the Prophet asked for compared to the afu that, that, or not that the Prophet asked for, but that was given to the Prophet compared to the Prophet, compared to the afu that we. Yeah, uh, so according to our prophetology, a, a, a prophet is, any prophet is, is incapable of consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they can make errors in judgment. So this was a, a, a slip in the, in the judgment of the Prophet because he's not all-knowing. He, he doesn't. He's not infallible in that sense that Allah is perfect, right? The so Prophet's gonna make errors in judgment. Yunus alayhi salam, uh, according to his judgment, these people in Nineveh they're not gonna believe in the Tawheed. So he said to himself, "Let me go to a different city for the Dawah," but he didn't take permission from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So Allah dealt with him harshly because the higher the maqam, the more that's expected from you. Um, so that's why, you know, sometimes you have someone who has a lot of knowledge, it might even be a hafiz of Qur'an, who is really not doing what he's supposed to be doing, and things go really bad in his life, really bad, because there's a high expectation from this person, right? Um, as far as us, we commit, you know, kaba'ir sin, um, so when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for afwa, we're asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to completely efface all of those sins. Whereas with the Prophet Sallallahu all those minor sort of slips of errors and judgments are effaced. Um, so one of, the, one of the favorite du'as of the Prophet Sallallahu is, Allahumma innaka afu wa tuhibbu al-afwa, fa'afu anna. Right? This is one of his most favorite du'as, especially during the month of Ramadan. So, inshallah ta'ala, um, make dua, call on the name al-afu, that on yawm al-qiyamah, these things that we do are completely just erased from the record. There's no trace of them. That's what it means. Any other questions from the sister's side? Yeah, I just wanted to make that comment. So it's been corrected, wandering, instead of misguided. fahada, That the Prophet ﷺ was searching for a sharia, a revealed law. Um, he never strayed from tawheed, um, and he was never immoral even by the standards of the sharia, even before the sharia. Uh, he was from the Hunafa, he was from the Abrahamic monotheists who were still around in Mecca at the time. He never worshipped idols. Did he not find you needy and enrich you? So Imam al-Baghawi here says that this is a reference to our mother Khadija al-Kubra. That the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet sallallahu of the blessing of a good and supportive wife. That she was his first disciple. That she encouraged him. There's a hadith in Abu Dawood that we're told that years after the death of Khadija, when the Prophet ﷺ was living in Medina, uh, a necklace once owned by Khadija was brought to Medina in order to ransom one of the captives at Badr. And Aisha says, when the Prophet saw it, Raqqa laha riqqatan shadidatan, that he had this like intense sensitivity and tenderness towards just an object from his first wife. Because she, he had remembered how much he had. Oh, that's the Iqama. We'll continue next week, inshallah. wa barakatuh. So we're continuing. This is now, uh, we are in part one, chapter one, in the middle of section five of Kitab al-Shifa. For those following along, um, this is the second full paragraph on page 18. So here Qali Iyad, he 
<coughs> quotes from the Quran here, Surah Al-Najm, Surah 53, uh, the first 18 verses, 53, 1 through 18. So he begins by saying, When Najmi ida hawa, by the star when it plunges, and the Najm here, the star, according to the exegetes, some of the exegetes is a reference to the Tanzil of the Qur'an. Tanzil is a reference to the, uh, the revelation of the Qur'an in continual installments. So there's an Inzal that's mentioned. An Inzal is the Qur'an being sent down in one shot, as it were, on Laylatul Qadr, inna anzalnahu, anzalna, this is the verb, the uh, noun is Inzal, so the Qur'an descending from the Loh to the Sama'u dunya and then from the Sama'u dunya there's a Tanzil. Every so often, a few ayat over 23 years would be revealed to the Prophet So this is the opinion of Imam Al-Biqa'i and Imam Al-Tabari that the meaning of Najm here in 53.1 is a reference to the Tanzil of the Qur'an, that the ayat are symbolized as nujum. Another opinion that Qadi Iyad mentions here is that the Najm, and, and this is the opinion of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, is that it is the Prophet wasallam, that he is the Najm, or it's the heart of the Prophet wasallam. And he says, people say similarly that in the verses, Sama'i wa tariq wa ma'adraka ma tariq and Najm thaqib Surah so Tariq, verses 1 through 3, by the heaven and the night star. And what we'll explain to you, what is a Tariq, the night star? It is a star of piercing brightness. So he says here that not only is the Najm mentioned in 53.1, a, a name of the Prophet wasallam, or symbol of the Prophet, so is a Tariq mentioned in Surah Tariq. So one najmi ida hawa, by the star when it descends, this is a reference then to the descension or the descent of the Prophet sallallahu from Masjidratul Muntaha on Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. Wallahu alam. He continues quoting the surah, ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa, that your companion is not astray, nor does he err, wa ma yantiqu anil hawa nor does he speak from caprice. And the translation here doesn't do it quite justice. No translation really does. It should say, nor does he ever speak from caprice, because when you have ma as a negating particle of a verb that's in the imperfect, the meaning is really never. In huwa illa wahyu yuha. This is only a revelation revealed. And here the Arabic is a, is a negation followed by an affirmation, as we said. In the previous classes, this is a very strong way of negating, of, of making a statement in Arabic. It's like our shahada, la ilaha illallah. In huwa illa, in here means, it is a negating particle. In huwa illa wahyu yuha. It is nothing except revelation. That he only speaks revelation. Allamahu shadidul quwa. Taught to him by one mighty in power. So Imam Al-Tabari here says that this is a reference to the Mu'allim of the Prophet وسلم, who is Jibril alayhi salam. And then he continues to quote Surah Al-Najm. ذو مرة فاستوى وهو بالأفق الأعلى ثم دنا فتدلى فكان قاب قوسين أو أدنى He stood poised while he was on the higher horizon then drew near and hung suspended two bow lengths away or nearer. So here, uh, it's mentioned by Imam al-Zamakhshari, Imam al-Tabari, that this is a reference to one of the two times in which the Prophet ﷺ uh, saw Jibril salam or Jibril salam appeared to him in his uh, actual created form. So either Jibril salam drew near to the Prophet ﷺ, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drew near to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he, the Prophet, drew near and he, Allah, came close. So not in terms of space, time, or distance. If we take the latter um, interpretation that it is a reference to Allah drawing near to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, we're not talking about 
anything to do with any type of physical space or direction. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transcends space, time, and matter. So then when it says, فَكَانَ قَابَ قَوْسَيْنِ أَوْ أَدَنَا That he was within two bow lengths or even closer. A bow is about six feet, two bow lengths is about twelve feet. So we don't take the literal meaning here. This is majaz. This is figurative. The meaning is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very, very close in relationship, was close to the Prophet in love. This is similar to the meaning of the Hadith Qudsi we quoted last time. That my servant continues to draw close unto me with his nawafil, his uh, extra credit worship, supererogatory worship, until I love him. So this type of qurb or closeness or proximity, a relational closeness, not a physical closeness. Of course, the Quran says, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are closer to the human being than his jugular vein. So this ayah denotes what's known as the imminent deity in, in uh, Western theology. Uh, there's, there's an idea of imminence, closeness of God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to the human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concern for the human being. He's not a cold or reserved or distant deity. He's not a totally transcendent deity, as in like a Aristotelian god or a deist god. There's a hadith, there's multiple, it's in multiple books of hadith actually, Sahih Muslim, Abu Dawood, and Nasai. Where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abd min rabbihi wa huwa sajid. Oh, kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. That the closest a servant can be to his Lord is when he is in sajda. So obviously this has nothing to do with directionality, right? So this idea that, you know, Allah is up in the sky somewhere, right? Um, this idea is grossly anthropomorphic and incorrect, that if I pray on my roof that I'm closer to God or something. The Prophet said, whoever is in sajda is in reality closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, فَأَكْثِرُ dua." So make a lot of dua in sajda. In the Hanafi school, uh, we would do this in the nafila prayers not in the fara'id. One of my teachers said that Yunus alayhi salam was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in reality. And where was Yunus? He was in, he was fit dhulumat. Fanada fit dhulumat. He was in levels of darknesses. In the belly of the whale, in the darkness of the night, the darkness of the ocean, fit dhulumat. But he was in sajda, and he was making dua, he was making tawbah, la ilaha illa ant, Subhanaka inni kuntu min al One of my teachers said that Yunus alayhi salam was closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment than an angel is standing in the Baytul Ma'mur ma uh, beyond the seventh heaven or in the seventh heaven. Because Yunus alayhi salam is in sajda. So the ulama say that then we're saying that at this maqam, at this station, the Prophet ﷺ experienced uh, the ru'ya. And he continues to say here, he continues to quote from Surah Al-Najm, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى We'll come back to this ayah. مَا كَذَبَ الْفُؤَادُ مَا رَآ His heart did not lie about what he saw, or his heart did not lie about what it saw. Imam Al-Qurtubi mentions here that uh, the meaning is, that the Prophet ﷺ did in fact experience the ru'ya, what's known as the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that's part of our essential creed. Imam Tahawi says in the Aqidah Tahawiyah, he says, jannah, that the beatific vision, gazing upon the countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is, is, uh, is true is a reality for the people of paradise. And then he'll uh, quote the ayat, كَلَّ بَلْ تُحِبُّنَ الْعَاجِلَ وَتَذَرُونَ الْآخِرَ وَجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ نَاظِرَةً إِلَى رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةً That on that day, faces will be illuminated, uh, gazing toward their Lord. Surah Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So Imam Al-Qurtubi, he suggests that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
that that the Prophet sallallahu saw Allah subhanahu wa taala with his fuad. Ma kathab al fuad ma raa. The fuad here is translated as heart. It's one of the ways of saying heart in Arabic. Sometimes it's translated as the inflamed heart. Fa'ada means to roast or to burn, to inflame. Sometimes it's called the emotive heart. Right? So when the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can imagine it was a very extremely powerful emotional experience, but he did not let his emotions over, overpower him, uh, and he remained composed. Another way of translating or thinking about the fu'ad is what's known as the mind's eye, right? The mind's eye, not the physical eye, the basar, but the mind's eye. So this is related to the faculty of understanding. This is something that is non-physical. This idea actually goes back to Plato, right? This idea that you see particulars with your physical eye, but you have to contemplate the essences or the real forms of things with your mind's eye, as he says. So when you see something with your mind's eye, it means you really understand it at a deep level, right? So if I explain something to you, if I explain, I don't know, I'm not good at math, but if I explain algebra to you and you say, ah, I see, that means you understand. You understand something in your mind's eye. So it indicates a deep type of, of gnosis or ma'rifa. Oh, that tea is too hot. <clears throat> so with this understanding, he experienced an incredible understanding of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the strongest sense of ma'rifah possible for a human being. <clears throat> so he experienced the ru'ya, the beatific vision, as we said. How did he see Allah? Bila kafiya. As Imam Tahawi says, it's amodal. That means there's there's no way of understanding it. It's without a howness to it, and it's beyond our comprehension. It's not the physical eye, but a type of powerful theophany or experience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And in this vein, the ayah is sometimes quoted: "La tudrikuhu al-absaru, wa huwa yudrikuhu al-absar." That. No vision can grasp him, yet he grasps all vision. Or, he did see something with his eye, his basar. Um, there's a hadith in Muslim, Abu Dar, he says that he asked the Prophet ﷺ, Hal ra'ita rabbak? Did you see your Lord? And the Prophet ﷺ responded with, Ra'itu nuran. I saw a light. Now, some people understand this response as an affirmative, uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not corporeal. He doesn't have a physical physicality to him. He's not material. So according to this understanding, then, uh, he did not see the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in himself, as it were. But rather, the Prophet ﷺ, he experienced the greatest possible self disclosure or tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a veil of light that concealed the divine essence, that is to say, a brilliant created light that symbolized the divine essence or symbolized the divine presence. Allahu alam. We think back to the ayah. In Surah Al-A'raf with Musa alayhi salam where he says, Rabbi arini andur ilayk, O oh my Lord, show yourself to me so that I might gaze upon you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Lan tarani, you will not see me, but look at the mountain. I will manifest myself to the mountain, and if the mountain stays put, then you will see me. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is ayah 143 of Surah Al-A'raf, فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّ رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, manifested or disclosed himself to the mountain. So this doesn't mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came into the physical world, right? That it was an incredible, blinding, physical light symbolizing the divine essence. This is what manifested, according to this understanding. And then the mountain was pulverized. And Musa fell down, thunderstruck, 
And some of the ulama mentioned, Imam Zamakhshari, Imam Tabri actually mentioned that Musa died, that he actually died, right? This is mentioned in the tafasir. Falama afaqa, and then he regained his senses, meaning he was resurrected after that. This is something I think that maybe the medieval Jewish theologians uh, took from Muslim theologians as well. Probably the most famous Jewish theologian, Maimonides, um, uh, he said that, uh, and he, he was a product of you know the, the Muslim world. He was um, uh, he lived in Spain and in Egypt and so on and so forth. He's highly influenced by Imam Al Ghazali and others. But his opinion was that when Musa alayhi salam would go into the tabernacle. In Hebrew, it's called the Mishkan. It's kind of like a portable uh, tent where Musa alayhi salam would go inside and then a brilliant light would manifest in front of him. And this light symbolized the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a created light. It's just a symbol of God's presence. It wasn't God, right? Um, this light is called the Shekhinah in Hebrew. This is what Maimonides calls it. Um, the Quran actually says that the Ark of the Covenant, which was an ark that was, um, that was built by the ancient Israelites in the Sinai, which housed the original Torah and some of the relics of Musa salam, like his staff was in there. The Quran says that the Ark of the Covenant was endowed with the Shekhinah. The, the equivalent is Sakina, right? Sakina. Uh, in the Ayat of Mulkihi, and yet yakum at-tabut fihi sakinatun min rabbikum that from the signs of his kingship is that he gave you the tabut the ark of the covenant and that within it is sakina is shekhina and what does this mean it could mean that there was some sort of light that emanated from the ark of the covenant uh, a sign of uh, of god's presence as it were or tawfiq with was, was with bani israel uh, at the time Wallahu <clears> alam. <throat> There's a hadith Ibn Majah, this is quoted by Ibn Ajiba and Imam Suyuti and others, that the Prophet sallallahu he said, Hijabuhu nur, the veil of God is light. Lo kashafaha, and that if this veil was removed, his face would burn everything in creation. Right? However, there is another hadith. There's another hadith, and this is in multiple books of a hadith. Ibn Majah, Tirmidhi, Sahih Muslim. That the Prophet sallallahu he quoted from Surah Yunus, verse number 26. لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُ الْحُسْنَ وَزِيَادَةً Those who do good, the reward is good, and something extra. And the Prophet sallallahu said, this ziyada is the ru'ya is the beatific vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, when the people of paradise enter paradise, a caller will call out, indeed, there remains a promise with Allah. And then the people will say, have our faces not been illuminated, saved from the fire, and admitted to paradise? And then the Prophet said, for yukshaful hijab, then the veil is lifted. The veil is actually lifted. And then he said, For by God, nothing is more beloved to them, nothing that Allah gave them is more beloved to them than glancing at Him, than the vision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the people of paradise will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the veil removed. How is this possible? Allahu alam. Bila kafiya. There's no howness to it. There's no way we can possibly understand this. But this is a reality. Again, as Imam al Tahawi says. So this is the meaning here, going all the way back to Surah Al Najm, according to many of the ulama, uh, that ma kathab al fu'adu ma ra'a. Again, his heart did not lie about what it saw or he saw. It continues. Will you dispute with him about what he saw? Indeed, he saw him at another time by the low tree of the boundary of Sidratul Muntaha, right, which is in the seventh heaven, near which is the garden of refuge, Jannatul Ma'wa. When what covered the low tree covered it, his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. Ma zagal basaru wa ma 
وَلَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He saw one of the greatest signs of his Lord. <clears throat> so Qadi Iyad, he mentions here, what Allah disclosed to him of his unseen dominion of the Jabarut and the wonders of the angelic realm, the Malakut, cannot be expressed in words. And the human intellect would not be able to withstand hearing even the least part of it. Allah indicates it by indirect allusion and reference, which shows the esteem in which the Prophet is held. Allah says, فَأَوْحَى إِلَىٰ عَبْدِهِ مَا أَوْحَى Which means that then Allah revealed to his servant whatever he revealed. What was that which he revealed? Some of the ulama mentioned that a few things. They say that the end of Al-Baqarah was revealed to the Prophet called Khawatim Al-Baqarah, the last two ayahs of Al-Baqarah, which contains our essential creed, Aman al-Rasul, this is how it begins. It, it contains our essential creed. These were revealed to the Prophet when he was at the Sidratul Muntaha in the seventh heaven. And Jibreel alayhi salam was not there. It was only the Prophet So these verses were placed directly into his heart by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without an angelic mediation. Also, the ulama mentioned the prayer was made fard during this time, five times a day. There's a, a wa'ad of Jannah that was given to the Prophet and his nation, the promise of paradise, and other things. Um, as Qadi Iyad says here, secrets of the Jabarut and Malakut. Ibn Ajiba mentions this also with regard to the, the final ayah in that sequence. لَقَدْ رَآ مِنْ آيَاتِ رَبِّهِ الْكُبْرَى He saw one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Ibn Ajiba says, these are secrets, asrar, of the Malakut and Jabarut. These are celestial realms or worlds beyond the mulk, beyond the perceptible world. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Ordinary understanding is not able to grasp the details of what was revealed. So then he says, in this ayah, Allah alludes to the Prophet's state of total purity and his protection from harm during the journey. And he's talking about the Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. He affirmed the purity of his heart, tongue, and eye. His heart by the words, ma kathab al fu'ad ma ra'a, the purity of his tongue by, wa ma yantiku anil hawa, he never speaks from his caprice, and his eye, ma zagh al basaru wa ma tagha, his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. Purity of heart, tongue, and eye. If we can guard the purity, if we can make our hearts, tongues, and eyes pure, then we'll be in a good state, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> okay. Sorry. And then he, uh, he quotes now Qadi Iyad. He moves to Surah Al-Takwir. This is Surah 81. And he quotes uh, uh, from 15, Ayah 15 to 25. Kind of the middle of the Surah. Allah says, I'll, this translation says, No, I swear by those who slip away, the runners, those who hide themselves, by the night swarming, by the morning sighing. Innahu laqawlu rasulin kareem. This is the jawab al-qasam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran oftentimes especially in the Meccan suwar, he'll take an oath by something, and uh, that's called the qasam, and then he'll give the sort of, um, the, uh, the, 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 the statement of oath. Uh, like if I say, for example, I swear to Allah, that's called an oath, but you're waiting for the, what's known as the jawab al-qasam. I say, well, I prayed fajr. I swear to Allah, I prayed fajr. That's called the jawab al-qasam. So the jawab al-qasam here, innahu, لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ Karim. That truly, this is the word of a noble messenger. It continues, ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ ذِي الْأَرْشِ مَكِينٍ Having power, secure with the Lord of the throne. مُطَاعٍ ثُمَّ amin, Obeyed and trusted. Then it continues, your companion is not possessed. He truly saw him on the clear horizon. So Ali ibn Isa al-Rumani and others said that the noble messenger وسلم, is Muhammad So all these attributes are his. Others, say, others said it is Jibreel 
So these qualities are his. He truly saw him means that he, Jibril, saw Muhammad sallallahu It is said that it is uh, said that it means that he, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi saw his Lord. It is said that it means he saw Jibril in his true form. There's a difference of opinion about what does it mean that he truly saw him on the clear horizon. Some of the ulama say that, again, this is a reference to the ru'ya, the beatific vision that the Prophet sallallahu experienced uh, on the later to Isra wal Mi'raj. That is something that's going to happen, inshallah, for all the believers that make it to Jannah. There's even an opinion that everyone on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah will experience the Ru'ya. Everybody will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bila kayfiya, without any howness. But then the kuffar will suddenly be veiled from him. And they'll never experience that again. Uh, the Iyad, he then he moves to Surah Al-Qalam, Surah 68. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Noon is one of those uh, letters, the huruful muqatta'at, that nobody really knows the meaning. Of course, the ulama have their opinions, but it's always Allahu alam. A popular opinion here, Ibn Kathir, Imam al-Qurtubi, is that Noon here stands for Noor, light. Wallahu alam. Wal qalami wa ma yasturun. By the pen and what they inscribe. Ma anta bi ni'mati. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. You are not by the blessing of your Lord a man possessed. Inna laka la ajran ghayra mamnoon. You shall surely have an unfailing reward or wage. Inna ka la ala khulukin azim. And surely you are possessed of mighty nature. Or, I mean, that's an interesting translation. Verily, you dominate magnificent character. Something like you stand on monumental ethics, something like that. <clears throat> so he said, Allah swears by uh, this great oath um, that his chosen prophet was free of what the unbelievers ascribe to him in their disdain and rejection of him. He brings joy to him and increases him in hope, uh, and he addresses him gently saying, you are not by the blessing of your Lord a man possessed. This shows the greatest respect and is an example of the highest degree of adab in conversation. Then he tells him that we will have eternal blessings and an immeasurable reward with him, one that can be counted and will not make him in any way indebted, using the words, you shall surely have an unfailing wage. Then he praises him for the gifts he has given him. <clears throat> he guides him to himself and confirms that to emphasize his praiseworthiness. He says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُوكٍ عَظِيمٍ so it's very interesting here in the Arabic that the uh, the word ala in Arabic, uh, this is called a dharfu makan. It's a spatial adverb. And usually, if you say ala, the word that follows it should be something concrete, right? Like a table or a desk, like al qalamu ala, ala al maktab, right? The pen is on the table. But in rhetoric, if the word that follows ala, uh, is abstract, like khuluk means ethics or character. This denotes what's known as tamakun or mastery. So in nakala ala khuluk, you master khuluk azim. Azim is added as a as an uh, adjective, magnificent character, a standard of character. It is said that these wor words refer to the Quran, and the translator has. A note here that Aisha was asked about the character of the Prophet ﷺ, and she said, "Kana khulukuhu al Quran." That his character was the Quran. He is an embodiment of the Kitab, the, the Word made flesh, as it were. <coughs> Others say it refers to Islam, and it is said that they simply mean noble nature. It is also said that the meaning of them is that the Prophet ﷺ has no aspiration except Allah. Then he, he says, Qadi Iyad, he says, then Allah continues the surah by consoling him for what they said about him, by promising him that they will be punished. He threatens them with his words. Uh, you shall see, and they will see, which of you is afflicted. Surely your Lord knows very well those who have gone astray from his way, and he knows very well those who are guided. 
Then after praising him, Allah censures his enemies, makes known their bad character, and enumerates their faults. Then he follows this with his bounty and his helping the Prophet. He mentions some ten or so censured qualities. So um, this is uh, very common in Semitic rhetoric. It's very common in the Quran. This idea of binarity is what is called in English rhetoric or double portraits or tibak, this sort of juxtaposition of opposite ideas. Uh, so juxtaposed with the ayah describing the Prophet's beautiful character uh, is the mukaddibin, those who are uh, denying the Prophet and their character traits. Right? So you have khuluq azim or khuluq mahmud, praiseworthy character, juxtaposed with khuluq madhmum, uh, blameworthy character or bad character. So when you read uh, these, when we read these descriptions of the character of, uh, of those who are um, uh, rejecting the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet's character is exactly the opposite of this. It is juxtaposed against this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not obey those who reject al-mukadhibin, the people of takdib, right? the people who rebel against God. And they're proud of it. They call these people today anti-theists. They're not just atheists. This is someone who says, there might be a God, but I don't want to obey him anyway. Anti-theist. Right? People of takdib. Kathabat thamudu bi taghwaha. They hope that you will try to conciliate with them, and they will try to conciliate with you. <clears throat> or another way of translating this, they hope that you will try to compromise with them, and they will try to compromise with you. So the Prophet ﷺ did have a conciliatory nature. He compromised uh, at Hudaybiyah uh, with the treaty. You know, the Muslims wrote Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and then an envoy from the Mushrikeen in Mecca uh, Suhail ibn Amr, he came and he said that, what is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? Who is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim? These are the names of Allah. He said, I've never heard of these. Change it to Allahumma bismika. And the Prophet said, okay, no problem. And they kept reading the document and it says, Muhammad Rasulullah. And he said, I don't believe you're Rasulullah. Right? So let's make it more secular. Let's write Ibn Abdullah, because we both agree on that. So the Prophet said, okay, no problem. Right? We can compromise on that. So he said, Sayyidina Ali, show me where it says Rasulullah. He says, right here. And he said to Ali, erase it. And, brought, and Ali said, no, I'm never going to erase it. So Sayyidina Ali, he disobeys the Prophet Sallallahu out of respect for the Prophet Sallallahu So he said, show me where it is. He says, right here. So he, he erased it himself. Right? So he compromised, but he did not compromise his theology and ethics. There was no compromise when it comes to theology and ethics. Right? Remember the man who came to the Prophet وسلم, said, Ya Rasulullah, قُلْ لِي فِي الْإِسْلَامِ قَوْلًا لَا أَسَلُ عَنْهُ أَحَدًا غَيْرَكَ Tell me something special about Islam that only you can tell me. قُلْ أَمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمْ مُسْتَقِمْ Say, I believe in Allah and be firm upon that. Have istiqama. Stand firm upon that. Be a principled person. Don't be a wishy-washy person. Right? <clears throat> Of course, Ibn Hisham mentions that early in the Meccan period, um, they tried threatening the Prophet Sallallahu They tried sort of buying him out, right? You know, we'll give you, we'll make you the king, and we'll give you this and that, and, uh, and none of these things, none of these, none, none of these things worked because the Prophet Sallallahu would not compromise in these areas. So then he continues to describe the Mukaddibin calls them every mean swearer, or a better, a better translation, vile oath monger. So the tafsir says that they're always swearing by Allah's name, but they're always lying. They're, all, they're full of wallahis, wallahi, 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 but you can't trust anything they're saying. They're always lying. Backbiter, going about with slander. So they spread gossip, they love scandal. Hinder of good, guilty aggressor. They're harsh, they're negative, they're immature, right? The Prophet ﷺ said it is from a person's muru'ah, or uh, maturity, that he can hear the opinion of another man, and he won't interrupt him, even when he disagrees. 
this is something that is just lost now. People are just so easily offended. They're, they have a term for it. They're triggered. Now in colleges, you know, they have these sort of safe spaces they go to. If they feel like they've been offended by some, some opinion they don't like, they go to these little rooms and they play with Play-Doh. They play video games. This is relatively new. I didn't, I don't remember having safe spaces when I was in, an undergrad in the early 2000s. But that's what's happening. <clears throat> and then coarse and rude, we said that. Moreover, ignoble because he has wealth and sons. So this is a type of person who thinks that because he has a lot of children or he has a lot of money, that he's better than everybody else. Right? Elsewhere in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yawma la yanfa'u malun wa la banun. That on the day of judgment, uh, children or sons, children in general, uh, or wealth, will not benefit anyone. Illa man atallaha biqalbin salim. Except the one who brings to God a sound heart. Then it's possible for your wealth and children to benefit you. Because you spent in the way of Allah and your children make du'a for you, so on and so forth. And then he finishes this section here in Surah Qalam. When our signs are recited to him, they say these are fairy tales of the ancients. Right. <clears throat> like, even, like even today you'll have people, you know, the flood, you know, the flood of Noah, the exodus. This is just mythology and where is their historical proof? You know, the Quran says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا That the word of your Lord is fulfilled in truth and in justice. In the 1980s, the tomb of a very high-ranking Semitic official was discovered in a place called Averis, which uh, is in, in Egypt, in northern Egypt. It used to be, used to be called Goshen. According to the Torah, at least, this is where the Israelites lived. This is where Yaqub made hijrah to. This is where his 12 sons lived. There was a tomb found there um, that many Egyptologists, like David Roll, I mean, these are not people that are necessarily religious, they're very secular scholars. David Ayling, Charles Ayling, they say that this is probably the tomb of Joseph. This is their opinion. In 1998, there were these two brilliant geophysicists at uh, Columbia, um, Ryan and Pittman, and they found exactly uh, where the flood occurred, when it occurred, and how it happened. It's incredible work. Uh, they actually wrote a book. It's called Noah's Flood, the New Scientific Discoveries about the event that changed history. It agrees with the Quranic narrative 100%. It's really amazing. Um, their theory is called the, uh, the, the Black Sea Deluge Theory. I, um, I highly uh, encourage you to look it up. Because this is something that's always attacked by like atheists or secular people. Right? Uh, these stories, they have no historical basis, so on and so forth. But you know, th this was th this book was published in 1998. This is something relatively new. You know. So the word of thy Lord finds fulfillment. But tamad kalimatu rabbika sidqan wa adla. It takes an amount of trust, a bit of trust. <coughs> but this is what this is what they, the mukaddibin. You know, these are just fairy tales. You know, what do, what do you what do you believe in this stuff? This type of thing. You know, more scientific. Right? We're scientific. Um, yet they believe that there's something called dark matter. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the catch-all for them. You know, like the Jupiter makes orbits around the sun. But the math doesn't quite work for them. Jupiter's too big. What keeps Jupiter in its orbit consistently? Dark matter. What is that? It's just something that's out there. It it's sort of fills in the gaps of the ignorance. Right. The universe is expanding, and it's increasing in its expansion. How is that happening? Dark energy. What is that? Just trust us. It's dark energy. Why should I trust you? Anyway. 
Allah concludes these words with the real threat that, that their misery will be complete and their total ruin by saying, we will brand him upon the muzzle, the khurtum, like we'll brand him on the nose. So the nose is sort of the, the most apparent feature on the face, right? So most of the ulama believe this is an idiomatic expression, that it means that Allah will expose people of vice and corruption. He'll expose the people of rebellion for what there, it really is. Right? They'll be proven wrong eventually. <clears throat> okay, so that's, let's see what we're doing. Any questions or <coughs> comments? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the standard exegesis here is that um, the, the recorders, the inscribers are the manaika, right? That it's an oath, taking the oath by the recording angels their pen is recording um, the events of the world, the deeds of humanity. So Allah is taking an oath by the angels. Wallahu alam. There may be other meanings. There definitely are other meanings. Others say the qalam is a reference to the first thing that Allah created. There's a hadith like this. The first thing that Allah created is the pen. Right? There's a sound hadith, I believe. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then uh, Allah said to the pen, uktub write. And then it started writing the history of existence. And that's why some of the traditions mentioned that when the Prophet ﷺ was beyond a Siddilatul Muntaha, he heard a scratching sound. And it was the pen writing um, the history of existence. Wallahu alam. Yeah. They appear to be different angels. They're assigned to each person. Yeah. Allahu alam. But, inshallah, that's correct. Yeah. So that on the Yom Al Qiyamah, people receive their kitab. It's mentioned in the Quran. Kiram and Katibin is mentioned, the recording angels. And then the kitab. The believers in the right hand, the unbelievers in the left hand are behind the back. Yeah. Any other questions? And of course, we want an edited version of that kitab. We said last time, one of the names of Allah is Al-Afu, the one who erases. <laughs> so the things in the kitab, you're like, oh, I don't want to look at this chapter. <laughs> and there's nothing there is gone because the toba was accepted and Allah just effaced it is gone mm -hmm. yeah there's an ayah in the Quran like this yeah yeah I don't know the left of the, the ayah but there's something like this in, in definitely in the Quran I have to look it up, inshallah. Let's see. Uh, so section six now is concerning Allah's addressing the Prophet with compassion and generosity. So he begins by quoting Surah Taha. Allah says, Taha. So this is usually taken to be one of the names of the Prophet Imam al-Razi mentions that Jafar al-Sadiq Jafar al-Sadiq is the same one who said that Yasin is Yasayid. He mentions that Jafar al-Sadiq says it refers to the purity, Tahara, of the Ahlul Bayt. And others say that the meaning is Ya Tahir, one of the names of the Prophet Ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'an li tashqa. We did not send down the Qur'an upon you in order for you to be distressed. It's better than wretched. Distressed is a better word. 
So he says, it is said that, so I mentioned that as one of the names of the Prophet Sallallahu One of the meanings also, according to Ibn Abbas, is, oh man, Taha in the Meccan dialect. It's mentioned by Ibn Abbas, at least something attributed to Ibn Abbas, that one of the meanings of Taha is, oh man, or oh reader, right? So, um, uh, Ibn Hisham relates the conversion of Sayyidina Umar, right? We know the story of Sayyidina Umar that he had a sword and he was going to Darul Arkham to kill the Prophet ﷺ. That was his intention. And then a man named Nu'aim, a secret Muslim, sees him and says, where, where are you going? He says, I'm going to go kill him. And he said, what about your own household? So he had to buy time for the Prophet ﷺ to go tell them. So Sayyidina Umar, he goes to his house and he can, he can hear a scribe named Khabab reciting from Surah Taha. Right? And his sister Fatima and her husband Zayd are inside. And of course, we know the story. He busts down the door. They get into a tussle. His sister is injured. She tries to break up the two men and she's like elbowed or punched in the face or something. And there's blood. So Omar feels bad. So they give him the, the scroll and he reads it. Um, and he reads Surah Taha. Taha man zanna alayka al Quran li tashqa. This sort of speaks to him directly. Oh man, we did not send this Quran in order for you to be distressed. And then he read, Hal ataka hadithu Musa. And Sayyidina Umar's temperament is very similar to Moses, <laughs> according to that Prophet. They're very similar. So there's a very, like, sort of, um, what do you call it? Um, like a, uh, a passage that was sort of tailored for him personally, that appealed to his heart. And by the way, the oldest, um, the oldest manuscript in the world, Quran manuscript in the world, is contains Surah Taha. It's four pages long, and it's dated to right in the middle of the Meccan period. This could be the very uh, manuscript that, that Sayyidina Omar was actually reading. It's possible. It's called the Birmingham Manuscript. It's in um, University of Birmingham in, in England. Um. It is also said that it is the imperative of the verb to tread, and that the ha indicates the earth, i.e., stand on the earth with both feet and do not tire yourself by standing on one foot. This is why Allah says, we have not sent down the Quran upon you for you to be dis uh, distressed. He sent down the ayat when the Prophet used to make himself stay awake and exhaust himself standing in prayer through the night. al rabi ibn Anas said that the Prophet prayed when the prophet prayed, he used to stand on one leg and then the other. So he used to like ro not like stand on one leg. He would rotate or shift his weight from foot to foot. Um, so that Allah revealed to him, Taha, i.e., stand with both feet upon the earth, O Muhammad. We have not sent down the Quran upon you for you to be distressed. In any case, it is clear that all this indicates honor and excellent behavior. Imam Qurtubi mentioned something similar to that. Of course, the hadith in Tirmidhi, Kana sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi salli hatta tarimu qadamah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray until his feet would swell. Right? So don't exhaust yourself with this worship. Or, according to the ulama, it is a reference to the Prophet's grief and incredible concern for the Meccans when most of them initially disbelieved in his message. Like we said last, last week, the fact that they're not believing him, even though he had a stellar reputation, is something that is just mind-boggling to him. Like, why don't you believe me now? Who else could bring you this message and you'd believe? So this is why the Quran was, is almost like a sense of his distress, that this is sort of what sort of made this attitude towards me. So Allah is saying to him, uh, we did not send the Quran down for that purpose. In this vein, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Kahf, ayah number 6, فَلَعَلَكَ بَاخِئٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ إِنَّمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَىٰ Perhaps you will consume yourself out of grief for them if they do not believe in this message. Uh, and then she says, i.e., kill yourself. But kill doesn't mean like he's going to kill himself literally. It means like Imam al-Razi says, like utterly exhaust himself with grief to be so just overcome with grief, exhausted with grief, because his people don't believe in him. <clears throat> so Allah says, had we so willed, we would have sent down on them from heaven a sign so that their necks would remain humble to it. In the same vein, Allah says, proclaim what you are commanded and turn away from the idolaters. 
We are enough for you against the mockers. And here the mockers are the mustahzi'un. That's the word in Arabic. Istihza. The mockers of the Prophet. There's a special group, especially bad group, from the kuffar, right? That are called the mustahzi'un. These are people who didn't just disbelieve in the Prophet like before the Fatha Mecca, Abu Sufyan did not believe in the Prophet Ibn al Amr ibn al As did not believe in the Prophet right? But they are not from the Mustahzi'un. The Mustahzi'un are those who mock the Prophet right? Uh, so these are people like Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, uh, Al As ibn Wa'il, Ubay ibn Khalaf, Umay ibn Khalaf. None of these men became Muslim. None of them became Muslim. They were either killed at Badr or they died from diseases. Every single one of the Mustahzi'un. None of them were guided to Islam. But people that were fierce opponents of the Prophet like Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, tried to kill the Prophet many times, but he did not mock the Prophet This right? is where the ulama say that, that mocking the Prophet uh, is, is tantamount to kufr. Um, and also breaching adab with al bayt of the Prophet puts one in danger of a su' al khatima a bad ending, right? Because of what happened to the mustahzi'un. And your lineage will not help you because Abu Lahab is Bani Hashim and he's the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he says, we know that your breast is constricted by what they say. It's an idiomatic expression. He feels a tightness, a distress. You feel a tightness in your chest because of what they're saying. But then Allah says, messengers before you were mocked, and I gave the unbelievers a respite, then I seized him. I seized them. Then Allah set his mind at ease and excused him, saying, فَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ فَمَا أَنْتَ بِمَلُومْ Turn away from them, you are not to be blamed. And remind them, for the reminder, meaning the Quran, benefits the believers. Similarly, Allah says, Be patient under the judgment of your Lord. You are before our eyes. Or be patient, study Quran says, be patient with the judgment of thy Lord, for thou art before our eyes. What does that mean? I asked one of my teachers, can you translate to that to me in, in California English? And he says, the meaning is, relax, I got your back. <laughs> relax, I'm backing you up. Section 7, let's see here. Five minutes till eight. Any questions or comments? Section seven, we'll start it and we'll end when I hear the Adhan, inshallah. Concerning Allah's praise of him and his numerous excellent qualities, Allah says, Allah made a pact with the prophets. This is called the prophetic covenant. It's mentioned in Surah Ali Imran, Surah number three. Verse 81, 381, the prophetic covenant. A covenant is an agreement. Stipulating, I have given you something of the book, kitab and hikmah, wisdom. Then a messenger will come to you, confirming what you have. You are to believe in him and help him. Allah asked, do you acknowledge that? Do you take on that burden of my pact on that basis? They said, aqrarna, we acknowledge that. Then Allah says, fashhadu. Bear witness, and I am among the witnesses. Abu Hassan al Qabisi said that Allah singled out the Prophet for an excellence which he did not give to anybody else. He clearly states this in the ayah. The commentators say that Allah made this pact by means of revelation. He did not send any prophet without mentioning and describing the Prophet to him. The pact stipulated that if any prophet met the Prophet, he must believe in him. It is said that the pact entailed telling them their people about him 
and that it stipulated that they must explain this and describe him to those coming after them. Allah's words, Ja'akum, Ja'akum Rasulun, then a messenger will come, is in fact addressed to the people of the book, contemporary with the Prophet. Now the next ayah says, فَمَن تَوَلَّا بَعْدَ ذَلِكْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ That whoever turns away after this, they are iniquitous. Imam Razi and Qurtubi say this ayah must refer, the previous ayah must refer then to the prophets and their followers because a prophet would never turn away uh, and become iniquitous. But their followers might, and they have. So this is just one of the many mithaq, the covenants mentioned in the Qur'an. There's another covenant, it's called the uh, primordial covenant, mithaqul alast. This is uh, mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked all of humanity before he created their physical bodies, perhaps in some pre-somatic uh, spiritual state where he was questioning our ruh, our wah, our souls. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we answered, bala shahidna. And this is one of the reasons why, according to the ulama, the Quran is called a dhikr, the reminder, right? That, that latent within our human nature, our fitra, uh, is, is this recognition, recognition, right? To, to re-know something, uh, to re-know our ubudiyah, or to remember the ubudiyah to the rabb, right? It's why people argue, natural law theorists argue, that everybody, if they think clearly with reason, with their aql, they must come to the conclusion that there is a creator of the universe, and it's a singular creator. Those are the sort of effects of the covenant, yom alast. So I guess we'll stop, inshallah. It's nearly eight. So next time we'll continue, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallam. Alhamdulillah. Wa sallam. Inshallah Ta'ala, we're continuing. Inshallah, we'll finish chapter one um, tonight, Inshallah Ta'ala. I believe we're on section seven. There's ten sections in chapter one. And then we'll move on, inshallah. So last time we talked about section seven concerning Allah's praise of him and his numerous excellent qualities. So Qadi Ayyad here, he quotes, as we said, Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 81. This is called the prophetic covenant. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he took a covenant from all of the prophets, as we said. And the gist of the covenant uh, according to the commentators that are quoted here by Qadi Iyad, is that the covenant stipulated that if any prophet met the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he must believe in the Prophet وسلم, and help the Prophet's mission. It is said that the pact or the covenant, it's called a mithaq, entailed telling, uh, telling their people about him as well. So every prophet describe the Prophet ﷺ to their people. So he says here, Allah's words, جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ as we said last time, is in fact addressed to the Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book contemporary with the Prophet ﷺ. And then we also said, the next ayah, فَمَنْ تَوَلَّ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ So whoever turns away after this, Indeed, they are sinners or iniquitous. So Imam al-Qurtubi and Imam al-Razi state uh, quite unequivocally then that the ayah here cannot only be addressed to the prophets, but to their umam, their people. Because a prophet would never turn away and become a fasiq should the Prophet ﷺ come during his time. It's impossible for a prophet to do that. Because the prophets have isma, they have a divine 
perfection or infallibility, divine with a lowercase d, divine meaning that, or divine meaning that the, the source of their isma is, the, is God, the deity. So they're free from, from, uh, um, from consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this must also refer to their followers turning away from the Prophet sallallahu and becoming iniquitous. So that's, we mentioned that last time. So that's called the Mithaq al nabiin There's another Mithaq we mentioned last time too, mentioned in Surah Al-A'raf, Surah number 7, verse 172, the primordial covenant, Mithaq al-Alast, right? This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took a covenant from all human beings before he created their, their physical bodies. The ulama say that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questioned our arwah, our souls. Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we all bore witness. Bala shahidna, yes, we bear witness. Okay, so that was just sort of review from last time. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Allah, did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send any prophet from the time of Adam onwards without making a pact or a covenant with him about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So this goes back to the previous ayah, Ali Imran, verse 81, Mithaq al nabiyin If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa were sent while that prophet was alive, then he would have to believe in him and help him. So he mentioned that. He had to make a, uh, he had to make a contract to that effect against his own people. Sutti and uh, Qatada said something similar about some other ayat which refer to the excellence of the Prophet Islam in more than one way. Imam, Imam al-Razi also mentions here that this covenant really uh, pertains to any Prophet who fulfills the criteria. For example, Yahya is a Nabi, he's a Prophet, uh, but when Isa السلام, who's a Rasul uh, appeared, uh, Yahya alayhi salam believed in Isa alayhi salam and helped the mission of Isa alayhi salam because Isa alayhi salam outranks Yahya alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam is from the greatest of the five prophets. He's a Rasul, which means that he's given a revelation and he's commanded to the people to take the revelation to the people while, while uh, Yahya alayhi salam is a Nabi. And of course, Allah says, Musaddiqan bi kalimatin min Allah, that, that Yahya alayhi salam will confirm the word of God, meaning Isa alayhi salam. Now Qadi Iyad here, he quotes another verse. This is Surah Al-Ahzab, verse 7, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النِّبِيِّينَ مِثَاقَهُمْ وَمِنْكَ وَمِنْ نُوحِ وَإِبْرَهِيمُ وَمُوسَ وَعِيسَ بِنِ مَرْيَمُ So here we have yet Another covenant, this is an additional covenant, taken from these five messengers. These messengers are called the Ulul Azam Min Al-Rusul. These are the five most exalted human beings to ever walk the planet Earth. Imam Al-Qurtubi says they are the great law-giving messengers, the Rusul of the Shara'i. Right? So you have the Mithaqu Alast, which is all of humanity, you can think of it as a huge sort of ring, and then within that ring, concentric circle, the mithaq of the Nabiyin, 124,000 prophets, although that number is disputed according to the hadith, and then at the center, the, the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with the Rusul, the Ulul Azm min al-Rusul, the five prophets. Now, Qadi Iyad here, the point of quoting this verse is to point out the order of the prophets mentioned. So just to read the verse again, And behold, or remember, we took a covenant from the prophets, uh, and from you, so the ka, the kaf al-khitab here, is a direct reference to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمِن نُوحِ وَإِبْرَهِيمِ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمِ Notice the other four prophets are in chronological order. The Prophet ﷺ is mentioned first. That's what he wants to point out here. So just some commentary on that. Qadi Iyad, he mentions that Umar ibn al-Khattab was lamenting the death of the Prophet ﷺ. He said, My father and mother be your ransom, O Messenger of God. 
it has come down that uh, that part of your excellence with Allah is that he sent you as the last of the prophets while mentioning you among the first of them. And then he quotes the ayah, when we made a pact with the prophets in, from you and from Noah, Nuh alayhi salam. My mother and father be your ransom, O Messenger of Allah. It has come down the part of your excellence with him is that the people of the fire will wish they had obeyed you uh, even while they are being punished in its depths. And then he quotes this verse from Surah Al-Ahzab, ayah number 66, Ya laytana ata'ana Allah wa ata'ana rasul Oh, would that we had obeyed Allah and his Messenger. And then Qadi Iyad, he quotes Qatada, a great exeget who studied under Ibn Abbas, that the Prophet ﷺ said, I was the first of the prophets to be created and the last of them to be sent. And Ibn Kathir and Imam al-Qurtubi, they mention this as well in their tafasir. And this is related to the idea that the ruh, the soul of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has temporal priority over the rest of creation. There's a hadith, it's a popular hadith. <clears throat> it's attributed to the Musannaf of Imam Abdul Razzaq al Sanani. Uh, Imam uh, Yusuf al Nabahani also quotes this hadith. It's a very famous hadith in his famous treatise called Fada'ilu Nabi wa Ummati, the merits of the Prophet and his Ummah. So the hadith says that a companion named Jabir ibn Abdullah came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah bi abi anta wa ummi. And this is how the Sahaba would address the Prophet ﷺ. O Messenger of God, they use a title. Allah uses his title in the Quran as we mentioned. Allah never calls him directly by his first name. Bi abi anta wa ummi. May my parents be ransomed for you. Akhbirni an awal shay'in khalaqahu Allah ta'ala qabla al ashya Inform me about the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created before he created anything. Ya Jabir, inna Allah ta'ala khalaqa qabla al-ashya nura nabiyika min nuri. O Jabir, indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high created before all things the light of your prophet from his light. This is the hadith. Now as it turns out, this hadith is actually not found in the Musannaf of Abdul Razak al Sanani. No one could trace it back to anything that's authentically written by him. Most of the ulama today say that this hadith is maldu'ar, it's fabricated. However, however, many, many ulama, many ulama, great ulama, whether they're scholars of ulum al Quran or their fuqaha or their muhaddithin, many ulama say that the meaning of this hadith is sound. It's still a sound meaning. This particular hadith, however, is fabricated. So it's ja'iz, it's permissible to believe in the meaning of this hadith. That the Prophet وسلم, the light of the Prophet, is the initial creation. It does not make or break your iman. If somebody tells you, you have to believe this, if you don't believe this, this is kufr, say, no, it is not kufr, it's ja'iz. It's, it's non-essential, right? Um, it doesn't make or break your iman. Any questions about that? There are some groups, sometimes they fight over this issue, unfortunately, and they make takfir because of this, this issue. What is the initial light of the Prophet What is the initial creation? There's a stronger hadith that says the pen, the first thing that Allah created, this is a sound hadith, the first thing that Allah created was the pen, the qalam. And Allah said, write, write what? Write, um, write history. Right, all of history, right, existence, right? Now some will try to harmonize these hadith and they'll say, well, what is the pen made out of? <laughs> uh, the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created in its final functioning form is the pen. But what is the constituents of the pen? What is the pen made out of? Light, light of the Prophet sallallahu This is how they try to, some of them, they want to harmonize these hadith or these beliefs. Right? Is there, I saw a hand up here. Yes, sir. No, I mean, 
you're, you're not taking the belief from this hadith. Um, the hadith is fabricated, but so many of the ulama agree in the meaning with the meaning of the hadith. Let's say there's a hadith that says um, that that um, Allah subhanahu wa taala um, created the heavens and the earth in six days. That's a true statement. But let's say you, you try to find this hadith somewhere, you don't find it, or you find that the, the sanad is completely fabricated. So it's a fabricated hadith, but the meaning is sound. So there's other traditions, right? It's not just this one hadith that people are drawing this belief from. There's, there's many, many traditions that, that corroborate this belief. Uh, and, and the fact that many, many great ulama consider this belief jaiz is something to consider. Okay. Any questions over here? And then you know, there's uh, uh, there's Quranic uh, ayat. Remember, we said Allah nur samawati wal ard, mathalu nurihi. This is an ayah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa taala is the light of the heavens and the earth. Imam Suyuti says the meaning of this is Allah is the source of all light. Mathalu nurihi, the similitude of His light that He owns. This is a different light than the first light. According to many, many commentators, this is a light that he created. And the dominant opinion here is that this second light mentioned here is the Prophet. There's many ayat like this. There has come unto you from Allah a light. And they say, well, that's the Quran. No, kitab is the light. Kitab is, is the Quran. What is the, the nur? And many exegetes say that is the Prophet So this hadith could have been fabricated based on this pre-existing belief that the Prophet is light and that he is the first creation. So somebody wrote this hadith. This is one opinion that it's Maldur. Sometimes you get difference of opinion, but this seems to be the dominant opinion. It's called the priority of the Muhammadan light. All right. Moving on then. <clears throat> okay. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so Qadi Iyad now is quoting another ayah. This is 252 of Al-Baqarah. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, we preferred some of the messengers over others. Allah spoke directly to some of them, and he raised some of them in rank. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has his prophets at different degrees, at different ranks. We don't give them their ranks. That's what Allah has given them. Some people like to quote the ayah because we say the Prophet Sallallahu is khayr al khalqillah. He's the best of creation. And then sometimes we get the response. But Allah says, la nufarriqu bayna ahadim rusuli. Don't make distinctions between prophets. Yes, that's true. I'm not making a distinction between any prophets. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says in the Quran, in another ayah, it's important that we read the entire Quran, right? In another ayah, he says that he has his prophets at different darajat, different degrees. So this is an absolutely essential belief. This belief is essential. That the Prophet Sallallahu is Sayyidu Waladi Adam. He's the master of the children of Adam. This hadith is in Tirmidhi. It's a strong hadith that he's the beloved of God, Habibullah. It's also in, in Tirmidhi. There might be a slight weakness in this, but this belief is is, is uh, something that is found um, uh, uh, in many, many uh, uh, scholarly works of, of scholars of hadith and Quran. Imam al-Tahawi, uh, his creed, which is an early creed, which is considered to be an athari creed. In other words, he's, he puts a lot of weight on sound transmissions, Quran and, and strong hadith, also in the ijma' of the salaf. It's a less speculative uh, uh, creed, aqidah. Uh, it's more ecumenical. It's, it's safer, if you will. And this is how he describes the Prophet He says, Abduhul Mustafa, his chosen servant. 
when Nabiyuhul Mujtaba is elected Prophet, or Rasuluhul Murtada, his messenger in whom he is well pleased, Khatimul Anbiya, the seal of the Prophets, wa Imamul Atqiya, the leader of the righteous, wa Sayyidul Mursaleen, the master of the messengers of God, wa Habibu Rabbil Alameen and the beloved of the Lord of the world. So this is absolutely essential. To say, for example, that, that Musa salam, or Isa salam, have the same rank with the Prophet salam, this is highly problematic. The Prophet salam, is the best of creation. These other prophets are obviously great. But the Prophet's maqam as the uh, shafi'r, the one who intercedes and the one whose intercession is accepted. He has maqam of Mahmud, he has the station of the Habib. This is without question. Okay. Here, Qadi Iyad, he quotes the Samarqandi. Related that Al-Kalbi said that the words of Allah, uh, There's a verse in Surah Safat, verse 83, that says, And from his party, or from his Shia, here Shia, it can mean party or faction, but here it means something more like adherents or followers. And from his followers was Ibrahim. <clears throat> now the question is, who does the pronoun uh, he referred to and from the followers of him was Ibrahim some of the commentators say Nuh salam, that from the followers of Nuh salam, is Ibrahim but others said and this is mentioned by Imam al-Tabari Imam al-Razi that the pronoun refers to the Prophet salam, that Ibrahim salam, is a follower of the Prophet salam, in the sense that the Prophet ﷺ has precedence over him because the Prophet is Imam al Mursaleen. It just so happens that Ibrahim ﷺ was sent before him in temporality, but in reality, the maqam of the Prophet ﷺ is the highest maqam of all the Prophets. <clears throat> Section 8 here. Concerning Allah instructing his creation <coughs> to say the prayer on the Prophet Nabi. is protecting him and removing the punishment because of him. Qadi Iyad, he quotes this ayah from Surah Al-Anfal, ayah number 33, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah would never punish them while you are among them. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah would never punish them while you are among them. And then he says here, meaning, as long as you are in Mecca. When the Prophet left Mecca and some of the believers were still there, so Imam Tabari and Qurtubi mentioned that some of the Mu'minun, some of the Sahaba, they were convinced by their families not to make hijrah with the Prophet Wasallam. So some of them remained in Mecca. It was difficult for them to leave Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah would never punish them while you are among them. So the Prophet leaves. There's still some believers in Mecca. So then the very next statement, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ مُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَهُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish them as long as they're asking for forgiveness. Right? Such is the station of istighfar. Istighfar is the sort of deputy of the Prophet if you will, when he steps away. If the Prophet isn't amongst you, then you better make a lot of toba, <laughs> and then the punishment, won't, the adab will not come. This is how to interpret the ayah according to these great mufassirin of the Quran. Is that why you have this statement here, Allah will not punish them while you are among them, and then Allah will not punish them as long as they're making istighfar. Tuba liman wajda fi sahifatihi yom al-qiyamati istighfaran kathira. The Prophet said, 
أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام glad tidings to the one who finds in his sahifa, like his scroll, on the Yom Al-Qiyamah, a lot of istighfar. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I ask my Lord 70 times a day. And 70 is a, is a sort of figure of speech in Semitic languages. That means a, a lot, not just 70. You count, you know, you, some people count to 70, that's fine. But it means a lot. Now why is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is ma'asum, making istighfar? He can't, he can't deliberately disobey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would make his istighfar after the prayer, right? So one of the reasons, the reason why he's making istighfar is because that he failed to praise Allah as Allah praises himself. And he was overheard saying this in sajda by Aisha. Subhanaka la usni alayk anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. That glory be to you, how can I praise you as you have praised yourself? This is why he's making istighfar. Why do we make istighfar? For different reasons. <laughs> For that reason also. But many, many other different reasons. So this is the reason why he's been also to teach us. The Prophet is a mu'allim. So he's teaching us how what is proper adab, what is good ubudiyya. Ubudiyya means like, like slavehood, but it really has to do with like character, adab with Allah. Good adab with Allah. So he says, <clears throat> and then he quotes this verse. He, he moves around here. He goes to Surah 48, Al-Fatr, verse 25. And this verse needs some uh, context, but he quotes it here. Had they been clearly distinguished, then we would have punished the unbelievers among them with a painful punishment. He says in the same ayah, if it had, uh, if it had not been for certain men and women believers, whom you did not know. So the context of this verse, verse 25 of Surah Fatr, verse 48, according to Qurtubi and Tabari and Al-Wahidi, is that when the Prophet ﷺ was at Hudaybiyah with the Sahaba, 30 of the Mushrikeen attempted to surprise attack them and kill them. And they were caught by the Prophet ﷺ, but he released them. <coughs> So this was obviously reason enough for the Muslims to attack the city militarily. Apparently some of the Muslims wanted to attack. I mean, they tried to massacre the Muslims. But Allah says here, if the Muslims from Medina had retaliated, then they would have accidentally killed some of the believers in Mecca, people they didn't even know were believers because they never met them. The Dawah continues in Mecca. While the Prophet is in Medina for years, people are still making shahada in Mecca because there's still Sahaba living in Mecca. Right? And many of them were hiding their faith because it was dangerous uh, to come out uh, and say, I'm Muslim in public. You could be tortured and killed and uh, uh, you know, um, cut off from your family and these types of things. So it was a bit dangerous. When the believers immigrated, it was revealed, وَمَا لَهُمْ يُعَذِّبُهُمُ اللَّهُ But what can you, but what do you have now that Allah should not punish you? So Qadi Iyad, he says here, these ayat pre present one of the clearest demonstrations of the Prophet's exalted position. The punishment was averted from the people of Mecca, firstly, because of his presence, and then because of the presence of Sahaba after him, making istighfar. When none of the Sahaba were left in Mecca, eventually they all made hijrah, Allah punished the Meccans by giving the believers power and victory over them. He made their swords rule over them, and the Muslims inherited their land, their homes, and their property. So this is a reference now to the bloodless uh, conquest of Mecca in 8 Hijri. <clears throat> and he says here, Allah punished them. But the Prophet wasallam, and it's true, is a form of punishment, but, but the Prophet Sallallahu really honored the Meccans, even while taking their city. I mean, he's well within his rights to just take everyone out, all the men. And that's an accepted war practice. No one would have faulted him for that. You know, when he was coming into the city, a companion named Sa'd ibn Ubadah, who had a lot of zeal, he's holding the standard of the Muslims. 
and he was shouting at the Meccans, Al Yoma Yomul Malhama, Adallahu Quraishan. Today is the day of slaughter, the debasement of the Quraysh. Right? And he was shouting this over and over again. <clears throat> Abu Sufyan had already converted, but this was his people. He was a leader of the Meccans. So he was he was afraid what's going to happen here. Here comes this, you know, these Muslims coming into the city. Uh, so the Prophet ﷺ heard that this is what Sa'ad was saying. Somebody told him, relayed the message to him. And he said, go tell him not to say that and take the standard from him. So that everyone knows that I don't agree with this statement. So they go to Sa'ad and they say, give us a standard. He said, why? He said, this is, the Prophet is saying, he said, I don't believe you. What do you mean give, give up the standard? So they went back to the Prophet ﷺ. He said, he's not giving it up. And the Prophet took his blessed imama off. He said, present this to Sa'ad and take the standard from him. But give the standard to his son, Qais. This is for the wisdom of the Prophet Because he knew it would be hurtful, right, to be you know, disciplined in a sense by the Prophet But by giving the standard to his Sa'ad's son, he's still honoring Sa'ad. It's still his son. So then the Prophet وسلم, he passes by Abu Sufyan and he says, al yawma yawmul marhama." Uh, today is a day, just slightly altered the statement of Sa'ad. Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the Quraysh. The exaltation of the Quraysh. Man dakhala beta Abi Sufyan faqad amin. And he said his name. He said, whoever enters into the house or under the protection of Abu Sufyan, that person is safe. This was their recognized leader. Right? Notice he didn't say whoever enters into my house or the house of Omar or Abu Bakr or some no your leader is Abu Sufyan if he gives you protection you're 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 fine this is how you know he says here that Allah punished the Meccans it is a form of punishment because the Prophet is now taking the city but in reality right it's a sign of of, of Izza for the Quraysh <clears throat> any questions on that <clears throat> Some of these uh, Christian polemicists, they write things like that they say that they insult the Prophet or they critique him and say that because the Prophet engaged in military actions, he can't be a true prophet, which is completely ridiculous. Because according to their own book, in Exodus 33, when, according to their book, when Musa descended the mountain and he saw people worshiping the calf, he ordered the, the Levites to slaughter 3,000 men in one day. He actually says, go kill your neighbor, your brother, your family member. If you look at all of the Ghazawat of the Prophet ﷺ, all of his military expeditions, there were 1,018 deaths, according to Abu Hassan al nadawi In 23 years, 700 mushrikeen and about 400 sahaba. And these are all on the battlefield. These are all warriors on the battlefield. There are no innocent civilians being targeted here. Right? 1,018 in 23 years. And most of the time when the Prophet ﷺ would go out for a military expedition, the enemy would see him and run away because Allah would put terror into their hearts. Ru'ab right? fi him. 1,018, 3,000 men are killed by Musa Islam in the Torah, according to the Torah, 3,000 men fell in one day, but he's a true prophet. But the Prophet is, is, not, is not a prophet because he engaged in military. <laughs> it's total hypocrisy. It's a double standard. Or you say he, he had uh, he, polygamous relationships. He had more than one wife. Okay. Bani Israel. Who is Israel? Yaqub. He has 12 sons from four different women. Two of them were concubines. Are those legitimate children? Isa is a descendant of one of these women. Is he legitimate? They're God. Isa a.s. Total double standard. It's quite ridiculous. Yes. One person, no, no, Ubay bin Khalaf. Ubay bin Khalaf, when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca, he passed by Ubay bin Khalaf, <clears throat> and he was like brushing his horse. And so he looked at the Prophet and he said, you know why I'm doing this for my horse? Why? And he said, I'm going to use this horse one day and kill you while I'm riding it. And the Prophet said, perhaps I'll kill you. 
This was Yusuf. At Ghazwat Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ was struck on the side of his face by a man named Abdullah ibn Qami'a, a mushrik. He struck him on the side of the face, and, uh, and some of the chain mail had penetrated into the cheek, right? So he pulled it out, and there was blood flowing down his face. And then he noticed that uh, Ubay bin Khalaf is charging towards him. So the, the Sira says the Prophet grabbed a, spe a spear and like shook off like 10 men off of him. Right? He said he shook them off like they were flies. And then he barely tapped him on the neck right here. He's like a, like a tap. Right? Because the point isn't to, the intention is important. He just tapped him on the neck and then and then Ubay bin Khalaf, he went back to the, the, the Mushrikeen and he said, he's killed me, he's killed me, he's killed me. And they said, what's wrong? And he said, look, and he said, this is just a scratch. And he said, no, he's, he told me he was going to kill me. And then um, there's a report that says that he, he, got, he went insane and his, his horse jumped off the cliff. Another report that says it festered and it and, uh, you know, got infected and he died from that. But this was the only man, yeah. Ubay bin Khalaf. That guy was a big shaitan. Yeah. He's from the mustahzi'un. Remember we talked about the mustahzi'un? These are the worst type of kuffar who mock and ridicule the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Don't just disbelieve in him. They mock and ridicule him. Yeah. So they'll say something like, oh, this, he killed a man, therefore he can't. This isn't a battlefield. There's a prophet in the Old Testament. I mentioned this a lot. His name is Elisha. This is a prophet that Christians believe is a prophet, Elisha. Is he mentioned in the Quran? Probably not. Allahu alam. Maybe al yasa but I, I, don't, I don't know. But Elisha is a prophet in the Old Testament. This is what he did. He's walking down the street, and some, some kids begin following him. Small boys, it says. And they start making fun of his bald spot. This is a story in the Bible. They start making fun of his bald spot. Uh, and then this prophet gets so offended that he prays to the Lord. And these two bears come out of the wilderness and they rip apart 42 young boys. This person is a prophet, according to the Christians and Jews. But the Prophet says, Salam, on the field of battle, tapping a man on the neck and that man dying on the field of battle, defending his city, oh, he's not a prophet. Because he killed someone on, on the battlefield. <laughs> Double standard. Prophets have to defend their cities. Right. Anyway, these are things that they don't teach you in Sunday school. <laughs> Even in seminary, they don't teach you these things. I mean, I, I attended basically a Christian seminary. I have a master's in biblical studies, so I took all these classes in the Bible. They don't teach these things. You'll get some other stuff. These are things you have to get by personal study. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> Let's see what we're doing on time here. There was a question from last week, inshallah. I'll, I'll, um, I have to look at the source of it. It's about the ru'ya and a statement of our mother Aisha. I'll give the answer next week, inshallah. The ayah, he says here, Qadi Iyad, continuing, uh, is interpreted by Abu Musa, I'm, um, I'm guessing Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, said, Allah sent down on me two sureties for my ummah. Surety is like a guarantee. Two guarantees. What's the first guarantee? Allah would not punish the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he is among them. The second guarantee, Allah will not punish them as long as they're asking for forgiveness. And he says, this harks back to the words of Allah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Where is this again? Where is this verse? Oh, man. Good. al -Anbiya. Verse 107. 21-107. 21-107. Burn it into your brain. 21.107. The Prophet ﷺ said, I am a surety for my companions. This is a hadith in Muslim. Some say that this means against innovations like bid'ah. 
Other say it means against like disagreement and disorder. One of the men of knowledge say, this is what Qadir Yad is saying, one of the men of knowledge say, the messenger was the greatest surety while he was alive and he's present as long as his sunnah is present. When his sunnah dies out, then expect, then expect musiba and fitna, affliction and disorder. What is the sunnah? The authenticated normative ethos and practice of the Prophet the agreed upon prophetic precedent. Sunnah does not mean hadith. Sunnah is drawn from hadith, but there's different grades of hadith. The sunnah is the authenticated ethos of the Prophet So this is, according to Qadi Iyad, this is, seems to be his, the final thing he says on this ayah, that when it says, مَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah will not punish them as long as you are among them or in them, meaning the sunnah is within us. As long as the sunnah is within us, it is as if the Prophet ﷺ is among us. Right? We know this hadith. That's the first part of the hadith that we hear quoted all the time. Verily this religion began as something strange and it's going to become strange again. Fatuba lil ghuraba, glad tidings to the strangers. And then he describes the strangers. yuslihuna ma afsadan nasu min ba'di min sunnati. Who are the strangers? Those who set aright or correct what humanity corrupted after me from my sunnah. There are a lot of people today that are doing things and saying, I found this in hadith, this is Quran, this is sunnah, this is that sunnah. So, alaykum bis sunnati. This is a, this is a way of, of really, in Arabic, really emphasizing. Alaykum bis sunnati. I exhort you to follow my sunnah. Wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdiyin. And the rightly guided caliphs. The sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. And then, so who are the rightly guided caliphs? There are actually five of them. Imam Suyuti says five of them. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, Sayyidina Umar, Uthman Ali, and Imam Hassan was a caliph for six months, which makes 30 years, according to the hadith, before he abdicated to uh, Mu'awiyah. <clears throat> so follow the sunnah, my sunnah, and the sunnah of the rightly guided caliphs. And then he says, Tamassaku biha wa addu alayha bin nawajid. Very sort of dramatic. Like hold on to it with every ounce of your being and bite into it with your molar teeth. That's how hard you should hold on to the, to the sunnah. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi, let me, let me not find one of you reclining on his couch when a command I ordered or a prohibition from me comes to him and he says, La adri, I don't know. Ma wajadna fi kitab illahi ittaba'anahu. Ittaba'anahu. I don't know. Whatever we, whatever we find in the book of God, that's what we follow. I don't know about the sunnah. I don't know. I don't know. So let me not find one of you say that. So say, oh, what is the sunnah? Who knows who wrote the sunnah? Who knows? In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantees that the sunnah is going to be preserved. If we believe in the Quran. Because Allah says, follow the messenger. Why would Allah say that? Follow the messenger is a beautiful example if we can't get to the real sunnah. How do you know what sunnah is? This is my, my uncle says this, my cousin says that. Well, you have to sit with ulama and discover the true sunnah because it's something real. A lot of people claim to know sunnah, to have the sunnah, but it's important for us to be with the majority. Yadullahi fawqa, yadullahi ma'al jama'ah is the hadith. That the, and here, the ulama make ta'wil, and they say that yad, yadullah means the protection of God is with the majority. Right? Stick with the majority. <clears throat> All right. So then he quotes this ayah, this famous ayah, which you should also know. 
3356. Allah and his angels, uh, he says, pr pray blessing on the Prophet. O oh, believers, pray, pray blessing on him and pray for peace on him. So Qadi Iyati says here, the prayer of the angels and humanity is supplication, is a dua for the Prophet. We're supplicating for the Prophet Ultimately, the supplication is for our own benefit. Our dua does not benefit the Prophet It's for our own benefit, ultimately. And he says this explicitly in a hadith. Man salla alayya wahida, sallallahu alayhi ashara. Whoever sends benedictions of peace upon me, nabi. one time, Allah sends blessings of peace upon that person ten times. But then what does it mean? Inna Allah yusalli ala nabi. What does it mean that Allah prays upon the Prophet or eulogizes the Prophet or sends blessings of peace upon the Prophet? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving him additional mercy. So when we do it, it's supplication. That really benefits us. When Allah does it, it's additional mercy to the Prophet وسلم, which again benefits us because that, that affects the ummah, the state of the ummah. One of the commentators said that the interpretation of the letters, Kaf ha ya ain saad. This is the first ayah of Surah Maryam. This is from those huruful muqatta'at, uh, um, these disjointed letters that Nobody really knows what they mean. But, alas, many of the ulama have their opinions. Wallahu alam. So Qadi Iyati mentions, one of them said, Kaf refers to Allah being enough, kifaya, for the Prophet. And then he quotes the ayah, Alayhi sallahu bi kafin abda, is not Allah enough for his slave? The ha refers to his guidance, hidayah. As in the words, Yahdika, uh, Yahdika Allah, Yahdika Sirata Mustaqima. Yahdika, yeah, it's uh, Surah Fat, verse number two. He will guide you to a straight path. Uh -huh. The Ya refers to support. Wa ayyadakum bi nasrihi. Ayyada. The ya here is a, a sort of prominent letter. He will support you with help. The ain refers to isma. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah will protect you from people. And the sa'd refers to salah. Inna Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi. So kafa ya ain sa'd. Allahu alam. Allah says if you support one another against him, Allah is his mawla. And Jibril and the right acting believers. Mawla here means protector. The right acting believers, Salih al Mu'minin, are said to be the prophets. It is also said that it should be taken literally as meaning all the believers. Any questions about that's the end of section eight? Section nine. Qadi Iyad, he quotes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Fatih. This is Surah 48. So I'll just quote some of it here. Allah says, we have given you a clear victory. Fatih Mubina. That Allah may forgive you your former and latter wrong actions and complete his blessing upon you and guide you to the straight path. And that Allah might help you with a mighty victory. It is he who sent down the Sakina into the hearts of the believers, that they might add belief to their belief. To Allah belong the legions of the heavens and the earth. Allah is knowing and wise. And that he might admit the believing men and women into gardens underneath which rivers flow, remaining there forever, and acquit them of their evil deeds. That is a mighty victory with Allah. And that he might punish the men and women hypocrites, the men and women idolaters, and those who think badly of Allah, an evil turn of fortune against them. 
Allah is angry with them and has cursed them and prepared Jahannam for them and evil return. To Allah belong the legions of the heavens and the earth. Allah is mighty wise. Indeed, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of glad news and a warner, so that you, the people, will believe in Allah and his messenger and help him and respect him and glorify his praise morning and evening. Those who pledge allegiance to you actually pledge allegiance to Allah. Yadullahi fawqa aidihim. Allah's hand is over their hands. So <clears throat> he has a long commentary here, commentary here. But he says here, when Allah says, وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتُهُ عَلَيْكَ And complete his blessing upon you. It is said that this is by abasing those who show arrogance towards the Prophet wasallam, And it is said that he means the conquest of Mecca and Ta'if. It is said that he means by elevating your renown in this world, helping you and forgiving you. Allah is telling him that the completion of his blessing upon him lies in the abasement of his haughty enemies, opening up the most important and best beloved of towns, elevating his renown and guiding him to the straight path, which leads to the garden. And then he says, Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadiran. So these are again, ism nakira. These are all indefinite nouns. I talked about the sort of rhetorical import of that uh, first week. Indeed, we have sent you as a witness, a bearer of, of good news, and as a warner. He says, Allah enumerates some of the Prophet's good qualities and special characteristics. And then he says, help him and respect him. It is said that they, it is said that they will go to great lengths to esteem him. The most common and clear statement about this is that it refers to the Prophet They help and respect the Prophet. And then right after that it says, And they glorify his praise morning and evening, referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Atta, he said, this surah contains various blessings for the Prophet. The clear victory, which is a sign of being answered. Forgiveness, which is a sign of love. Completed blessing, which is a sign of election. And guidance, which is a sign of wilaya, of friendship. Forgiveness, consistent being freed from faults. The completed blessing is to attain to the degree of perfection. Guidance is a summons to witnessing. Ja'far ibn Muhammad said, part of his completed blessing to him is that he made him his beloved. So there's a verse in the Quran, Ayatul Imtihan, Qul in kuntum Allah, fattabi'uni, yuhbibkum Allah, wa yaghfir lakum dhunubakum. Say, if you really love Allah, follow me. Then Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. So the ulama say, by following, if by following the Prophet Sallallahu anyone can become beloved of Allah, then how much does Allah love the Prophet Sallallahu If anyone can be beloved, by just following the Prophet, how much does Allah love the Prophet? <clears throat> and he says, swore by his life, remember, la amruka, abrogated other sharia by him, raised him to the highest place, protected him in the mi'raj, so that his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside, ma al basaru wa ma sent him to all mankind, made uh, uh, war booty lawful for his community, he also made him an accepted intercessor and master of the descendants of Adam. He coupled this, he coupled his name with his name and his pleasure with his pleasure. He made him one of the two pillars of Tawheed. This is all the commentary of Ja'far ibn Muhammad, Ja'far al-Sadiq of Surah al-Fatih. Allah then says, those who pledge allegiance to you, those who make bay'ah to you, actually pledge allegiance to Allah. The tafsir says, this is a reference to what's known as the Bay'atul Ridwan at Hudaybiyah. They pledge allegiance to Allah when they pledge allegiance to you. So at Hudaybiyah, the Prophet ﷺ, he sent Sayyidina Uthman to negotiate with the Meccans. Then he received a false report that Uthman had been killed. So he sat under a tree and took pledges of allegiance from the companions. Ibn Kathir and Qurtubi say the pledge was that they would fight with the Prophet until death. We'll end here, inshallah.
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله we are so we are in the middle of Part 1, Chapter 1, Section 9, for those following in the translation. Just to back up a little bit, a little bit of review here, just to give you some context. Qadi Iyad rahimahullah ta'ala, he quoted from the first 10 verses of Surah number 48, Al-Fatih. And he's commenting upon the descriptions of the Prophet sallallahu in these ten ayat, and he's quoting from the ulama as well, obviously. So just to repeat here what we said last week, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, he said, part of his completed blessing, so this is a reference to the ayah, وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتُهُ عَلَيْكَ and he, and he uh, completed his blessing upon you. Part of his completed blessing to him is that he made him, that Allah made the Prophet his uh, Habib, Beloved, we quoted the ayah, Ayatul Imtihan, last time, verse 31 of Ali Imran. Swore by his life, La Amruka, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes an oath by the life of the Prophet وسلم, in the Quran. Abrogated other sharias by him. So the sharia of the Prophet وسلم, is the final sacred law and it abrogates everything that came before it. It confirms the major components and aspects of it, obviously. <clears throat> but is good for all time until the end of time. Raised him to the highest place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعْنَا لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ We raised your remembrance. Also raised him physically in the Laylatul uh, Isra wal Mi'raj. Protected him in the Mi'raj so that his eye did not swerve nor sweep aside. مَا زَغَ الْبَصُرُ وَمَا تَغَى As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Al-Najm, <clears throat> many of the ulama say this is when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experienced the ru'ya, the beatific vision, when he, when he gazed upon the countenance of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. And there's some difference of opinion about that. Um, sent him to all mankind, he's going to quote these ayat later, and made booty lawful, here booty means ghanima, war booty, for his community. He also made him an accepted intercessor, um, Shafi'ah, Shafi'ullah, uh, and the master of the descendants of Adam, which is a reference to the hadith in Tirmidhi, Ana Sayyid Walidi Adam, Wala Fakhr, that we quoted earlier, that he quoted earlier. He coupled his name with his own name, here in, like in the Adhan, in the Iqama, in the Shahada, and his pleasure with his pleasure seems to be a reference to the verse in the Qur'an, وَاللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُرْضُوهُ Allah and His Messenger, it is more befitting that you please them. Meaning, pleasing, uh, pleasing the Prophet Wasallam is the same as pleasing Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Their pleasure is the same. He made him one of the two pillars of Tawheed. Again, a reference to the Shahada. When we say the Shahada, La ilaha illallah. So, La ilaha, that's, that's atheism. There is no God. Illallah. This is now um, uh, theism, belief in God, or could be even construed as a type of deism, that there is a God, he's a creator, but he's not necessarily a personal God. So, this is more of sort of an Aristotelian, Platonic God. But then, Muhammad Rasulullah, this is theism. This is now God. This God is now personal. Uh, by sending uh, by um, uh, by by sending human messengers to mankind for their guidance and revealing scriptures. 
Allah then continues, those who pledge allegiance to you, make bay'ah to you, actually pledge allegiance to Allah. Meaning in the pledge of Ridwan. So we mentioned this, bay'atul Ridwan, right? At Hudaybiyah. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent um, uh, Uthman to negotiate with the Meccans. Then a false report had reached him that Uthman had been murdered by the Mushrikeen. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sat under a tree and took pledges of allegiance uh, from the companions. And this is where we left off last time, that Ibn Kathir and Imam al-Qurtubi, they say that the pledge was that they would fight with the Prophet ﷺ until death. They were willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the deen. And here Ibn Ajiba says, the next statement in the Qur'an contains the greatest praise of the Prophet ﷺ in the entire Qur'an. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yadullahi, Yadullahi fawqa aidihim. That the Yad, which is sometimes translated as hand, the hand of God is over their hands. They pledge allegiance to Allah when they pledge allegiance to you, to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Qadi Ihad, he says here, this metaphorically refers to the power of Allah. So this is known as one of the ayat mutashabihat. There's certain verses in the Quran that are anthropomorphic, right? Um, these ayat must be anchored theologically in transcendence, in tanzih, in order for us to understand them properly. And the theological anchor of the Quran is Surah 42, verse 11. This is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ there is nothing like the likes of God while he is all hearing and all seeing. There's nothing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. So the yad of Allah has nothing to do whatsoever with a created or human hand. Right? It has nothing to do whatsoever. Laysa kamithlihi shay'un. There's nothing like him whatsoever. That whatever the human imagination can possibly imagine, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely different than that. So the practice of the early Muslims called the Salaf, like the Sahaba and the few generations after them, is to just consign the meaning of these ayat mutashabihat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they wouldn't... Uh, uh, they wouldn't um, uh, interpret these ayat. They would simply consign the meaning to Allah. They would say that this means whatever is whatever Allah intends it to mean, whatever is appropriate to His greatness and majesty. There's nothing like Allah whatsoever. They wouldn't attempt to interpret the ayat. Later scholars from the Khalaf, the later generations, they would actually interpret these ayat because now there's a need, because now you have deviant groups taking these ayat and teaching uh, deviant theology, saying things like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a physical hand, he has physical fingers, he's located in a physical space, things like this. So this provoked the ulama of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah to begin to interpret these ayat. So they would make ta'wil. Is tafweed. Tafweed means that they would consign the meanings to God. Tafweed with a dad. And then ta'wil. Ta'wil means that they would interpret the ayat, but still in the light of God's transcendence. Right? So they would say that, um, that the first is kind of a three-step process. The first step is to, to detach any type of, any, any notion of physicality. To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then they'd interpret it and say, Yadullah means the power or protection of God. Uh, and then they'd affirm transcendence and affirm that Allah knows, that Allah only knows. Right? So this is what he's doing here. This metaphorically refers to the power of Allah, Yadullah, or the protection of God. There's a hadith that says, Yadullahi, uh, yadullahi ma'al jama'ah, or ala al jama'ah in another riwayah. That the yad of Allah is with the majority. So the ulama say the meaning of this, those who make ta'wil of the hadith, the meaning of this is that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protection, 
is with the majority. So he says, this metaphorically refers to the power of Allah, his reward, his favor, or his contract, and strengthens the act of their pledging allegiance to him and exalts the one to whom the allegiance is given. Okay. These words of Allah are similar to, and then he quotes here from Surah Al-Anfal, you did not kill them, and this is in the plural, this is a reference to the Battle of Badr. So it's addressed to the, the Sahaba, um, as to what they did on the battlefield. You did not kill them, but Allah killed them. And now, the next sentence is in the singular, addressed specifically to the Prophet Wasallam. You did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw. So this was a reference to an incident at the Battle of Badr with the Prophet Wasallam. Uh, he picked up some, some pebbles and he just sort of threw them in the direction of the mushrikeen. Um, so Allah says, you did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw. All of the actions of the Prophet ﷺ have tawfiq. They're all according to the ridwan, the good pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of his actions are guided. He's in a state of union with Allah's ridwan. Um, Ibn Arabi points out something interesting here. He says that in this statement, there's an explicit negation followed by an explicit affirmation. You did not throw when you threw, right? Well, So he says that this demonstrates both Allah's transcendence as well as his nearness to the Prophet Wasallam. That the Prophet Wasallam, or anything in creation for that matter, is not Allah. Yet the Prophet's action was in reality Allah's action. Allah is a doer of every action. How Allah willed that action, he created that action, and he was pleased with that action. So the Prophet ﷺ is a means by which Allah carries out his well-pleasing will uh, in the world. So these are, these are very, very exalted ayat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is is <clears throat> pronouncing here with respect to the Prophet وسلم, demonstrating a very close, exalted state of union that he has with the Prophet وسلم. not union on the level of essence or ontology, right? Um, that's the Christian position with regards to Isa وسلم. and this is a, a, a problematic, dangerous position to have. It's not according to our sound aqidah. Okay, so then he says, however, whereas the former is metaphorical, so he's talking about here, yadullahi foka aidihim, that's metaphorical, it's, he says majaz, figurative, the latter is literal, you did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw, it's literal truth, since the, in the latter case, the killer and the thrower was in reality Allah, he was the creator of the prophet's action, his throwing, his power to do it, and his decision to do it, no man has the power to throw. And then here he mentions something that uh, Imam Razi also mentions. That the, the Prophet Sallallahu he took the pebbles and he just kind of lobbed them in the direction of the mushrikeen. The mushrikeen are very far off. But somehow, miraculously, uh, dust, a dust particle was able to infiltrate the eyes of every single one of the mushrikeen. Uh, so Imam Razi mentions that this was, in reality, a rare occurrence of natural law. Right? So, um, it's not natural for a human being to be able to do that. Allah through. Section, okay, that's the end of the section nine. This is the last section of chapter one, part one. How Allah in his mighty book demonstrates the honor in which he holds him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and his position with him uh, and other things which Allah gave him. So he says, some of this is contained in what Allah says about the night journey in the surah of the same name, and surah entitled the star, and najm, which refer directly to his incomparable station and nearness to Allah uh, and the wonders he witnessed. A further demonstration is the fact that uh, he is protected, the Prophet ﷺ, is protected from people. So 
So here he quotes Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 67, Wallahu ya'si minan nas. And Allah protects you from the people. So in fact, 12, 13 or so assassination attempts were made on the Prophet sallallahu Now when this ayah was revealed, according to the Mufassireen, the Prophet sallallahu was on a journey and he came out of his tent and he dismissed all of his guards Allah told him, Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas. Allah protects you from the people. When those who were reject, uh, when, uh, and also he quotes, when those who reject were plotting against you to confine you or kill you or expel you and were plotting and Allah was plotting. Right? So the sort of last straw or the last stand, I guess you could say, for the mushrikeen in Mecca. They met at the Darul Nidwa, which is like their city council. This is after the death of Abu Talib, whose seat is now vacant. Some of the books of the Sirah say that there was a man sitting in his seat who was dressed in black. He was sort of hooded. And uh, this man said, let's just kill him. Let's just kill the Prophet. Right? And then Abu Jahl said, that's a good idea. So he, he hired uh, one youth from every clan to stand by the stand outside the, the, the house of the Prophet Of course, the, the, uh, the ulama say that uh, the sheikh that was there dressed in black was a shaitan, an incarnation of the shaitan. Uh, so they stood by the house of the Prophet Wasallam in order to kill him. He's going to mention that in a minute here. So, and then he quotes this verse from Surah Tawbah, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصْرَهُ اللَّهُ If you do not help him, yet Allah has helped him. So he says, Allah averted the harm of his enemies from him when they conferred secretly about him and plotted to kill him. He took their side away when the Prophet went out past them. So the assassins, he's, he was referring to the story mentioned in the Sirah that the assassins were outside of his door. Sayyidina Ali was in the house and the Prophet ﷺ told him to lie down in his bed. And the Prophet simply opened the door and walked right past the assassins. He was reciting Yasin at the time. فَأَغَشَيْنَاهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ That uh, we, we veiled them so that they do not see. <clears throat> and then he caused them not to look at him in the cave. So this is mentioned in our tradition that the Prophet ﷺ was in the cave during the hijrah with Abu Bakr Siddiq. Um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا So Abu Bakr Siddiq, um, he had some uh, fear and trepidation, not for himself, but for his sahib, for the Prophet Wasallam, his companion. So there was a man standing right at the entrance of the cave, and they can see him. And Abu Bakr said, if this man would just look at his feet, he'll see us. So the Prophet وسلم, he said, La tahzan. He said, Don't be afraid. In Allah ma'ana, Allah is with us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator of all actions. He's the willer of all actions. Allah did not will this man to simply move his eyeballs down and look at them. Allah is in control of everything. And then uh, the ayah continues. This is Surah Toba, verse 40. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down his sakina, his peace, his tranquility upon him. Imam al-Razi suggests that the pronoun here, alayhi, is a reference to Abu Bakr. That tranquility was sent down upon Abu Bakr. But then the next statement, وَأَيَّدُهُ بِجُنُودٍ And he helped him now the pronoun is the Prophet Wasallam. He helped him with junood, hosts or armies, uh, supporters that you did not see. Or they say both of the pronouns refer to the Prophet Wasallam. Then Allah Subhanahu is mentioned in the in the seerah as well that a spider had spun its web at the mouth of the cave. There was a dove building its nest. That these are the part of the junood. These are the soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting his habib. Something as flimsy as a spider's web. Right? It's protecting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Demonstrating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these things are easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. 
And then he says, the signs connected with that, the Sakina tranquility, which was sent down on him and the story of Suraqa bin Malik, are all mentioned by the people of Hadith and Sirah in connection with the story of the cave and the hijrah of the Prophet وسلم, to Medina to Manawara. So Suraqa bin Malik, he mentions a very famous story when the Prophet وسلم, was uh, leaving uh, Mecca with Abu Bakr Siddiq. The, the Meccans, they put a bounty on him, 100 nuk, 100 she camels, dead or alive. So this man, Suraqa bin Malik, who is a, a, a master tracker, uh, he was able to find them very quickly in the desert, just following the tracks. And he said, I looked and I saw one of them. He was sitting on his conveyance and his hands were up like this and he was saying something to the heavens. And then the other one was doing circles around him and he kept looking back at me. So uh, he said, I charged and suddenly I fell from my horse and I've never fallen. So he gets back on and he charges again. He falls a second time. He falls a third time and now he's within earshot of the two men. So then uh, the Prophet وسلم, engages him in a conversation. He says, why have you come? And he says, I've come for a hundred camels. Can you give me something better? And the Prophet said, yes, I can give you something better. And he says, Kefa either." How will it be for you when you wear the bangles, the bracelets of Kisra? And of course, Surah bin Malik is just, just a simple man. He said, who is Kisra? And he said, Kisra is Malik al-Faris. He's the king of Persia. And he said, the king of Persia? So he knew the Prophet wasallam is a sadiq al-Amin. He's not going to lie. There's no, this is out of the question that he would lie. So he said, can you write it down for me? So he said to Abu Bakr, write this down. So he took a little sahifa and they wrote down that on such and such a day, the Prophet ﷺ promised the Suraqa of the son of Malik that he's going to wear the bracelets, the siwar of, Kis siwar of Kisra. And as the story goes, uh, he goes back to Mecca and the Meccans probably made fun of him, right? Uh, but then years later, the Prophet ﷺ passes. Abu Bakr Siddiq is the caliph. He passes. Sayyidina Umar is now the caliph. And the Muslims, they conquer Persia, the Battle of Qadisiya, um, under uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And the Ghanima of Persia is in the Masjid in Medina. The treasures of, <laughs> of Persia and the bangles of Kisra <laughs> are there. And by this time, Suraqa bin Malik has converted to Islam. And he's a, he's a companion. And he's in, he's in Medina. So Sayyidina Umar, he has the Sahifa. And so he calls up Surah bin Malik to the front and he reads it off. And then he places the bangles on the arms of Surah bin Malik. And the crowd is shouting, Sadaqa Rasulullah, Sadaqa Rasulullah. Um, so this is what he's referring to here. Surah bin Malik, the famous story. <clears throat> Allah also says, we gave you kawthar, inna a'atayna kal kawthar. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice, the one who hates you, he's the one who's cut off. Surah Al-Kawthar, only three ayat. Allah told him about what he had given him. Kawthar is from kathara, it's an emphatic noun, fawal kawthar. It's the only occurrence of the word in the entire Quran. Um, so you have to go to the hadith to understand the word. Kawthar is said to refer to his basin, according to the uh, Mufassirin, the hawd of the Prophet وسلم, which most say is after the sirat, just outside uh, the Jannah. It is also said that it is a nahrun fil Jannah, that is a river actually in Jannah. Abundant, they also said it means different, because kawthar means just abundance, a lot of abundance, abundance and abundance. <laughs> kathir means a lot, but kawthar is emphatic, a lot of abundance. So it could also mean the shafa'a, the mu'ajizat, the nabuwa, the ma'rifa, different things. Then Allah replied to his enemies for him and refuted what they had said by the words, in nashani akahu al abtar. The one who hates you, he's cut off, meaning your enemy, and the one who despises you. Cut off means poor, abased, or left all alone, or one with no good in him at all, or even something like forgotten to history, or 
maligned throughout history. And of course, one of the meanings of Kothar also is uh, a reference to a Sayyidah Fatima Zahra. And this is mentioned, this is usually because um, she's sort of the fount of the Ahl al-Bayt. Right? Um, this is usually mentioned by Shiite uh, Mufassirin, like Imam Tabrisi mentions this, and many other Sh Shiite Mufassirin, but some Sunnis also mention it as well. And, and it works well with the, with the context, because the Asbab al-Nuzul of the Surah is that this mushrik named Al-As ibn Wa'il was making fun of the Prophet وسلم, because the Prophet's male children died in infancy. So he said, you're cut off, your, your progeny's done. No one's going to remember you after you die. <laughs> this is what he's telling the Prophet The man whose uh, whose whose name is the most popular name in the world, right? The man whose name is being extolled uh, twenty four seven every day until the Yom Al Qiyamah. Somebody is saying the Shahada right now. Somebody is pronouncing the Adhan, and they're using his actual name because people say, "Well, you can say the same thing about Isa Alayhi but there's some people saying Isa, there's some people saying Yeshua, there's some people saying Jesus, there's some people saying Jesus. They're using different names, but everyone is saying Muhammad. It's the same name. So then this person says, no one's going to remember you when you die, right? So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we've given you Kawthar. And so the ulama say, one of the meanings of Kawthar is Fatima Zahra. The Ahl al-Bayt comes from her, and this is from the Khasa'is. We mentioned this in the other class, I think, or maybe we mentioned it here, that from the khasas of the Prophet وسلم, from the special qualities of the Prophet وسلم, is that his Ahl al-Bayt comes from his daughter. Sayyidina Ali is not his son. Ahl al-Bayt starts with his daughter, and she, obviously she's married to Sayyidina Ali. Okay. And, you know, volumes have been written on just this Surah Kothar. Then Allah says, we have given you the seven Mathani. This is what he quotes next. This is from Surah Al-Hijr, Ayah 87. وَلَقَدْ أَتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِي وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ We have given you the seven Mathani. Mathani means something that's repeated. And the immense Quran. It is said that the Mathani are the first long surahs and that the immense Quran refers to the Ummul Quran, Ummul Quran meaning Al-Fatiha. So this is mentioned by Imam Al-Tabari, Imam Al-Zamakhshari, they mentioned that, that the Mathani, the seven Mathani refer to the first seven long surahs of the Quran. That's one opinion. It is also said that the seven Mathani are themselves the Ummul Quran, Al-Fatiha. And that the immense Quran means the rest of the Quran. And this is also mentioned by Imam al Tabari and Zamakhshari, Ibn Ajiba, Imam al Razi actually mentions a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which um, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam refers to Al Fatiha as a Sab'ul Mathani, the seven oft repeated. There's a hadith like this. I didn't write down the book of hadith, I forgot to do that. But it's a good hadith, a strong hadith. <clears throat> All right, and there's other opinions also. What are these seven min al mathani? It is said that the seven mathani refers to the awamir and the nawahin, the sort of commands and prohibitions uh, of the Quran, the good news and warnings, the metaphors and enumerations of blessings. Um, different opinions. It is said that the Umm al-Qur'an is called Mathani because it is said at least twice in every prayer. So Umm al-Qur'an, according to the Hadith, is another way of saying Al-Fatiha, the mother of the Qur'an, the essence of the Qur'an, the core of the Qur'an. It is said that the Umm al-Qur'an is called Mathani because it is said at least twice in every prayer. Right? So the, the minimal prayer is two rak'atin. So you're going to say the Fatiha twice. It is said that Allah set it aside for the Prophet and stored it up for him rather than other prophets. He called the Qur'an Mathani because the stories are repeated in it. It is said that the seven Mathani means we have honored you. So there's another opinion. We have, uh, we have honored you with seven marks of honor. The Prophet ﷺ has seven marks of honor that are mentioned in the Qur'an. Guidance, Huda, prophecy, Nabuwa, mercy, Rahmah, 
intercession, shafa'a, friendship, wilaya, and esteem, like izza or rifa'a, and tranquility, sakina, seven marks of honor. So there's different opinion. Uh, there's different opinions about what is this sabr uh, al But the strong opinion, because it's supported by hadith explicitly, is that as a reference to al-Fatiha. There's seven ayat in al-Fatiha. Allah says, we sent down the dhikr to you that you might make things clear. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ And we sent down a dhikr, the Qur'an, one of the names of the Qur'an, a dhikr, in order for you to explain to the people what has been sent down. So then the prophetic words, the sunnah, is absolutely imperative. The prophetic commentary of the Qur'an. And then he quotes here, that's from Surah Nahal, by the way, verse 44, famous verse 1644. Then he quotes here, 3428, Surah Saba, I believe it, verse 28. We only sent you, so, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا we only sent you to all people as a, br a bringer of good news, Bashir, and a Nadir, and as a warner. These are titles of the Prophet ﷺ that we've talked about in the past. And then he finally quotes this ayah, Surah Al-A'raf, verse 158. قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا O oh people, I am the messenger of Allah to you all. So he's saying here, why is he quoting these ayat? He says, this is one of the special favors he has granted, again, from the khasa'is of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah says, we only sent a messenger with the language of his people to make things clear. Illa bilisan qawmi. Allah specifies their peoples, but he sent the Prophet Sallallahu to all people. And he said of himself, the Prophet Sallallahu said, I was sent to all mankind. This is stated in numerous hadith the wording in Sahih Muslim, Ursiltu ila al-khalqi kafa. I was sent to the creation, everything, all of creation. So in other words, again, the sharia of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there's no, there's no more rusul, there's no more anbiya, there's no sacred law yet to be revealed. The Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ is the final sacred law revealed, right? So that's why he's the final messenger. That's why he's the universal messenger. And as we said, the Sharia of the Prophet ﷺ is a confirmation of the foundational principles of all of the Sharia before him. So Nuh ﷺ received the Sharia, and then um, uh, Musa alayhi salam, uh, sorry, Ibrahim alayhi salam, so Sharia 2.0, Musa alayhi salam, the Torah, Sharia 3.0, Isa alayhi salam, 4.0, and then finally 5.0, the Quran. And that's it. That's the, the latest. No more updates. <laughs> of course, there's Touch deed. There's, you know, there's ijtihad, right, with the ulama, the scholastic community. But those foundations never change. All right. <clears throat> and then he quotes here a beautiful ayah, Surah Al Ahzab, verse number six. He says, "An-Nabiyyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum." The Prophet is nearer or closer, awla, closer to the believers min anfusihim than their own selves. The Prophet is nearer and dearer to the believers than their own selves, and his wives are their mothers. The commentators say that nearer to the believers than their own selves means. Uh, that they must do whatever he commands, just as a slave must carry out his master's commands. It is said that it is better to follow his command than to follow one's own opinion. 
His wives are their mothers, means that they enjoy the same respect as mothers. They cannot be married to anyone after him. This is a mark of honor to him and a special favor, again from the Qasais of the Prophet ﷺ. It is also because they are his wives in the garden. He says here, an unusual reading of this ayah. So this is a shadh reading. It's an anomalous reading. It's unreliable. But he quotes it because it has the strength of a hadith, so it's true in its meaning. Uh, but it couldn't be uh, established through multiply attested measures. Um, that the ayah says, mm-hmm. The Prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves. He is their father. And his wives are their mothers. So it's true in meaning. He is preeminently our spiritual father. Um, Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran is called our father. Millata abikum Ibrahim. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is better than Ibrahim alayhi salam. So he's saying it's no longer recited because it's at variance with the version of Uthman, the Uthmani Codex. So it's, uh, it has the strength of a, a hadith. Allah says, Allah sent down on you the book and wisdom. This is Surah An-Nisa, verse 113. Kitab wal hikmah. You always see this coupling, this juxtaposition of al-kitab wal hikmah. Not always, but many times in the Quran. We sent down upon you al-kitab, the Quran, wal hikmah. And according to many ulama, hikmah in the Quran means sunnah. The Quran's preeminent ethical application. And notice that Allah says here, وَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ That Allah revealed that as well. He sent it down literally. أَنزَلَ means to send something down. That he, re- that he revealed not only the kitab, but the sunnah. The Prophet Wasallam's exemplary, authenticated sayings and doings are revelation. And in, also in this ayah, he says, وَكَانَ فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكَ عَظِيمًا uh, Allah's overflowing favor to you is immense. It is said that his immense favor refers to prophethood or what he already had in pre-eternality. al wasiti said that it indicates his ability to bear the vision, the ru'ya, which Musa alayhi salam uh, could not bear. Allahu alam. But going back to this, uh, I at the beginning here, thirty-three six, and Nabiu that the Prophet is more beloved to the believers than their own selves. So usually when this ayah is quoted, the ulama quote the famous hadith in Bukhari, uh, nafsi bi yadi, I swear by the one who has my soul in his yad, la yu'midu ahadukum hatta akuna ahabba ilayhi min walidihi wa waladihi wa nasi ajma'in. Uh, that uh, none of you have complete faith until I am more beloved to him uh, than his, his uh, parents, his children, and all of humanity. And there are numerous, uh, numerous hadith and statements from the Sahaba, stories of the Sahaba that demonstrate that the Sahaba truly um, uh, walk the walk as far as this ayah is concerned. Sayyidina Ali, he said, كَانَ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ وَمِنَ الْمَاءِ الْبَارِدِ عَلَى الضَّمَعِ That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more beloved to us than every shay. Shay means created thing. Sha'a means to, sha'a is to something that's willed into existence. Right, so this does not include the creator. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more beloved to us than anything in creation, even more so than cold water when we're thirsty. So the analogy here, the Arab, the desert Arab gets it, that, that cold water is, is life itself. Right? <clears throat> of course, the famous story in Kitab al-Maghazi, al-Waqidi mentions the, the martyrdom of Khubayb ibn Adi when he was taken to Tan'im by the Mushrikeen after the Battle of Badr. And uh, they, were, they basically were going to crucify him and then impale him. And there's other things that say they, they cut off his body parts and things like that. Uh, but they said to him, don't you wish you were at home with your family and, and, uh, and Muhammad was in your place? 
in Khubeli said, I don't wish that a thorn prick the finger of, of the Rasul. Right? And so he said, before you kill me, can I pray raka'atain? Can I pray, you know? And they said, yeah, you can pray. So they let him pray, and then they turned him from the Kaaba. Right? And then he quoted, fa'inama, uh, was the verse? Walillahi al-mashriqu wal-maghrib fa'inama tuwallu fathamma wajhullah inna Allah wasi'un alim. So he quoted the ayah um, that um, to Allah belongs the east and the west. Whichever way you turn, you'll, found, you'll find the countenance of God. Uh, and so, and so they they basically crucified him, and then they stabbed him, uh, and then he said that there's no one here to convey my salams to the Prophet ﷺ. Uh, so um, Al Waqidi says that the Prophet ﷺ was in Medina. He's sitting with some companions, Zaid ibn Haritha and others, and then suddenly it seemed like the Tanzil descended upon him, and he said, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullah ya Hubayb. And they said, what happened? And he said, our companion is being martyred right now in Mecca. And then Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, who was there, he wasn't Muslim at the time, obviously, he saw this entire thing happening and he said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا يُحِبُّ أَحَدًا كَحُبِّ أَسْحَابِ مُحَمَّدٍ مُحَمَّدًا He said, I've never seen anyone love anyone like the companions of Muhammad love Muhammad. <clears throat> There's many other things. Sahih Muslim mentions Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, a great lover of the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ came into Medina to Manawara, he stayed at the residence of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari for seven months. And Abu, Abu Ayyub had a two-story house, as it says in Sahih Muslim. And so the Prophet said, I'll take the ground floor because it's easier. People are going to visit me. I'm going to be leaving a lot. And he said, fine. So Abu Ayyub and his family were on the second story. And then, like, uh, a, f a few days later, or the, that night, or something like that, uh, Abu Ayyub, he's, he's quoted in the hadith, he said, he said to his family, Nam shi ra'si Rasulillah? Do you realize we're walking over the head of the Prophet uh, So, uh, the hadith says, Fabatu fi janibin. So they, they huddled into a corner uh, of the room upstairs like into one of the corners, because they knew that the Prophet's um, mat was in a certain place downstairs, so they made sure that they were on the other side, and then they would sort of shimmy against the walls. They didn't walk across the room, because they would consider it bad adab to walk over the head. So then Abu Ayyub, he came back down and he said, uh, we're walking over your head. And the Prophet said, that's okay, don't worry about it. This is easier for me to, to be here. And he said, no, I insist. <laughs> okay, so they switched places. So the Prophet said, and now was on the second floor. And then the hadith says that they would bring him food, and the Prophet said, would leave a little bit of food, and then Abu Ayyub and his wife would look at the dish and try to determine where the, the Prophet's hand had touched the plate. And they'd eat from that spot for tabarruk. Uh, and then one time there was, a, there was a, a plate that came back and it wasn't touched at all. Right? And so Abu Ayyub said, oh, what happened? You know, the, there's something wrong with the food? And then he said that there's garlic in this food. And I, I don't eat garlic because I have conversations with malaika. And whatever bothers uh, humanity bothers the malaika. Right? So then Abu Ayyub, he said, uh, I, I detest whatever you detest. So there's no more garlic in the house. So the ulama actually say, from based on this hadith, that that eating garlic is mubah, it's permissible, but it's makru if you're going to speak to dignitaries, to, to kibar, right, to like very prominent people. <clears throat> of course, there's a hadith, the famous hadith in Tirmidhi, uh, where Aisha says that, that she approached Fatima Zahra, and she said to her that, I noticed once that you were standing, like sort of standing over the Prophet ﷺ when he was in his final illness, and you leaned in close suddenly, and you started crying, and then you leaned in again and he started laughing. And she said, Aisha said, I've always wondered, what did he tell you? What did he, can you please tell me what did he tell you? Um, so Fatima says, أَخْبَرَنِي أَنَّهُ مَيِّتٌ مِنْ وَجِعِهِ he told me that he's going to die from his illness. So I cried. 
ثم أخبرني أني أسرع أهله لحوقا به فذاك حين ضحكت she says that then he told me that I would be the first of his family to join him in death and she died a few months later some six months later so I laughed right so she was a very young woman how old was she in her 20s maybe something like that very young but she's happy she's going to die because she's going to be with her father right? so this is a type of love that most people just they don't get it right they don't understand what's going on here And part of the problem is just this hub dunya, just entrenched in the dunya. You know, people think they're going to live forever. People, they put things off. People just want immediate gratification. And they, and they just, akhira, what is that? That's a long time from now, if it even happens. The akhira could be tomorrow if you die now and you're in your grave. It passes like a night of sleep, and tomorrow is Yom al Qiyamah. Literally, tomorrow for you it could be Yom al Qiyamah. It's not something far off. You know, death comes uh, suddenly without warning, can come to anyone. It's just something we learn from the death of a, like a sports star, a celebrity, like the death of Kobe Bryant. Something that we can learn is that uh, death does not discriminate. You could be at your peak, you can be at your, uh, you could be with your kid somewhere, and death comes and both are gone. So that's actually the end of. Chapter one. Any questions so far? Comments? <coughs> Just take a drink real fast and then we can start chapter two. We have a few minutes. <coughs> I, I would say probably one of the greatest examples of the Prophet's awla, the Prophet's uh, nearness to the, to the Sahaba over their own selves is Ghazwat Badr. Just read what happened. Uh, and Ghazwat Badr, they would put themselves totally in harm's way uh, to protect the Prophet ﷺ. And there's many examples of, of that. <coughs> <coughs> Chapter 2 is called Allah's perfecting his good qualities of character and constitution and giving him all the virtues of the deen in this world. So I'll, I'll read you, it's a short introduction, and then I'll just give you some of the highlights. Because it's, it's a little bit... Um, uh, um, a, little, a little confusing, I guess you can say here. So whoever loves a noble prophet and is searching out the complete details of his inestimable treasure of his being should know that man's beautiful and perfect qualities can be placed in one of two categories. Number one, characteristics which are innate and a necessary part of life of this world, such as natural form and things connected to the necessary acts of daily life. Number two, characteristics which are acquired as part of the deen. These are things for which one is praised and which bring one near to Allah. These qualities can be further divided into two categories. Qualities which are purely innate or acquired. And number two, qualities which combine both elements. Then he goes on, man has no choice in or ability to acquire innate qualities. These include things like perfection of physique, physical beauty, strength of intellect, soundness of understanding, eloquence of tongue, acuteness of the senses, strength of limb, balance, nobility of lineage, the might of one's people, and the honor of one's land. Also connected to this are the things that are the necessities of daily life, such as food, sleep, clothes, dwelling place, marriage, property, and rank. These things, however, can be connected to the next world if the intention in them is related to fear of Allah and teaching the body to follow the path of Allah in spite of the fact that they are all defined as necessi necessities and governed by the rules of the Sharia. As for the acquired things which pertain to the next world, they include all virtues and the adab of the Sharia, making things, uh, things such as practice of the deen, knowledge, forbearance, patience, thankfulness, justice, doing without humility, pardon, chastity, generosity, courage, modesty, manliness, silence, deliberation, gravity, mercy, good manners, comradeship, um, camaraderie, I guess, and other similar qualities, they can be summed up as good character, husn al Some of these qualities can be part of natural instinct and basic disposition in some people. Others do not have them and have to acquire them. 
However, some basic rudiments of them must exist in a person's natural disposition, as Allah willing, we will make clear, even when the face of Allah in the next world is not what is intended by these worldly qualities. They are still considered good character and virtues according to the consensus held by men of sound intellect. However, there is a disagreement as to the reason for people having these qualities. It's kind of a, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's really kind of a deep introduction, but basically what he's saying here is, um, among other things, but just basically it's that some virtues are wahbi, some virtues are innate. Some people are born with virtue. Wahbi from Al-Wahhab. One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the bestower of gifts, Al-Wahhab. And some virtues are kasbi. They can be acquired through discipline, disciplining the nafs. Right? So there's a virtue theory in, amongst our classical ulama. Ghazali has a virtue theory. Um, and it's, it's Aristotelian to a certain point. Um, so basically that, um, it's basically to, to fake it till you make it. It's called habitus in Greek, that if you want to acquire a virtue, let's say that some people are born with patience, some people don't have it. If you're born with it, it's from al-wahhab. Alhamdulillah, you have it. Um, everyone's born equal in the sense that they're all humans, but not everyone's created equal in that sense that they're exactly the same. There's some people who are born into opulence and wealth. Some people are born into dire poverty. Some people have, um, uh, they're born and they're educated and they have incredible ta'deeb. They have like discipline and they have virtue. Um, some people don't. Uh, so in reality, everything is, is wahbi. Everything is given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But basically, if you want to acquire a certain virtue, you have to fake it until you make it. <clears throat> if you want to be patient, if you want sabr, when something happens, like a sadma, like a type of calamity, uh, act like a virtuous person. Act like a, um, like a uh, patient person. And if you keep acting like that, over time, it'll be sort of woven into your personality. You'll acquire it. Right? Um, there's a hadith in Bukhari, a famous hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ was at the graveyard in Medina, al baqir and he saw a woman crying at a grave, and she was kind of hysterical. And he said, uh, Ittaqi wasbiri, ya amatullah, like, O maid servant of God, fear God and be patient. And then uh, she was impatient. She didn't even turn around to see who it is. So she said to him, Ilayka anni, like, get away from me. Like, go, get, get away from me. Uh, you've never been afflicted like this. So some of the muhaddithin say that her son had died. Of course, the Prophet wasallam buried all of his children except for one. Right? And he knew that Fatima would die in six months. And he knew Hassan Hussein would also be martyred uh, as well. Um, so the Prophet wasallam, he just, he goes home, right? And then the woman, she finds out that, that it was the Prophet Sallallahu so she goes and waits by his door, um, and she says to him that, uh, you know, I'll be patient now. And the Prophet said to her, إِنَّمَا الصَّبْرُ عِنْدَ صَدْمَةِ الْأُولَى أَوْ عِنْدَ أَوَّلِ صَدْمَةٍ That indeed, true patience is at the first stroke of the calamity. That's true patience. <coughs> Right? And that's, that's the goal. So it's good that you're going to be, that's how we learn, right? But true patience, you can, if someone's a, a, a sabr or sabur, the way that you can tell is that something happens and immediately they have patience. That means they've acquired this virtue or they're trying to acquire this virtue. So they're acting like a patient person, right? So that's how you acquire virtue. The difference with Aristotle, then, between Ghazali and Aristotle, the method is somewhat the same, but the, the telos, the ghaya, the end, the aim is different. The aim for Aristotle is, uh, he calls it eudynomia, which is like living a fulfilled, happy life of contemplation to become a philosopher. That's the end. Uh, for Ghazali and others, it is proximity to the divine, is wilaya, is sainthood. 
That's, that's the goal, is that you mimic the ethos of the Prophet ﷺ because he's Habibullah, and by doing that, you become Habibullah. You become beloved of God, and you attain ranks of sainthood. That's the goal. In sainthood, we're using a sort of a more general, right, um, proximity to God. Not necessarily someone who can manifest karamat and things like that. Someone with good character, someone who's in the, someone who may not even have a lot of knowledge, just an average Muslim guy or, or woman, but uh, is striving to emulate the Prophet and their sincerity there, and they're constantly working on their khuluk, and they're constantly trying to acquire these virtues. It never stops, it, it, it continues to go. So the Prophet said, Fasbiru hatta talqawni ala al Keep being patient. And one of the meanings of patience is also perseverance. Keep persevering until you meet me at the hawd. That's when you can relax. But the dunya is going to be work. There's no point in the dunya where you just, oh, I'm, I'm good enough now. I'm good. Like Abdul Qadir Jilani when, the, when he had the dream and the light. And you're Shaykh, you're, you're the great wali and there's no taklif on you, no more prayer for you. You've ascended, transcended the prayer. And he said, who are you? And he said, I'm your Lord. He said, no, you're a liar. You're the shaitan. Because the Prophet Wasallam had to pray six times a day. The taklif is not removed from him on any of the awliya, but I've transcended taklif. It's ridiculous. Anyway, I think we can stop here, inshallah. So, for next week, we'll, so that was, that's the introduction, basically. Uh, we'll start section one, which is a preface, which is sort of a um, summary of what he's already said in chapter one. And in section two, he begins by talking about the khalq. So there's khuluq and khalq. The, the khuluq is the character of the Prophet ﷺ. The khalq is his physical manifestation, so his physical appearance, the physical appearance of the Prophet ﷺ, which is a sign of his nabuwa, the way that he physically looked. Inshallah ta'ala. Next time. Sakala khair wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahihi wa sallam wa alhamdulillah wa bil alameen. They're given as gifts by the gift giver, Al-Wahhab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other fada'il must be earned. They're acquired. Imam al-Ghazali says at the end of the day, everything is wahhabi. Everything is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, anyway, but there are some virtues that require discipline. And we said last week that uh, Imam Ghazali's theory of vir virtue is very similar to Aristotle in the method of habitus, right? Habituating the lower self to acquire these virtues. But the gaya, the telos, the end is very different for Aristotle in the Nicomachean ethics. The telos is eudaimonia, a full, um, fulfilled life or happiness or a life of contemplation to become a philosopher. Whereas for Ghazali, it's Wilaya, proximity to the divine, sainthood, friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now in the preface he says, if someone has been blessed with even one or two of these qualities of perfection and nobility, whether of lineage, beauty, power, knowledge, forbearance, courage, or generosity, he is considered noteworthy and people use him as an example, as a moral exemplar. People's heartfelt esteem of these qualities makes people uh, who have them, honored long after their bones have turned to dust. So Imam al-Ghazali, um, in his uh, Ihya, um, he mentions or he affirms what are known as the four cardinal virtues, the four principal virtues. He calls them Ummahatul Fadail. And these are courage and wisdom and temperance um, and justice. So they are in Arabic, they are shaja'a, 
which is epitomized by Abu Bakr Siddiq. So each of the four caliphs epitomizes one of these virtues. Shaja'a, courage, and then Umar, adala, justice. Uthman is Ifa, temperance. And Hikmah, Sayyidina Ali. These are the Ummahatul Fadail, the cardinal virtues, the principal virtues. But these also must be refined according to Imam al Ghazali, that true virtue is in the middle, it's the mean, the golden mean. So true courage. Right? So in other words, courage, it has two extremes, right? So the virtue is in the middle. To one extreme to, is, is, is excessive courage, right? This is ifrat. There's ifrat and tafrit, too much courage, excessive courage. This is not considered a, a fadl. It's not considered a virtue. It's a vice. So someone, for example, who has tahawr or foolhardiness, someone who's reckless, that's not courage. So, for example, um, you see somebody, somebody um, mugging someone with a gun on the street. Uh, it's probably not a good idea to confront that person directly because you're going to put yourself in danger. So, it's, it's probably a, a better decision to just call the police with your cell phone. But actually approaching that person and trying to stop the mugger is actually not co considered courage, but rather recklessness, and that's a vice. And then you have the other extreme. Uh, where there's deficiency in courage, right? Tafrit, and that's cowardice, jubun, right? Even with wisdom, right? So, so the point here is that, that a, a true uh, virtue is to know when and how to act. That's a true virtue, when and how to act. And then to follow a moral exemplar. So as we said, each of the four caliphs epitomized one of these virtues. And the Prophet wasallam epitomizes uh, all of them. But even with wisdom, there are excesses. Excess wisdom is called makar or uh, deceit, tricksterism. right? And in many cultures around the world, tricksterism is actually lauded. It's praised. If you can, you know, if you can fool someone and get away with it, and somehow get their money or something, then you're a clever person, you know, uh, this type of thing. Uh, unfortunately, this is something that's found in cultures all around the world and in literature all around the world, the trickster archetype. Right? It's found in the Bible. It's found in, uh, in you know, Greek mythology, Prometheus, and uh, other places as well. And then obviously, a deficiency of wisdom is called bala or stupidity, right? So these are the these are the cardinal virtues. And Ghazali also talks about the mystical virtues. So these are cardinal virtues, and then there are mystical virtues. And these mystical virtues, he considers to, them to be these stations that are bestowed by Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. These maqamat, and the first one is repentance, is toba. That's the first station. That's the first station of the spiritual path and the last one is mahabba is love i think his microphone stopped working or something it's not working so then along the path there's sabr and shukr and khawf and zuhud these 19 mystical virtues okay so Qadi Iyad, he continues, so what can be said of the inestimable worth of someone who possesses all these qualities? Is the microphone working? I don't think. Yeah. He doesn't like me. So he's saying here, it would be impossible for him to have granted them either by graft or guile. Such a person is only, such a thing is only possible by the gift of Allah the Almighty. So now he's going to list the, the, the various qualities, praiseworthy, praiseworthy qualities, and virtues of the Prophet. So prophethood, bearing the message, close friendship with Allah, his love being chosen, the night journey, 
vision of him, nearness, proximity, revelation, intercession, mediation, all the virtues, high degree, the praiseworthy station, the burak, the ascension, being sent to all mankind, it's a very long list, leading the prophets in prayer, the witnessing for him of the prophets and their communities, mastery over the descendants of Adam, his being the bearer of, uh, the, bearer of the banner of praise, bringing good news and warning, his place with the one with the throne, obedience, bearing the trust, guidance, being a mercy for the world, so Allah is being pleased with him so that he is allowed to ask of him, kawthar, being listened to or being obeyed, uh, the perfection of blessing on him, pardon for past and future wrong actions, the expanding of the breast, the removing of his burden, the elevation of his renown, his being helped by a mighty victory, the sending down of the sakina, support by the angels, his bringing the book in wisdom and the seven mathani and the immense Quran, his community being purified, his calling to Allah, the, the prayer of Allah and his angels on him, his judging between people and, and by what Allah showed him, his removing the chains and burden up, uh, from them, Allah swearing by his name, his supplication being answered, inanimate objects and animals speaking to him, the dead being brought to life for his sake, the deaf hearing, water gushing from between his fingers, his turning a little into a lot, the splitting of the moon, the sun going back, his changing of the essence of things, and here's a footnote, for instance, at the Battle of Badr, there was a companion named Ukasha, whose sword had broken, and the Prophet ﷺ picked up a piece of wood and said, take this and fight with it. And then Ukasha looked and it turned into a blade, and they called it Al-Aun. So changing the essence of things. He's being helped by terror. This is a bad translation. Terror is a very loaded <laughs> term nowadays. This does not mean terrorism as we know it, astaghfirullah. This means, and this is from the khasa'is of the Prophet ﷺ, that Allah would strike an intense fear and dread into the hearts of his enemies uh, during the military expeditions. Right? سَنُلْقِي فِي قُلُوبِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا رُعْبَ بِمَا أَشْرَكُوا بِاللَّهِ مَا لَمْ يُنَزِّلْ بِهِ سُلْطَانَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala struck the hearts of the unbelievers or the mushrikeen with رُعْب which is sometimes translated as, as terror. I wouldn't use that translation anymore. I mean, that's what it means, but terror again a very very loaded term this verse is actually from surah number three verse 151 which does have a sababun nuzul according to the ulama it was revealed for a specific purpose uh, imam tabri imam qurtubi mentioned that after the battle of badr when the sahaba had suffered many casualties um, and they went back to medina the mushrikeen felt emboldened initially and they planned on going into medina itself and then massacring everyone in Medina. Uh, but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put this intense ru'b, this intense dread, fear into their hearts. And they said, that's good enough. Let's just go back to Mecca. <clears throat> so that's the context of the ayah. And many times the Prophet sallallahu would dress and they'd go out for an expedition, a military engagement. And the enemy would come near him and they would flee. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would put this intense fear and dread in their hearts. He continues listing the Prophet ﷺ's uh, qualities and praiseworthy uh, station. His, his knowing the unseen, the clouds shading him, the glorification of the pebbles, his removing pain, his protection from people, and so on. And this is just some of what Allah gave him. There is much more, he says. Knowledge of his qualities can only be contained by someone who is given it, and only Allah can bestow it. There is no God but him. Add to this all the stations of honor, degrees of purity, ranks of happiness, excellence, and increase which Allah has prepared for him in the domain of al-akhirah, which cannot be numbered, which intellects are unable to grasp, and which confound the imagination. So that's his preface. And now we begin section two with his physical attributes. So this is part of the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah to believe that the Prophet Wasallam had the best khuluk and the best khalq. In other words, internal and external beauty. So here we're talking about ethics and physical appearance. And from the prophetic invocations, of course, the Prophet Wasallam, when he would look into the mirror, Allahumma kama, uh, kama hassanta khalqi fa hassan khuluki. Oh Allah, just as you have made my uh, external reality beautiful, beautify my internal reality. 
It's a beautiful dua. So he, continue, he begins here, Qadi Iyad, he says, there's absolutely no way to conceal the fact that the Prophet is the worthiest of all mankind, the greatest of them in position, and most perfect of them in good qualities and virtue. I'm setting out to detail his qualities of perfection in the best way I can, which has filled me with longing to call attention to some of his attributes. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah grant him peace. No, may Allah illuminate your, my heart and yours and increase my love and your love for this noble prophet. I mean, that if you were to look into all those qualities of perfection, which cannot be acquired um, and which are part of one's constitution, you will find that the prophet has every one of them, all of the various good qualities without there being any dispute about it among the transmitters of the, trans, uh, of the tr traditions. The beauty of his form and the perfect proportion of his limbs are related in numerous sound and famous traditions, and then he names a bunch of uh, tr transmitters, Ali and An Anas ibn Malik and Abu Huraira and Al-Bara ibn Azib and Aisha ibn Abi Hala, etc. And we'll go into many of these, inshallah ta'ala. Some of these are very well known, some of them are not very well known. He had the most radiant coloring, deep black eyes, which were wide set and had a sort of red tint to them long eyelashes, a bright complexion, and an aquiline nose. Aquiline means it was a slightly hooked nose. Aquila in Latin means eagle, right? It's so like eagle's beak. Um, it's also called a Roman nose. In early Christianity, the eagle was a symbol of strength and nobility. The symbol of the Gospel of John was an eagle. The Roman Empire's uh, symbol was the eagle. In ancient Greek mythology, Zeus was symbolized by the eagle. So the aquiline nose, aquiline noses are cross-culturally uh, viewed as beautiful and noble. It's an immediate sign of nobility, a physical sign. It continued, he had a gap between his front teeth, it was a small gap. His face was round with a wide brow, uh, and he had a thick beard which reached his chest. His, che uh, his chest and abdomen were of equal size. So his stomach did not protrude, sallallahu alayhi wa He did not have like a, what we call a pot belly, right? And this is something that's important, um, you know, because uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa is, is, like I said, physically he's the most beautiful. Therefore, he's going to be the most healthy. Nowadays, you have this thing going around where we're supposed to accept uh, you know, people as they are, even if they're unhealthy, unfortunately. They're people who complain that they have to, they have to buy two seats on an airplane because they're overweight. Well, some people have sort of predispositions to, to weight gain and things like that, so I'm not talking about that. But a lot of this has to do with a lack of self-control, right? And then they turn it into a civil rights issue. It's like, oh, just as, you know, black people had to sit in the back of the bus, now I have to pay for two seats on an airplane. No, it's not... It's not the same thing at all, you know. So you know, obesity is, is unattractive because it's unhealthy. And that person is literally dying. So it's, it's not attractive. It just as anorexia is not attractive because that person is literally dying, right? So the Prophet وسلم, his physical constitution avoided both of these extremes. So you can draw a line from his chest down. It was straight. <clears throat> He was broad-chested, with broad shoulders, large bones, large arms, thick palms, and soles, long fingers, fair skin, and fine hair from the chest to the navel. So, you know, he had some mass, you know. So I tell the brothers, you should lift some weights, you know, increase your muscle mass. Um, there are brothers I know that are pushing 30 that can't find wives, and they're good brothers, but I, I don't know if I can have the heart to tell. I mean, they look like they're 110 pounds. You know? And it's not really attractive to women. It's, it's just not beautiful. So the Prophet ﷺ is, is our example. And he had, he had large arms and a broad chest. And, you know, he had broad shoulders. Because uh, that's the picture of beauty. He was neither tall nor short, but between the two. In spite of that... No tall person who walked with the Prophet seemed taller than him. His hair was neither straight nor curly. When he laughed, uh, when he laughed and his teeth showed, it was like a flash of lightning, where they seemed as white as hailstones. 
When he spoke, it was like light issuing from between his teeth. He had a well-formed neck, neither broad nor fat. He had a compact body, which was not fleshy. Al-Bara said, I did not see anyone with a more beautiful lock of hair resting on a red robe than the Messenger of Allah. Abu Huraira said, I have not seen anything more beautiful than the Messenger of Allah. It was as if the sun was shining in his face. When he laughed, it reflected from the wall. There's another hadith that he doesn't mention here from Sahih Muslim, also related by, uh, by uh, Bara. Uh, that the Prophet, he said, the Prophet was Rajulan Marbu'an. He was... Uh, Middle, middle height, broad shouldered, uh, his hair hung down to his earlobes. Then he said, Alayhi hullatun hamra, and he was wearing a red mantle. And then he said, Ma ra'aytu shay'an qattu ahsana minhu. I did not see anything more beautiful than him. He doesn't say, I didn't see any bashar, human being, or any man. Or, uh, he said, I, I didn't see anything. Shay'an, nothing in creation was more beautiful than him. Jabir ibn Samura was asked, what, uh, was his face like a sword? He replied, no, it was like the sun and the moon. It was round. That hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. In her description, Umm Ma'bad. Umm Ma'bad is uh, Atika bintu Khalid. Um, so this is uh, the context of this hadith, and this hadith is in Bayhaqi. That the Prophet وسلم, when he was making hijrah with Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, they stopped and rested in a town on their way to Medina. And this woman, Umm Ma'bad, who was a very, very old woman, uh, saw him from a distance and then met him up close. And she said, uh, she said, from afar, he was the most beautiful of people. And up close, he was the most handsome. And then, and then she said to her husband after the prophet had left, uh, you never get tired of looking at him. Right? She was a very, very old woman. Right, so he, the Prophet ﷺ was very striking, or you would say stunningly handsome. Right? And see people are like that. You just see them and it stops you and you forget what you're saying. Ibn Abi Hala said, his face shone like the full moon. At the end of his description, Ali said, anyone who saw him suddenly was filled with awe of him. So there was a heba, there was like this weightiness or gravitas or dignity. People, when they Im immediately saw the Prophet Sallam, they were awestruck by him, right? Like they were just overcome. It's like when, when you first lay eyes on the Kaaba, when you actually see the Kaaba, that first initial moment, you're awestruck by the spectacle. So Sayyidina Ali says this, this hadith is in the Shema al And then he says, those who kept his company loved him, but when you actually mixed with him, got to know him, then you the heba is still there, but then you started to, to love him almost immediately. And some people are like this also. You meet a perfect stranger, and there's something about their attitude that you, after two minutes, you think, I love this guy. He's such a nice guy. Mashallah, he's a beautiful guy. All who describe him say that they have not seen anyone like him, either before or since. I did not see before or after the likes of him. There are many famous hadiths, so Qadi Iyadi, he concludes the section here. There are many famous uh, hadith which describe him. We will not take time here to give all of them. We have restricted ourselves to some aspects of his description and given a summary of them, which is enough to serve our purpose. Um, section three is on his cleanliness. His cleanliness. So he begins here by saying, the complete cleanliness of his body, the sweetness of his smell and perspiration, and his freedom from uncleanliness and bodily defects comprise a special quality given to him by Allah, which no one else enjoys. And these were made yet more complete by the cleanliness dictated by the Sharia uh, and the 10 practices of natural behavior. So these are called the Asharatun Min Al Fitra. There's a hadith in Sahih Muslim that names these. These basically 10 practices of good hygiene, right? They're, elsewhere in, in other hadith, they're called Asharatun Mina Sunnah, the 10 practices of the, of the Prophet Sallallahu of the Sunnah. So the hadith, in Muslim, and there's different versions of the hadith, but in Muslim from Aisha, 
Clipping the mustache, obviously this refers only to the men, not allowing the mustache to go into the mouth. It's considered very bad hygiene. Letting the beard grow. The beard is a sign of uh, rujulia, virility, manliness, um, prestige, maturity, power. It's proper for a man to have even a few hairs uh, on his chin. It shouldn't be out of control and untidy. Using a toothpick or a toothbrush, a very good hygienic practice of the Prophet ﷺ. Snuffing up water into the nose or rinsing the nose out, um, very good uh, practice for health reasons. Cutting the nails, obviously, good hygiene. Washing the knuckles by here, the hands or the, the joints, right? which is what we're told to do a lot nowadays. Do fist bumps now, we're not allowed to shake hands anymore because of corona stuff. Plucking the, uh, or, or trimming the hair of the armpit, shaving or, or pl uh, plucking or trimming the pubic hair, cleansing oneself with water uh, in the lavatory. A lot of people don't do that, by the way, which is very strange to think about that, but a lot of people don't do that. Using water after you use the bathroom. A very good hygienic practice. It's axiomatic for us, but a lot of people don't do that. The narrator forgot the tenth, but he said it could be rinsing out the mouth. It's a good practice. It's like a form of a quick floss. When you eat, just rinse the mouth out, any food particles will come out. Sometimes they get stuck and they cause infection. And then one version has circumcision rather than letting the beard grow. So different versions of the hadith. Uh, but these are the ten practices of the fitra or the ten practices of the sunnah, the ten practices of good hygiene and, and healthy uh, healthy living. The Messenger of Allah said, the deen is based on cleanliness. So he quotes this hadith, the commentator says, it's from Ibn Hibban, and it's da'if, but there's a hadith in Muslim. at tuhuru shatrul iman. This is in Sahih Muslim. Cleanliness is half of faith. In this culture, they say, cleanliness is next to godliness. <clears throat> And I said that I have not smelled amber, musk, or anything more fragrant than the smell of a messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa This hadith is in Muslim and Tirmidhi. Jabir ibn Samura said that the messenger of Allah touched his cheek. So the Prophet sallallahu he would pass by groups of children playing, and oftentimes he'd just kind of pat them on the head. Sometimes he'd pat them like on the cheek like this. So this happened to, to, uh, to Jabir. He said the Prophet touched my cheek and he said I felt a cool sensation uh, and his hand was scented and he said it was like he drew his hand out of a bag of perfume that's what it smelled like when he touched my cheek this incredible there's a coolness to it and this incredible smell to it someone said um, no, ma uh, no matter whether he had put scent on his hand or not if he shook a man's hand, the fragrance would remain for the whole day. One of my teachers said, Allahu Alam, he said that after the Isra wal Mi'raj, the scent increased. It was a natural scent he had since birth, but it got more intense after the Laylatul Isra wal Mi'raj. If the Prophet placed his hand on the head of a child, that child would be recognized among other children by the fragrance. You smell his head, right? And then, you know, there were, in the time of the Tabi'een, some of the Sahaba you know, that were still alive were very old, and the Tabi'in would actually line up at their doors just to like see like the man's head because they said the Prophet's hand once touched this when he was a boy. Now he's an old man, he's gray or he's bald. And they go and they smell his head. <laughs> they say, I can still smell the fragrance of the Prophet. <laughs> the Messenger of Allah slept on a rug in a house of Anas and perspired. Anas's mother, Umm Sulaim, brought a long-necked bottle in which to put his araq, his sweat. When the messenger asked her about this, she said, we put it in our perfume, huwa min atyabitib. She said, it is the most fragrant of scents, the best of perfumes, Bukhari and Muslim. In this great history, al-Bukhari mentioned that Jabir said, when the Prophet went down a road, anyone who followed him, um, anyone who followed him knew he had passed that way because of his scent. So the Prophet went through like a, a path in the streets. You can just follow his fragrance and, and know exactly where he went if he had a good sense of smell. <laughs> he 
And then he says here, Ishaq ibn, ibn Rahawe mentioned that the Prophet's fragrance occurred without the use of perfume. I don't know who Ishaq ibn Rawai, or Rahawe is. That's something that he mentions here from one of the scholars. Even without the use of perfume. It's a natural scent he has. Muhammad ibn Sa'd uh, al waqid scribe related that Aisha said uh, to the Prophet وسلم, when you come from relieving yourself, we do not see anything noxious from you. He said, Aisha, don't you know that the earth swallows up what comes out of the prophets so that none of it is seen? So he quotes this hadith. This hadith is very much disputed, though. It's very much disputed. But he does mention it here. Connected to this, we have a hadith of Sayyidina Ali. I washed the prophet's body, so this is after the prophet had passed. Wasallam, and I began to look for what is normally found in a corpse, but I did not find anything. And then I said, he's speaking to the Prophet, Bi Abi, he said, by may, so may my father be ransomed. Sayyidina Ali is saying this to the Prophet وسلم, as he's washing him, that you were pure in life and pure in death. He added, a sweet smell came from him, whose like I have never experienced. There's in multiple hadith, and, but some of the ulama say there may be some weakness in this. Ibn Majah relates to Abu Dawud al-Hakim and others. In Bukhari, Abu Bakr kissed the Prophet وسلم, after the latter's death, and he said something to the same effect. There was also the time when Malik ibn Sinan drank some of the blood of the Prophet وسلم, at Ghazwat Uhud. He says he licked it up. The Prophet allowed him to do that and then said, the fire will not touch you. This hadith is in a tabarani. Um, this hadith is often attacked by like Christian polemicists. So something to remember about this hadith is this, this was not a command. The Prophet did not command um, Malik to do this. This was a spur of the moment thing that Malik did and it was, it was out of love for the Prophet the Prophet did not command him, but he allowed him and he excused him for doing that. Um, it's interesting that Christians would attack this, Christian apologists attack this hadith. There's a statement from Isa -Islam in their source. It's a very strange statement that it, they attribute to him in the Gospel of John chapter 6 where he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, there is no life in you. And Catholics actually take that quite literally. That this is a command. So one of their seven sacraments is called the Eucharist, where they come together on Sunday for the Mass, and they have bread and they have wine, and something occurs during the process called transubstantiation, which they actually believe that the Holy Spirit will change the essence of the bread into the literal body of God, and then they eat it, and then the wine into the literal blood of God, and then they drink that, right? So this is something that they're commanded to do. Right? So it's very ironic that they attack hadith like this because a companion on the day of Uhud, you know, in that intense situation where the Prophet is bleeding, right, that this companion basically jumped on the Prophet and, and took some of the blood into his mouth uh, out of love. Um, but nowadays because of the corona thing, because so when you go into a Catholic church, the priest is supposed to take this a wafer, he's supposed to put it right on the tongue. But now the Vatican is saying that's, that's not optimal because of the coronavirus, right? That's how germs get passed. So you're supposed to put the wafer in the person's hand. But then there are crumbs that come off. And those crumbs, if they're discernible with the eye as being wafer, then that's literally, literally, it's not figurative. The Protestants say figurative. The Catholics are over a billion and a half. And they say it's literal. That's literally the body of God. So then you have people wiping, you know, their hands on their pants and things like that. And, so, it's causing a lot of problems with, uh, with Catholics right now. Um, this one's also something that's always, always attacked here. Something similar is related that when a woman drank some of his urine and he told her, you will never complain of a stomach ache. So the hadith is in Al-Hakim. Um, and then Qadi Iyad says, he did not order any of them to wash their mouths out, nor did he forbid them from doing it again. <clears throat> then he says, the hadith of the woman drinking the urine is sound, 
at Daraqutni um, follows Muslim and Bukhari who relate it in the Sahih. Uh, I couldn't locate this hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. Uh, then I called one of my colleagues who is a hadith scholar and he said it's not in it's not in Bukhari and Muslim. So I don't know what's happening here. Maybe this is a, a bad translation or Qadi Iyad is, just seems to be mistaken here. Uh, the hadith is found in a Tabarani. Uh, he, but nonetheless, Qadi Iyadi goes on to say the name of this woman was Baraka, and they disagree about her lineage. Some say that it was Umm Ayman who used to serve the Prophet. She said that the messenger had a wooden cup which he placed under his bed in which he would uh, urinate in, uh, during the night. One night he urinated in it, and when examined, when he examined it in the morning, there was nothing left in it. He asked Baraka about that, and she said, I got up and I was thirsty, so I drank it without knowing. It was unintentional. And then he says this hadith is related by Ibn Juraj and others. So this, like I said, this hadith is in Tabarani, and most muhaddithin consider it very, very weak. Now, many of those ulama do maintain, however, that the entire body of the Prophet Wasallam is tahir. His entire body is pure. Right? So the question is about this hadith. Um, so his physical body is, is special, and that's from his khasais. However, there's no, even on this issue, there's no ijma. Right? And many other ulama maintain that all human um, uh, excrement is najis, and this is true of all the prophets because they're still human beings. So Allahu alam. <clears throat> Qadi Iyad also mentions the prophet was born circumcised with his umbilical cord cut. It is related that his mother Amina said he was born clean, and there's no impurity on, and there was no impurity on him. Hello. <clears throat> what time do we pray Isha here? Nine o'clock, okay. So I don't have much else to say, so we'll finish. That's the end of section three, and then we'll do section four, inshallah. And then we'll call it a night, inshallah. So section four, his intellect, eloquence, and the acuteness of his faculties. Any questions so far or comments? Section four, chapter two. As for his ample intellect, intelligence, and acuteness of his senses, his eloquence, the grace of his movements, and excellence of his faculties, there is no doubt that he was the most intelligent and astute of people. Anyone who reflects on how he managed the inward and outward affairs of people and the politics of the common people and the elite and his amazing qualities and wonderful life, not to mention the knowledge which flowed from him and the way he confirmed the sharia without any previous instruction, experience or reading any books will have no doubts about the superiority of his intellect and the firmness of his understanding. None of this requires confirmation because it has already been amply verified. So you think about like all of the different hats as it were that the Prophet wore during his life as being a father, 
um, as being the head of state, uh, as being um, a prophet, uh, all of these different things that he was doing, as being a military commander, as being a spiritual leader, um, is really incredible, and remarkable, right? which has led many, as we know, Western scholars to conclude that really he's in a class by himself. There's no one quite like him in all of history. Right? What is the famous book by Michael Hart, 1978, <coughs> The 100 Most Influential People, ranking the Prophet وسلم, number one, because no, nobody had the, the holistic impact that he had in, in all of history, really, when you think about it. Not even close, I think. I mean, second place is very, very distant. Mujahid said, when the, Prophet, when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, got up for prayer, uh, he could see all those behind him as if they were in front of him. And this is established in strong hadith in Bukhari. أَقِيمُ السُّفُوفِ فَإِنِّي أَرَاكُمْ خَلْفَ ظَهْرِ So he said, um, establish the, the lines for prayer, stand straight, for indeed I can see behind my back. <laughs> this affords one commentary on the words, وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ So here Qadi Iyadi quotes this verse. We, he quoted it earlier, uh, and we quoted it earlier as well. Ibn Abbas's opinion about this, and you're turning about in those who make sajda. Ibn Abbas's opinion is that this is a reference to the prophetic light that is being passed through uh, Salihin, uh, from Adam alayhi salam to Nuh alayhi salam to Ibrahim alayhi salam, all the way to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, that the prophetic light was being passed. This is one of the proofs that are used uh, to indicate that there's no shirk in the immediate ancestry, uh, in the direct ancestry of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But here he's, he's quoting it for a different reason. He's saying here, taqallub, wa taqallubaka fi sajideen. Taqallub refers to his eyesight, right? And your, um, a, in your ability to see those who are makes, making sajda from behind his back. And this is supported by another ayah in the Quran. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 144, قَدْ نَرَى وَجْهِكَ فِي السَّمَاء That indeed we see you turning your face towards the sky or directing your eyes. تَقَلُّب here, وَجْهِكَ تَقَلُّب وَجْهِكَ means to, to, to turn your eyes towards the heavens. Right? So some of the ulama say that this ayah in Ash-Shu'ara, verse 219, uh, indicates the the eyesight of the Prophet وسلم, and his ability to see behind him during the prayer. The Muwatta contains the words of the Prophet, I can, and there's other hadith he quotes here, I can see you behind me. There's something similar from Anas in the two Sahih collections. Aisha said the same thing, adding from herself, it is something extra which Allah gave him as an additional proof. One of the variants has, I can see whoever is behind me as I see whoever is in front of me. Another has, I see the one behind my neck as I see the one before me. <clears throat> and Baqir ibn Mukhallad related that Aisha said the Prophet ﷺ could see as well in the dark as he saw in the light. This hadith is in Bukhari. <clears throat> uh, sorry, Bayhaqi mentions this hadith. And there may, may be some weakness in the isnad. There are many other sound traditions about the Prophet ﷺ seeing the angels. These are sound traditions. He saw Jibril alayhi salam. 600 wings uh, on a throne between the heavens and the earth across the horizon. He saw the shayateen in, in the sound traditions. Um, he was able to see the Najashi in Al Habasha, uh, the Christian king who had become Muslim, by the way. But he's not, a, he's not considered a Sahabi because he did not see with his eyes the Prophet, ﷺ, but he's a Tabi'i. He's a tabi who lived at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So uh, he could pray for him. So the, on the day that the Najashi died, um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, مَا تَلْيَوْمْ رَجْلٌ صَالِحٌ فَقُومُ فَصَلُّوا أَنْ أَخِيكُمْ أَسْحَمَا أَسْحَمَا That was his name, the king of Abyssinia. So he said, today a righteous man has died. So he was informed of this by... Uh, Jibril alayhi salam. So stand and pray for your brother. Right. 
<clears throat> in the same way, he says, he saw Jerusalem after his night journey. So he was given some sort of ru'ya vision, an awakened state of the temple precincts in Jerusalem, Temple Mount area. Uh, because some of the Quraysh had gone there on caravans and they knew the description. So they said, well, why don't you describe it so, so we can confirm that you were there. So even though he was there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifested like it was right in front of him, like the Kaaba is right in front of him. He was able to pinpoint these, describe these minute details. And there's some other traditions that say that, that they still didn't believe him. And then he said, okay, you know, in a few days a caravan will arrive. There's one camel missing. I saw it bolt away from them. And then the, the caravan arrived. Allahu alam. Um, he also saw the Kaaba when he was building the mosque in Medina. So this ex extraordinary ability to see things, to hear things, right? Ahmed ibn Muhammad and others related that the Prophet could see 11 stars in the Pleiades, Thurayya. This according to Ahmed ibn Muhammad and others refers to the total which, is, uh, which it is physically possible to see with the naked eye. One of them believed that this referred to his knowing about it. However, the clear meaning contradicts this, and there is no impossibility of this having been done. Clear-sightedness is one of the special traits of the Prophet ﷺ and one of their qualities. Abu Huraira said that the Prophet said, when Allah the Mighty manifested himself to Musa, he was able to see an ant on a stone in the darkness of the night at a distance of 10 leagues. This is in Tabarani. Therefore, it is in no way impossible for a prophet to have been able to do what he had, we have mentioned in this chapter after the night journey and the favor he received on seeing one of the greatest signs of his Lord. Traditions have come down to the effect that he threw down Rukana, the strongest of the people of his time, and called him to Islam. So the famous uh, Meccan wrestler who was, you know, he was, he was the best wrestler, right? And he was a big, huge guy. And, and the prophet says, Salam, he basically just kind of body slammed him a couple of times. He did the first time, Rukana said, how did you do that? No one's ever done it. He said, let me show you, you did it again. And then he became Muslim. So it's physical strength. <clears throat> and then Abu Huraira said, I did not see anyone who walked more swiftly than the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was, as if, it was as if the earth rolled up for him. We would exhaust ourselves and yet he was not tired at all. And this hadith also mentioned something similar in the Shema'il of Imam al Another of his qualities was that his laugh was only a smile. When he turned to face someone, he turned to face them directly or totally. He would turn his entire body towards that person. Um, so he wouldn't turn like this and speak to someone. He was considered, he would consider that sort of bad adab. He would turn completely. And when he walked, he walked as if, and then he would turn, when he was done, he would turn completely away. Uh, and when he walked, he, he walked as if, he, as if he was coming down a slope. So he would walk, in other words, he would walk with intention. He'd walk as if he had somewhere to go. He didn't, wasn't just walking around, meandering around, looked like he had nothing to do. And you know, So the Sahaba would have a hard time keeping up with him. And it's also due to his perfect physical constitution, again, perfect physical health, right, that he, he had just this vigor and strength about him. So his walk was naturally fast. So that's the end of section four. So that's all I had planned on doing for today, inshallah. So we'll leave a little bit early unless we have some, some questions or comments. So next time I'm planning on, inshallah, getting to section seven or eight, inshallah. Zakala khairan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته
everyone is uh, doing well, <clears throat> everyone is staying safe, um, and everyone is um, in good spirits, inshallah ta'ala. So we're continuing our series on the Kitab al-Shifa by Qadi Iyad. So um, we are on section five here. This is still part one, uh, chapter two. Um, section five and if people have comments or questions they can certainly type them in into the live chat inshallah and I will try to answer them as they come in um, uh, or uh, answer them next week if they require a bit of uh, research so this section in in my translation this is on page 39 um, Qadi Iyad, he calls it his eloquence in sound Arabic. So he says, the Prophet ﷺ's preeminence in eloquence and fluency of speech is well known. He was fluent, he was skillful in debate, um, and this is um, from the, um, the uh, necessary attributes of all prophets, is that they should have uh, acumen, sagaciousness, um, they should be extremely intelligent, especially in matters of religion, skillful in debate, very concise, clear, uh, clear in expression, lucid, used sound meanings, and was free from affectation. Affectation is the word she uses uh, to translate. This means pretension. Um, so someone who uses affectation or someone who is pretentious in speech is someone who uses speech which is intended to like impress people right um and it has sort of a artificial uh quality to it and so the prophet sallallahu speech is totally free of this type of pretension that his eloquence was very very natural and this is simply how he spoke um, there was no pretension behind anything he was saying he was given mastery of language, he says, literally all the words, and was distinguished by producing marvelous maxims. These are wise sayings, like aphorisms, hikam. He goes on to say, he learned the dialects of the Arabs and would speak to each of their communities in their own dialect and converse with them in their own idiom. So this not only demonstrates the incredible wisdom uh, and an intellect of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but also demonstrates that he had incredible respect for others. Right, uh, that when he would speak to a certain Arab tribe <clears throat> uh, that was not Qureshi, uh, he would use their dialect as a way of honoring them and use idiomatic language uh, that they were familiar with in order to communicate to them. Um, sound meanings uh, of, of the Qur'an and of his message. And this is also part of the wisdom of da'wah, that you speak, as it were, the language uh, of the people that you're inviting to the truth. And some of the ulama are better at this than others. Um, some of the ulama uh, are better at written exposition than actually giving lectures. Uh, but a true scholar knows how to tailor the message to the given audience. Um, uh, so uh, there are scholars in our community that can give an incredibly effective lecture to a group of five-year-olds in kindergarten. And, and then that same scholar could go to um, a, a school of law at a university and give an equally effective message to law school students and everything in between. That's part of the wisdom of giving da'wah. 
to the Prophet sallallahu not only in, in, in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi when before he made the hijrah, we know that he sent before him uh, some sahaba to um, bring him back information as to the um, the temperaments and the and the likes and dislikes and the character and attitudes of the people of of of, of Yathrib. And so Musa ibn Umar he went to Yathrib before the hijrah. And he would teach them Quran, and he would get to know the people there, and he would come and report uh, back to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So when the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam re, um, uh, uh, received him, and actually came, or came came into Medina to Munawara, he would tailor the message for those specific groups. And again, that's part of the wisdom of Dawah, and that's part of his incredible intelligence, and that's him fulfilling uh, his obligation. Because another one of the wajibat of a prophet another um obligatory attribute <clears throat> of a prophet is tabligh they must convey the message and the prophets they convey the message in the best of forms so he continues qadi iyad <clears throat> he says he answered their arguments using their own style of rhetoric so that more than once a large number of companions had to ask him to explain what he had said so his companions, if you look in the Meccan period, obviously, they're Qurayshi, so they speak a certain dialect of Arabic. Uh, but then people would come into to Mecca, or when he was in Medina, you have different groups of people speaking different dialects of Arabic, uh, either in Medina or passing through Medina, and you would speak to them in their language. And so the Qurayshi Sahaba, who, who, who weren't familiar with those dialects, they would ask him, what did you mean by that? What does that mean? And the Prophet ﷺ explained to them what he had said. Whoever studies his hadith and biography will know that and verify that, he says. The way he spoke to the Quraysh, the Ansar, and the people of the Hijaz in the Najd was not the same as the way he spoke to, and then he mentions, Dhul Mish'ar al-Hamdani, Mutihfa al-Hamdi, Qatan ibn Haditha al-Ulaymi, al-Ash'ath ibn Qais, Wa'il ibn Hujr al-Kindi, and others from among the chiefs of Hadramaut. Hadramaut is... <clears throat> In the uh, in, in in Yemen, it's it's the desert in Yemen, uh, south of the Arabian Peninsula, and and the kings of Yemen. He says here, and then Qadi Iyad here he goes on to partially quote uh, some of the letters of the Prophet وسلم, the correspondences that he he wrote or had dictated to the various tribes and kings. And it really doesn't come across, the Arabic doesn't quite uh, come across here because it's obviously an English, English translation, but uh, it's an interesting section. We're not going to go into it too much. We do want to look at some of the hadith, however. So he continues to say, Qadi Iyad, he says, and his point about all of this is that the Prophet وسلم, he used the vocabulary of these particular people as well as their stylistic metaphors and common expressions employing this language with them so that they could make what they had revealed uh, for them clear, so that he could make what had been revealed for them clear to the people, and in order to speak to the people in a way that they would recognize. So this goes back to the, the ayah that we quoted in past classes, Surah Al-Nahal, uh, Surah number 16, verse 144, Indeed, we sent down upon you a dhikr, the reminder, the Qur'an, لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ In order for you to make bayan, in order for you to clarify and explain to the people what has been revealed to them. Right? Um, so, it is part and parcel of the vocation of the Prophet wasallam to make bayan, to make clear, to explain the message uh, of the Qur'an. To the people. And of course, there's a famous hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that is well known, where he said, I was given Jawani ul Kalin wa Jawahir ul Hikam. I was given uh, incredibly comprehensive and eloquent speech um, containing uh, uh, jewels of wisdom. Right? So one of his companions actually described him. And he said that the Prophet ﷺ, he rarely spoke, but when he did speak, 
um, he spoke the truth. So the prophet was more taciturn in speech. He, he, he didn't speak much. But when he did speak, it was very powerful. It was very comprehensive. It was very wise. And we'll give a few examples of that actually from the hadith, um, inshallah. So Qadi Iyadi continues, he says, in the hadith, when Al-Amri asked for something, the Prophet used the dialect of Bani Amr. That's just another example he gives of how the Prophet would use the dialect of the tribe that he was speaking to and their idiomatic expressions as a way of honoring that tribe in a way facilitating their faham, their, uh, their understanding of the Risala and of the Quran. As for his everyday speech, famous oratory and his uh, famous oratory and his comprehensive statements and maxims which have been related people have written volumes about them says Khadi Iyad, and books have been compiled containing their words and meanings <clears throat> his speech comprises unequaled eloquence and in incomparable fluency this is this this is shown by such expressions now he gives a list of many many ahadith here um, and uh, to demonstrate what he calls this this unequaled eloquence and incomparable fluency of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we'll look at a few of these hadith and then we'll add a few uh, as well, inshallah. So one of the hadith that he quotes here is translated here by by Aisha Buli as a man is with the one he loves, right? A man is with the one he loves, or a person is with the one that he or she loves. We'll say man because we're going to use it just as a default to include the female gender uh, as well. Uh, this hadith is a famous hadith is in Bukhari. Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. So look at this hadith. It's very eloquent. You know, it just kind of rolls off the tongue. Al-mar'u ma'aman ahab. It's very eloquent. It's also a very iconic statement. It's very iconic. It's very famous, right? Uh, you hear it once, uh, and you tend to remember it. So it's also easy to remember. Um, it's also it communicates uh, uh, an incredible hope, uh, um, and is very optimistic, right? It's also very beautiful, and in fact, the Sahaba <clears throat> were overjoyed when they heard these words from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, in the context of the hadith, um, the Bedouin who came to the Prophet ﷺ and uh, said, what must I do to become a Muslim? And the Prophet ﷺ told him about the five uh, arkan, the pillars, bunya al-islam ala khams, right? And Islam is built upon five, the shahada and the prayer and the zakat and the hajj and the fasting. And then uh, he said, that's all I'm going to do. That's it. I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Um, and then he said, but I love Allah and his messenger. And the Prophet said, right, A person will be, will be with the one whom he loves. And obviously, the, the Sahaba were overjoyed because they love the Prophet ﷺ without question. Um, so it was a, a day of, of, of great rejoicing for them. And by the way, if a hadith... According to the Mahadithin, the scholars of Hadith, if a Hadith has a grammatical error or a grammatical weakness, then the entire Hadith is considered to be weak. If there's, a, there's going to be some weakness uh, in the Hadith um, because it is, uh, it is well known that the Prophet uh, did not speak incorrectly and that he used the most eloquent uh, and powerful forms of speech um, to communicate the message of the Quran and the message of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, another hadith I wanted to, he doesn't mention it here, but it's a very, very powerful hadith. Um, it's in Bukhari and Muslim, Muttafaqun Alay, means it's in the, book, the two best books of hadith, the most authentic, authentic books of Imam al Bukhari, Imam al Muslim. For the Prophet sallallahu he said, "Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tanafiru." Oh, kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam. This is a beautiful hadith. Uh, in fact, um, Yoram van Cleveren, who um, 
was a former anti-Muslim uh, Dutch politician uh, whom I just uh, heard speak um, at the Zaytuna College fundraising dinner. has an incredible story. He converted to Islam, um, and now he's uh, touring the world, as it were, and telling people his incredible story. is really incredible, by the way. Uh, he wrote a book, too, recently called Apostate, um, uh, which is uh, uh, about his journey from Christianity to Islam. And it's a very interesting book, um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, but he actually said during that lecture, he said that this hadith, the, the hadith I just quoted, uh, had a profound effect on him. Yassiru wa tu'asiru wa bashiru wa tu'nafiru. And he actually quoted it in, in Arabic, and he did a pretty good job. He's a very smart man, mashallah. Um, so the meaning of the hadith, some of the meanings may suggest the following, make things easy for people, facilitate things for people, and don't make them difficult, uh, and give people glad tidings, and don't scare them away. Right? It's a beautiful hadith. It's incredibly eloquent. And it displays something called antithetic parallelism uh, in its meaning. So that is to say that this hadith has a very strong rhetorical composition. It is very beautifully grammatically balanced, right? Um, and you know, it's uh, I, I highly recommend people to study all all Muslims, all believers, to study some Arabic. You know, it's difficult, but um, it's very rewarding, even if it's once a week or something, just to sort of, you know, get, get some, something of the meanings of these, of these words of the hadith, of the Quran, obviously. So what we have here is a form two imperative, yassiru, followed by a prohibition also in form two. And then again, we have a form two imperative, wabashiru followed again by a form two prohibition. So the statement is very balanced. Um, grammatically, um, and antithetic parallelism. Parallelism means that 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 the hadith uh, has um, uh, opposite meanings uh, to give it further balance. You know, to make things easy, don't make them difficult. Those are antonyms or antithetic. Um, give people glad tidings and don't scare them away. There's an antithetic relationship there as well. So you have, you have multiple layers of symmetry uh, just with this one statement. It's an incredible statement. Um, it's also easy to remember, and it's also full of hope. It gives people hope. In the context of this hadith is when the Prophet wasallam he sent, I believe it was Mu'adh ibn Jabal, if I'm not mistaken, somebody can correct me. When he sent him to Yemen, he gave him these, these, these instructions. Judge people by the Quran. What if I don't find it? Then by my Sunnah. Then what? Use your intellect, and then yassiru wa tu asiru wa bashiru wa tu nafiru. Beautiful hadith, just unequaled eloquence. Another hadith that struck me uh, very personally um, when I began to uh, practice the faith many many years ago is a hadith in Musnad Ahmad. Um, this is uh, a famous hadith. It's called Hadith al Rahma. Al Rahimun Yarhamukum al Rahman. Irhamu man fil ard, Yarhamukum or Yarhamukum man fil sama. Uh, that uh, the most compassionate shows compassion to those who show compassion. Show compassion to those on earth <coughs> and the one in heaven, as it were, in no anthropomorphic way. And the one in heaven will show you compassion. It's a very, very beautiful hadith. We notice that there's a lot of repetition in this hadith. And this is another strong rhetorical device in Semitic rhetoric, right? It's, it's, you know, the initial audience of the Quran and of the Risala of Islam, the initial audience, the flag bearers are Arabs. And so, and, and these are Arabs that are, that are uh, extremely gifted with Arabic, with language, 
right? And they took pride in their poetry. And there's a surah in the Quran called Ash-Shu'ara, the poets. And the poets were, they were loved and they were feared. Uh, so um, the Quran message and the message of the Prophet in the first instance is tailored uh, for the Arab in order for the Arab to believe in the message and then take the message to the rest of the world. Obviously, the message of Islam is for everyone, but it's, an, it's the initial audience are Arabs. And repetition, as we said, is a very, very strong rhetorical device in Semitic, not just Arabic, in Semitic rhetoric. So like in Hebrew, for example, you have a lot of repetition if you read the Psalms um, or um, if you read um, the book of Proverbs. These books are written in Arabic. Uh, sorry, in Hebrew. Uh, Aramaic is another Semitic language. Um, uh, also, um, the uh, Akkadian language, uh, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. You know, some of my students will read this text. It's a long poem in Akkadian, written in ancient Babylon. And you, you find a lot of repetition because the audience are Semites. Um, and then what else do we notice about this beautiful hadith? Well, the prophet changed the, the standard syntax so that the final word of the first jumla or, or, or sentence is ar-Rahman, right? Um, and, and the conceptual direct object is the first word of the sentence, which is in the nominative rather than in the accusative. I don't know if that makes sense uh, to y'all, but it's, it's a very interesting way. Uh, right? Yarhamuhumur Rahman. There's been, there's been sort of, there's an unconventional syntax here, uh, which makes the statement sort of pop out and, uh, and, take, and, and have people take notice uh, of it. It's very eloquently constructed. <clears throat> it's also a beautifully synonymic and antithetic as well in its parallelism. So we have irhamu, the second statement, irhamu man fil ard. Irhamu is a, an imperative in the plural, show compassion to those on earth. Yarhamkum, yarhamukum or yarhamkum, yarhamkum if it's a sukun, and it's from, it's from the same verb as irhamu, uh, but it's a different mood um, of the verb. It's an adjustive, right? And it has this sense of purpose. Uh, show compassion to those on earth so that um, the one in heaven, as it were, the word heaven, sama, is, is, is uh, in juxtaposition to ard, the earth. So you have that antithetic parallelism. And then yarham and irhamu, these are juxtaposed. It's the same verb, um, but a different uh, person and mood. So again, the statement here is very deep structurally. It's, it's, it's very beautifully composed. It's not poetry. The Prophet Wasallam is not a poet. He's not a sha'ir, right? He has no training in poetry. None of his statements, nor the Quran, is considered technically to be poetry. Um, the Arabs were very familiar, as I said, with poetry, and they had 16 Bihar, they had 16 uh, um, uh, ozan, or they had 16 meters of rhymed poetry, and the Qur'an does not fall into any of those categories, nor the hadith, right? Um, the Qur'an is in, uh, is in a league uh, all its own. Um, does not have, it's, it's, a, it's a sui generis, it's, it's, in a, it's, in a, it's in a category all its own. It's not poetry but is very, very poetic, but not technically shi'r. It's not poetry. Um, another hadith that he quotes here, actually, is on page 41. The translation is, injustice will appear as darkness <clears throat> on the day of rising. Injustice will appear as darkness <clears throat> on the day of rising. And this in the Arabic, adhulmu vulumat. Yom al -Qiyama. So this is a very beautiful play on words, a beautiful 
what's known as alliteration, right? Um, the the word zulm in Arabic means oppression, but zulma means darkness. It's from the same root, um, but has different meanings. Zulmu zulumat yomul qiyama. So oppression or injustice will appear as darknesses. It's in the plural on the day of rising, and this hadith is in Muslim. Again, very, very eloquent, uh, very um, memorable, very easy to remember. Oh, another one I wanted to mention, and this is not mentioned by Qadi Iyad, but it is a dua that we shall have memorized. It is definitely a dua that you should have memorized, and especially uh, during Ramadan, which is coming up, inshallah. Um, this is a, a dua of the Prophet Wasallam that he would um, recite uh, during the last odd uh, nights of the last third of the month of Ramadan. Allahumma inna ka'afun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Uh, and this uh, is recorded in the hadith of Imam at tirmidhi So if you look at this hadith, again you have alliteration. It's, it's, it, it's a beautiful and seamless alteration of parts of speech. Allahumma inna ka'afun. Afun is an active participle. Tuhibbul afwa. You love, uh, so the tr by the way, the translation is, Oh Allah, you are the effacer, the one who erases or effaces the sin. And you love to efface. Um, so efface from me my sins. That's the meaning of the hadith. So Allahumma inna ka'afun, that's an active participle. Hibbul afwa, that's an infinitive noun. Fa'afu uh, anni, and now we have a verb. Right, and we don't call this an imperative, even though it has the same morphology as an as an imperative. The reason we don't call it a fi'l amr is because uh, one is speaking to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right, one is not giving a command to someone lower than oneself. One is one is speaking to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So this is called a fi'l talab. This is a a verb of request of of respectful request. But we have that seamless alteration, active participle, you know, ism fa'il, then the mustar, then the fi'l, all from the same root, hence the alliteration. We also have uh, parataxis, what's, what's known in, in English rhetoric is parataxis, which is also very common in Semitic rhetoric. Parataxis is when two words or a clause of some sort, two sentences are juxtaposed without using a coordinating conjunction. <clears throat> uh, so, Allahumma inna ka'afun tuhibbul afwa. Oh God, you are the effacer. You love effacing. Not therefore or and, then, thus, nothing like that. There's no coordinating conjunction. And the rhetorical effect of Parataxis is that it makes the words again sort of pop out, uh, makes it more impactful. The last one I'll mention here <coughs> from the hadith, inshallah, is the hadith in Bukhari. It's a famous hadith where the Prophet ﷺ, he said, In the fil jasadi mudqatan, indeed, in the body there is a lump of flesh. If it is sound then, or healthy, then the entire body is healthy. And if it is corrupt or unhealthy, then the entire, the entire body is unhealthy. Uh, indeed, it is the heart, the qalb. So here we have synonymic parallelism with mudra right and qalb it's explaining what is the mudra it is the qalb you have antithetic parallelism with the verb salahat and fasadat healthy unhealthy you also have something called concentric composition concentric composition also known as the chiasm in this short statement it's like a big circle it's really incredible. 
So the first line mirrors the fourth line. The fourth line explains the first line. What is the mudra? It is the heart. So these two lines uh, mirror each other, A and A prime. And then the second and third line, they also mirror each other. They have identical initial terms, ida, wa ida, and they have identical final terms, kulluhu, kulluhu. But they also have antithetical middle terms, uh, salahat and fasadat. Uh, so multiple level, levels of, 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 of rhetoric and composition and symmetry this statement is a is a nice circle circular composition called the chiasm. In fact, you have books written by non-Muslim scholars of the Quran. Um, Raymond Farron, um, Michelle Kuypers, and others. Uh, Raymond Farron in his book, he says that the Surah Al-Baqarah is one big chiasm. Al-Baqarah, 286 verses. Um, and this, in the center, usually a chiasm um, doesn't have to, but usually a chiasm will have a, a, a center, a focus. And he says that the center of Al-Baqarah is verses two, uh, 141 to 157, I believe. And right at the center of that center, you have, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى uh, the, that indeed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you a middle nation and that's actually verse 143 right in the middle of 286 of Baqarah the center of the chiasm according to Raymond Farron who's a professor at UC Berkeley or has his degree from PhD from Berkeley in your Eastern Studies but he wrote this incredible book on how Al-Baqarah is one big chiasm so if you think about this the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is not writing down the Quran and he's receiving these ayat. Um, and so, you know, how, how did he know where to put these different ayat to maintain this chiastic structure? You know, was he keeping all these ayat in his head and, you know, I have to put this here. And then what about, he's, so he's doing that with Baqarah. He's also doing that with Al-Ma'idah. Michel Kuyper says that Ma'ida has an incredible rhetorical structure. He wrote an entire book on Al-Ma'idah. It's called The Banquet just on Surah Al-Ma'idah and how it's an incredible ocean of symmetry. So he's doing that in his head and An-Nisa and Al-A'raf, all of these are just in his head and he's able to, he's, he's able to know where to put, you know, these ayat. And also with this, with this hadith about the heart, it's, it's a double entendre, right? So that the condition of the physical heart is generally a good indicator of overall health. I don't think any doctor would dispute that statement. A general indicator, if the heart is good, then overall health tends to be good, and vice versa. But also, also um, the condition of the spiritual heart, right? Uh, if it is healthy, then that's a good indicator that one's overall spirituality uh, is healthy as well. It's a very interesting study of these hadith, rhetorical analysis, Semitic rhetorical analysis of the statements of the Prophet Sallallahu <clears throat> And then he goes on to say that <clears throat> there's much more besides this that various groups of people have related about his words, conversations, speeches, supplications, <clears throat> comments, and contracts. There's no disagreement about the fact that in these things he occupied a station beyond compare. He obtained a preeminence in them which cannot be properly estimated. His unique sayings that no mouth had ever uttered before also have been compiled. No one can ever do them justice. His companion said to him, we do not find anyone more eloquent, more eloquent than you. He said, how could it be otherwise? The Quran was revealed on my tongue in a clear Arabic tongue. Another time he said, I am the most eloquent of the Arabs since I am from Quraysh and was brought up by the Bani Sa'd. So, um, uh, children who are raised in the, the desert um, they, because the Bedouin spoke the best Arabic, the most eloquent Arabic. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
not only has that incredible intellect, he has he has um, wahi descending upon him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, but he was also raised among the Bani Sa'ad, among the Bedouin, uh, and so the first Arabic that he was hearing uh, was extremely eloquent. This gave him the strength and purity of the desert, along with the eloquence of the expressions of the city and beauty of his words. This was all combined with the divine support which accompanies revelation, which no mortal can comprehend. <clears throat> Remember the hadith we quoted the last class we had a few weeks ago, Um, um Ma'bad. Remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr Siddiq, during the Hijrah, they stopped at a small village and this old woman was there and she met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Um Ma'bad, she said that the Prophet was sweet in speech, distinct, without using too few or too many words. It was as if his speech consisted of threaded pearls, he had a loud voice, which was very melodious, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So that is the uh, end of uh, section five. Um, looking forward, there's only three more classes uh, after this, and I do want to get to some of the rest of the chapter here. So I invite you to read sections uh, six through eleven. But I'm going to go to section 12 now. This is on page 54, section 12. So we're still in chapter 2, but it's section 12. And this is called His Forbearance, Long Suffering, and Pardon. So he begins by saying, Forbearance, Long Suffering, uh, and Pardoning, in spite of having the power to punish, and patient endurance and affliction are distinct from each other. So he's going to uh, define these terms. What is helm? What is forbearance? What, what is ihtimal? What is long-suffering? And what is sabr? And what is afwa? What is patience and pardoning? So he says that forbearance or helm is, is a state of dignified bearing and constancy despite provocation. Someone is being provoked right um and they and they they don't give in they stay dignified that's helm long suffering ihtimal is self restraint and resignation in the face of pains and injuries so while one is suffering sabr is similar to it but its meaning is slightly different he says as for pardoning it is refusing to hold something against uh someone else you know sort of forgiving uh and forgetting as it were of course, that's related to the hadith we quoted, Allahumma innaka afoon, that, oh Allah, indeed, you are the effacer, right? So, Allah is al-ghafir, and I mentioned this distinction in the past, al-ghafir, the one who forgives, al-ghaffar, really forgives, al-ghafur, these are both, they all mean, all three of these terms mean forgiveness, the latter two are very emphatic. Ghafara has a meaning to cover something. But afwa has a meaning to, to erase it completely, efface it, to take it out of existence. So he says, all of these qualities are part of the adab with, with which Allah endowed his prophet. He says, so Allah speaks to the prophet sallallahu in the Quran. He's going to quote Suratul Araf, verse 199. So chapter 7, verse 199. Khudil afwa. Hold tight to pardoning. Hold tight, hold fast to forgiving and forgetting. Wa'amur bil uruf and command to the correct, command to the good. Wa'arid anil jahirin and turn away from the ignorant. Turn away from them. So you can imagine what kind of ignorance just average believers hear um, on a daily basis, whether it's in person or on TV or on the internet. Um, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just ignore them, walk away from them, turn away from them. It is related that when this was revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Jibreel to interpret it for him. Jibreel told him, wait until I ask the one who knows. He left and came back and said to him, O Muhammad, Allah commands you to unite yourself with those who cut you off. <clears throat> it's very difficult for people. 
right? Someone cuts you off, someone severs ties with you. Um, it's very difficult to be the better person because you think, well, if I do that, then I've, I've admitted I'm wrong or something, or uh, I'm going to be humiliated in, in that person's eyes, whatever it may be. So this is very, very difficult. Unite yourself with those who cut you off and give to those who refuse to give to you and pardon those who are unjust to you. So this is a very difficult thing to do. And this is why the, the character of the Prophet is magnanimous, is, is exalted. <clears throat> because these are, these are very difficult for people who have ego issues, almost impossible for people who have ego issues, people that um, uh, are self-aggrandizing people who um, who think of themselves more important than they really are Megalo me megalomaniacal people Allah told him وَاسْبِرْ عَلَى مَا أصابك. be patient be steadfast in the face of what afflicts you right وَاسْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُو الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ In another ayah. These are quoted here by Qadi Iyad. Be steadfast as those of, as, as those of resolution among the messengers are steadfast. Right? The messengers of resolve. أُولُو الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ We mentioned those uh, earlier. These are the five great messengers of God, the great law-bearing or law-giving Messengers of God, uh, Nuh alayhi salam, and Ibrahim alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. That if you look at these five prophets, uh, they went through tremendous affliction and hardship, uh, and they stayed, they stayed patient and resolute. Um, I mean, if you look at Ibrahim alayhi salam, you know, his his father, um, although there's a difference of opinion, as we said, but uh, Azar, uh, probably his paternal uncle, uh, was an idolater. He, his father, biological father, his walid, probably died when he was very young, didn't have a father. Isa alayhi salam didn't have a father um, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him in a miraculous fashion. Musa alayhi salam did not know his biological father. The Prophet وسلم, was an orphan, um, never met his father at all. His mother died when he was six years old. His grandfather died when he was eight. And that's just starting out life. you know. Um, and then you think about what happened during the lives of these prophets. Um, so, you know, we're reminded of the hadith that if Allah loves the people, he will try them. Right? Um, and that the most severe of tribulations came to the prophets and those closest with them. Um, those are prophets. So, so if something happens to a prophet, some sort of musibah, it's not because a prophet has, has um, deliberately disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is inconceivable for a prophet to do that because a prophet has isma. There's a type of divine protection, uh, prevention from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so if there's some sort of musibah, it is to raise that prophet in degrees and also for that prophet to teach humanity how to react to such situations. But for non-prophets, for you and I, uh, if these things happen in our lives, it could be a type of punishment. So what we have to do is a type of muhasabah or self-audit and try to determine why are these things happening? And we need to make adjustments uh, in our lives. So generally, if something like that happens to you, you should take it as a, a type of um, uh, punishment uh, and, and correct, rectify your behavior um, and have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's a good thing. Punishment uh, is a way that, you, that he purifies us in, in, in a way to in a way of provoking toba and changing our lives, right? So it's, it's a subtle type of mercy, actually, uh, when you think about it. Um, and then when it happens to other people, we shouldn't assume that they're being punished, right? That we should treat people um, with, um, you know, have a good opinion of people. 
and assume that uh, that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is is raising their degrees. Um, and if it is a punishment, then uh, have a good opinion that this person will uh, recognize what they're doing, and they'll they'll make toba and 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 uh, correct their behavior. <laughs> then he quotes here. He says he's quoting here the uh, part of the ayah twenty two of Surah Nur. Wal yafu, wal yasfahu. So. Pardon them, let them pardon, let them pardon, and let them overlook, right? So, waliyafu, in, in, in Arabic, this lamb here is called lamu amr. So the verbs here are in the justice mood. So this has sort of the effect of a third-person imperative, right? That it's expected of us uh, to pardon and overlook. And then Allah says, uh, uh, do, do you not love that Allah would forgive you? Rahim. And Allah is forgiving, most forgiving, and and Rahim, merciful, compassionate, um, intimately loving. The one who is steadfast and forgives, that is part of the resolution of affairs. The results of this, and then Qadi Iyad, he says, the results of this of his forbearance and long suffering are quite evident. Every man with forbearance is known to have occasional lapses. The Prophet, however, was only increased in steadfastness steadfastness when the injury to him was great, and was only increased in forbearance when faced with an excess of importunate people. So uh, he would become more and more patient with people the more they quote annoyed him. Which is exactly the opposite of of what you would expect with someone. You know the hadith in Bukhari uh, when the man came and said, "Ausini, like advise me, counsel me." And the Prophet sallallahu said to him, "La taqdab, don't get angry." And the man, for whatever reason, he said, "Ausini, counsel me." And the Prophet said, "La taqdab," and then again, "Ausini, counsel me." And the uh, and the uh, relator of the hadith Abu Huraira, he said, "Faradda niraran," that he would he said this over and over and over again to the Prophet sallallahu and he said very calmly he would just respond, "La taqdab, don't get angry." Aisha said, "This is in uh, Bukhari and Muslim Abu Dawood, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was not given a choice between two matters, but that he chose the easier of the two, as long as it was not a wrong action. But if it was a wrong action, he would be the furthest of people from it. The Messenger of Allah did not take revenge for himself unless the honor, the hurma of Allah was violated. Then he would take revenge for the sake of Allah. Um, it is related that when the Prophet had his tooth broken and his face cut, on the day of Ghazwat Uhud, right? So uh, he had a ruptured lip, he, he chipped a tooth, he actually had a lacerated forehead and there was, um, uh, he sustained a, a cut to his, his, his cheek here uh, because the chain mail had penetrated uh, his cheek and there was blood flowing, just basically flowing down his face. Um, he says it was practically unbearable for the companions. Uh, they said, if only you would invoke a curse against them. Right? He replied, I was not sent to curse, but I was sent as a summoner and a mercy. And then he made a famous statement, Allahumma hdi qawmi, fa'innahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, guide my people, for they don't know. Allahumma hdi qawmi. So, um, in the books of Sirah, it actually says that the Prophet was uh, catching the blood with his hands. Uh, preventing the blood from striking the earth, and he was like absorbing the blood with his clothes. So the companion said, why are you doing that? And he said, if one drop of my blood should strike the earth, and then immediately uh, the wrath would descend upon the Quraysh, these people who are fighting against us. Uh, 
So for the Sahaba, that was a bit strange. I mean, we're fighting against them. Um, let the blood flow. And then they saw him a short time later with his hands raised, and they heard him say, Allah, and they thought, well, he, now he's going to curse them. And he said, Allahum Mahdi Qawmi, Allahum Mahdi Qawmi, the Innum La Ya'lamu. Uh, oh God, guide my people, for they don't know. You know, there's something similar attributed to Isa alayhi salam in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 23, we're told that when Isa alayhi salam, according to the Gospel of Luke, when he was being crucified, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, and I've studied the New Testament um, ex ex uh, extensively for years. I have a master's degree um, in New Testament. I uh, did my PhD dissertation on the Gospel of John. So I'm very familiar with, with the textual history of the New Testament. And I'll tell you this, that that passage I just quoted from Luke, that's chapter 23, verse 34, is now universally regarded as a fabrication to the text of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, that, uh, I mean, Isa alayhi salam, according to the dominant opinion of our ulama, was was nowhere near a cross to begin with. The Christians believed that he was crucified um, for various reasons. Um, although even in earliest Christianity, there was a difference of opinion, and this is historically documented. Uh, but um, in, in Luke's gospel, that statement that, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, is now universally accepted by New Testament textual critics as being a later fabrication to the text of, of the Gospel of Luke. <clears throat> it is related that Omar said to him, my mother, and another thing is, even if, even if Christians want to say, no, it's authentic, and he forgave them while he was being killed by them, well, that shows a strong type of character from, from Isa alayhi salam. Um, but compare that to the, the conquest of Mecca, and he's going to get into that actually, when the Prophet wasalam, is in a position of power to punish them. Uh, and he forgives them in the position of power. He doesn't forgive them while he's powerless, while he's being killed. Right? I mean, that's also... Uh, a, a demonstration of magnanimous character. Don't get me wrong, of course it is. But imagine being in a position of power over your enemies and forgiving them. Um, it's just um, a, a more exalted or higher level of magnanimity, I think. It is related from that Omar said to him, said to the Prophet, وسلم, My mother and father be your ransom, O Messenger of Allah. Nuh alayhi salam invoked a curse against his people when he said, Rabbi la tadar ala al-ardi min al-kafirin dayyara. My Lord, do not leave even one of the rejectors upon the earth. <clears throat> Had you invoked a curse like that against us, we would have been destroyed to the last man, he says. Your back had been trodden on, your face had been bloodied, and your tooth has been broken, and yet you have refused to utter anything but good. You have said, Oh Allah, forgive my people for they don't know. So there's a different version of the same statement of the Prophet وسلم, that he either said, Allahum Mahdi Qawmi or Allahum Idhfir Li Qawmi. Uh, oh Allah, guide my people or Allah, forgive my people <clears throat> for they don't know. <clears throat> so I remember one time years ago, and I'll end with this story. Years and years ago, we had a halakha in the masjid on Friday nights, and there was a Christian brother <coughs> who visited us. We had Christian brothers in, uh, come uh, um, uh, once in a while. You know, one of the one of the brothers, the Muslim brothers in the MSA. You know, he, some Christian guy would come, and he would invite him to the halakha. Anyway, so there's a Christian brother at the halakha, and he was there, and he was asking some um, some you know. Uh, difficult type questions and but he was very respectful um you know he was he uh, was uh uh he was trying not trying to disrespect us at all he was trying to get real clarification on issues most of the issues were theological things um and so uh 
uh, I remember in the, in the course of the discussion, um, a man came into the masjid and he listened for about two minutes and then he said, you know, these, these kofar, you know, they, uh, their hearts are sealed and their ears are deaf and their eyes are blind and this type of thing. And the, and the brother, the Christian brother, he was, he was, he was like, who is he talking about? Is he talking about me? And so we had to reassure the brother that, you know, he's, uh, his, that's his opinion. And we don't share that, that opinion. I mean, he was there for a few minutes and this was this man's judgment about this, this Christian guy. I mean, he had basically, you know, his, his threshold of helm was five, 10 minutes. And when you compare that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who's dealing with mushrikeen who are trying to kill him actively for 20 years and he doesn't give up on them. Right. Um, and Badi Ayyad, he actually uh, relates the story of uh, Abu Sufyan, whom the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued to address with respect um, after 20 years of fighting. And eventually Abu Sufyan became Muslim. And then the Prophet recognized his chieftaincy in Mecca and said, Man dakhla, man dakhla beta Abi Sufyan faqad amin. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan is safe. He had this announced during the conquest of Mecca. <clears throat> so that's the difference between our threshold, our limit of hilm or forbearance. You know, again, forbearance is, is being able to be dignified in the face of provocation. And the Prophet Wasallam's forbearance, when you have mushrikeen actively trying to kill him, uh, and have killed his companions and members of his bait, Ahlul Bayt, uh, and he continues uh, to uh, show them respect and, and dignity, and they become Muslim eventually. So we can take a lesson uh, from that, obviously. So I think at this point, uh, we'll end the class. So we got about halfway through section 12 here. So we'll continue with this section, inshallah ta'ala, next week. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. Uh, and we'll see you next time, inshallah ta'ala. Um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our next session. This is uh, session number eight of Qadi Iyad, Kitab al-Shifa. Part 1, Chapter 2. This is the middle of Section 12. And this is um, Section 12, which is called the Hilm, the Ihtimal, and the Afwa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Forbearance, the Long Suffering, and the Pardon. <coughs> Started that last time. So we are um, on page, in my translation here, which again is an older edition. Uh, this is um, page 55. Um, so right towards the bottom here. When a man said to the Prophet them, act fairly. So this is a hadith. There's multiple versions of this hadith in Muslim and Bukhari and Bayhaqi. When a man comes to the Prophet وسلم, and according to the commentators, this is um, after the Battle of Hunayn. <clears throat> and he said to the Prophet وسلم, la ta'dil. So be just, for indeed you are not just. Or in another version of the hadith, act fairly, this is, the, this is a division by which the face of God is not desired. And then, Qadi Iyad, he mentions here, the Prophet did not go further than making it clear to him how ignorant he was, admonishing and reminding him of what he had said to him. And then the Prophet said to him, uh, فمن يعدل إذا لم أعدل. Like, woe unto you, or confound you, who will be just if I am not just? <clears throat> and... <clears throat> I would fail and be lost if I did not act fairly. Then he restrained one of his companions who wanted to attack this man because the man's hypocrisy uh, had been manifested. So this man and his companions, 
um, well, the, the, one of the versions of the hadith continues with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he said, this man and his companions, they recite the Quran, but it does not go past their throats. Right? So, many of the ulama say here that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is prophesizing the Khawarij, the Karajites. Some of the commentators also mention that this man actually would be, would join the Khawarij. Of course, the Khawarij, as we know, was the first sectarian in the history of uh, Islam. The Khawarij were uh, very exclusivist. They were takfiris. Um, <clears throat> they considered anyone who did not believe exactly as they believed to be kuffar. And not only that, they would consider them to be, um, uh, you know, apostates. So they would, they would kill them and they would take their possessions. Oftentimes they would even kill their families. So the hadith is here teaching us about um, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, forbearance, even uh, under such circumstances where there's there's outright disrespect of him in public in front of the other companions, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Qadi Iyad, he says he did not go further than making it clear to him how ignorant he was, admonishing and reminding him. <clears throat> okay, so that's um, and then he continues Ghawrath ibn al Harith. Uh, while he says, whilst he and some of the other people were talking about the raid of that riqa' undertook to assassinate the Messenger of Allah, he found him sitting alone under a tree. So the Prophet ﷺ did not stop until he was standing over him. The Prophet ﷺ did not stop him until he was standing over him with an unsheathed sword in his hand. So this man is able to. Um, Enter into the Muslim camp, and he has a sword in his hand, and he walks up to the Prophet ﷺ, directly up to him. Uh, the Prophet here, according to this version of the Hadith, the Prophet sees him the whole time, did not stop him. He walks right up to, up to him, and the man says to the Prophet, "Tahaf, Do you are you afraid of me? Do you fear me?" And the Prophet said, "La, no." And then the man said, "Uh." So who's going to protect you from me? And the Prophet said, Allah. Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Wallahu ya'simuka minan nas. That God will protect you from the people. And then he continues, the sword fell from his hand and the Prophet grabbed it and said to him, وَمَنْ يَمْنِعُكَ مِنْ مِي And who is going to protect you from me? And then the man said, punish in the best manner. And so the Prophet left him and pardoned him. So this is clearly <clears throat> an attempted assassination, an attempted attempt, an attempted uh, attempt on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, attempted murder of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he pardoned him. And he came to his people, this man eventually came to his people. And he said, I've come to you. Uh, I have come to you from the best of people. And this uh, hadith is in uh, Bukhari and Muslim. One of the major reports about his pardoning and his pardoning the Jewess was his pardoning of the Jewess who had poisoned him with the sheep after she had confessed to the poisoning. This hadith is um, mentioned uh, also in Muslim, I believe. So there was a Jewess of Bani Nadir <coughs> who had uh, poisoned a sheep and offered and invited some of the companions, including the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, he, uh, the Prophet ate some, and another companion did, named Bishr, uh, Al-Bara ibn Bishr, I believe was his name, and uh, Al-Bara died from it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, he, uh, he said that the meat is telling me that it's been poisoned. And then, according to Qadi Iyad, he pardoned her. <clears throat> Qadi Iyad then mentions that he did not punish Labid, uh, who was um, apparently a, a black magician or sorcerer of some sort, who used magic sihr against him, although he was informed about it, and it was revealed to him with an explanation of what had happened. This is disputed um, because it seems to uh, contradict a verse in the Quran, Wallahu ya'asimu kamina nas, the verse I quoted earlier, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you from humanity. But the people of Sirah, they mentioned the story of Nabid. Allahu alam. Qadi Iyad, he mentions, nor did he punish Abdullah ibn Ubay and other hypocrites in spite of the seriousness of what they had done and said about him. And his wife Aisha. So Abdullah ibn Ubay was one of those who started the, the ifk, the lie or the buhtan, the slander, the calumny against our mother Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, wa ar radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, on the contrary, he said to the person who indicated uh, that one of them uh, should be killed, he said, no, let it not be said that Muhammad kills his companions. Right, so even though those were munafiqun, right, um, and, and they were munafiqun in, in, in the real sense of the word, right, they, they, they were pretending outright to be Muslims, um, you know, you have, there's an element of, of nifaq or hypocrisy uh, among, uh, among Muslims in general, but they're not, they're not absolute munafiqeen. Um, but these, Abdullah ibn Ubay and his, and his cohort, uh, these are literally fake Muslims. But the Prophet uh, did not want people to think that he was, he was killing believers or killing people or killing his companions. People would not believe the Muslims, if they said, well, these, these are munafiqeen, these are infiltrators, um, these are people who are trying to corrupt the ummah from within, these are people who are sowing seeds of sedition and treason and so on and so forth. It doesn't, the optics don't look good if, if you were to do that. Um, so it's important to, uh, to um, not do that. And I said, I was with the Prophet Wasallam when he was wearing a thick cloak of course, this is the famous story. A Bedouin came, uh, pulled him so violently by the edge of the cloak and made a mark on the side of his neck. So there was a, an inflammation on the side of the neck of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's a hadith that says, Man, man sakan al-bada, man sakan al-badiya jafa, jafa. That whoever, whoever dwells in the desert or lives in the desert becomes a little bit rough or gruff. Right, so this Bedouin, they're they're a little rough, and he came in and he he grabbed the cloak, um, the, the border of the cloak of the Prophet sallallahu and pulled him very violently, and uh, and Anas said, we can see inflammation on his neck. And he said, Muhammad, uh, let me load up these two camels of mine with the property of Allah that you have in your possession. Ya Muhammad, murli min malillahi ladi attack. Uh, and the Prophet was silent, and then he said, The property is a property of Allah, and I am his slave. Then he said, Shall I, shall I take retaliation from you, O Bedouin, for, for what you have done to me? And he said, No. Um, and the Prophet said, Why not? And the Bedouin said, Because you do not pay back an evil action with an evil action, or you don't pay back an evil with, for, uh, an, evil with an evil. And this is a great Quranic imperative, right? The famous ayah in the Quran, chapter 41, verse 34, uh, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> وَلَا تَسْتُوَ الْحَسَنَاتُ وَلَا سَيِّئَةَ Good and evil are not the same. اِدْفَعَ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Repel evil with something better. فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ And then you will see the one between him and you as enmity become as it were thy intimate companion. So don't repay evil with an evil or bad action uh, with a bad action. And the Prophet laughed and ordered that one camel be loaded up with barley and the other camel with dates. And the hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. So two camels, uh, the equivalent of that today is like two pickup trucks full of food. Right? <clears throat> Aisha said, I never saw the Prophet وسلم, ever take revenge for an injustice done to him as long as it was not regarding one of the orders of Allah which must be respected. He never struck anyone with his hand at all except when doing jihad in the way of Allah. He never hit a woman or a servant, Bukhari and Muslim. Of course, jihad here is in the context of, of, a, uh, of a military um, exposition, uh, expedition <clears throat> that is obviously called by the head of state and that is the Prophet Sallallahu or the, the head of a Muslim state. It's not vigilante justice or any faction or group that decides to, 
to declare a type of jihad. And, and Ali said something similar to this as well. But it's coming from the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Um, that the Prophet did not strike anything with his hand, uh, except in uh, a, a military expedition or a, a battle. Mm -hmm. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, if, even if you look at all the battles of the Prophet sallallahu all of them have a defensive component to them, a defensive component to them. And then Aisha continues, and she's specific, he did not hit a ghulam, he did not hit an imra'ah, a, a, um, a servant or a child, he did not hit a woman. <clears throat> a man was brought to him, and he was told, this man wanted to kill you. So continuing with the Kitab al-Shifa, the Prophet said, have no fear, even though you wanted to do this, you would not have uh, been given power over me. This hadith is in Tabarani, Imam Ahmad. Next here, uh, Qadi Iyad, he mentions the story of um, a Madani Jew named Zayd ibn Sa'na, who came to him demanding, came to the Prophet demanding that the Prophet repay him a debt. And he pulled his uh, garment from his shoulder, seized hold of him, and behaved very coarsely with the Prophet wasallam. And he said, uh, Man talib, you, you are procrastinating. And Umar was able to chase him off. And Umar spoke very harshly with him. The Prophet merely smiled. And the Prophet said, Umar, he, had need, he and I needed something else from you. Command me to repay well and command him to ask for his debt well. Right? And then he said, I still owe him three. And Umar commanded that he be paid. And he added a 20 sa'a, like 20 handfuls of barley, more since he had alarmed him or scared him. And that, according to Zaid's explanation, was the reason for him becoming Muslim. So Zaid later, he said that there were only two remaining signs of prophethood, which I had not yet recognized in the Prophet ﷺ or noticed. Forbearance, overcoming quick temperedness, and extreme ignorance, only increasing him in forbearance. So he said, I tested him for these, and I found him as described. So in other words, the Prophet ﷺ became angry very, very slowly, but when he did become angry, it was very tempered, and then it left him very quickly. And so those, those were the signs that, that this Madani Jew was, was looking for before he can accept the Prophet ﷺ as the Prophet. Qadi the Iyad, he goes on to say that the hadiths about his forbearance, patience, and pardon, uh, um, in spite of having power to punish, are too many to present. Those we have mentioned should be sufficient. They can be found in the Sahih collections and other reliable books transmitted by many paths of transmission. They deal with his patience in the face of Quraysh's harshness and the injury done to him in the Jahiliya and his endurance of great hardship, hardships at the hands of the Quraysh until Allah let him conquer them and gave him power over them. They did not doubt that they would be wiped out and their wealthy men killed, but he kept on pardoning and overlooking. Uh, he said, what do you say I have done to you? So now he's talking here about, and we've talked about this uh, a few times in the past, the conquest of Mecca, the Fath Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ comes in, back into Mecca uh, from Medina after he was forced um, to make hijrah, and the Quraysh kept uh, giving him no peace, multiple attacks, or raids on the oasis of Medina. The, the, um, the Quraysh had joined forces with the Bedouin tribes in the Najd. They were in uh, cahoots, as it were, with uh, the Munafiqeen uh, in Medina itself, as well as some elements of the Bani Israel, the Jewish tribes that were in Medina. So uh, eight, nine years of of uh, actively trying to basically eradicate the entire um, Muslim community in Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ, he eventually marches on Mecca, as we know, and he says to them, what do you think I should do to you? And they said, you're a good, generous brother and a good nephew. And he said, I will say, as my brother Yusuf said, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم. 
Yaghfirullahu lakum. That so here the Prophet وسلم, is quoting from the Quran. This is the statement in the Quran attributed to Yusuf alayhi salam. When Yusuf alayhi salam, obviously we know his story when he was um, thrown into the well by his brothers, um, his ten brothers really, uh, and uh, he was taken as a slave into Egypt, and then he eventually became uh, the vizier of the pharaoh, um, the minister of agriculture, according to some. And then, uh, and then his brothers come into Egypt from Canaan because there was a famine in Canaan. And then um, when he identifies himself, uh, he says to them, La alaykum al this, this day there is no blemish upon you. No reproach will be upon you. God has forgiven you. So the Prophet وسلم, he, he quotes this verse, which is in Surah Yusuf, ayah number 92, um, to the Quraysh during the conquest of Mecca. He says, go and you are free. And then he mentions here, Anas ibn Malik, he said that eight men from Tan'im came to the dawn prayer with the intention of, of killing the Prophet وسلم. They were seized and the Prophet set them free. And Allah revealed, Huwa alladhi kaffa idiyahum ankum. That this is the sabab nuzul of the ayah, chapter 48, verse 24. He is the one who restrained their hands from you. This hadith is in Muslim, Abu Dawood, and Tirmidhi, and others. When Abu Sufyan was brought to him after he had brought the Confederates against him, killed his uncle and companions, and made a punitive example of them, the Prophet forgave him and was gentle to him. He said, confound you, Abu Sufyan, isn't it high time that you knew that there is no God but Allah? And then Abu Sufyan said, my father and mother be your ransom, how forbearing and generous you are, maintaining ties of kinship. So the Prophet وسلم, did not give up on Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. And Abu Sufyan, remember, is the leader of the Meccans. And he uh, was the, uh, the, the leader of many um, military uh, campaigns against the Sahaba against the Prophet وسلم, against Medina. And the point here that Qadi Iyad is making is that uh, even towards, even after years and years of, of attempting to kill the Prophet وسلم, and killing many companions and many members of Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet وسلم, he still spoke to him in a way that was um, respectful, invited him to the faith, and this very much surprised Abu Sufyan, um, and eventually uh, he did become uh, Muslim. And then he says here, the Messenger of Allah was the slowest person to anger and the easiest to please. So that's the end of section 12. Now section 13, and these sections don't need a lot of, um, a lot of commentary. I think what Qadi Iyad mentions here really speaks for itself. So section 13, his generosity and liberality. As for generosity, benevolence, magnanimity, and liberality, they too have different meanings. Some people divide them into different branches. They say that benevolence or karam is to spend cheerfully on what is important and useful. They also call it courage and the opposite of baseness. Liberality is to forego what one is owed by others cheerfully, so foregoing a debt. It is the opposite of ill nature, and magnanimity is to spend easily and to avoid acquisition of what is not praised. It is the opposite of tight-fistedness. So he says here, the Prophet had no equal in these noble qualities, and no one exceeded him in them. All who knew him would describe him so. Ibn al-Munqadir heard Jabir ibn Abdullah say, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa was not asked for anything to which he said no or la. And Anas ibn Malik and Sahal ibn Sa'ad made similar reports. It's mentioned in Bukhari. And Anas ibn Malik, he said that the only time I heard the Prophet say la was when he was saying la ilaha illallah. Ibn Abbas said the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the most generous of people in giving gifts and the most generous of all in the month of Ramadan. When he met Jibril alayhi salam, 
he was more generous than even the wind which is sent forth. That's a famous hadith, you'll find it in many books uh, of hadith, but it comes from Bukhari and Muslim. Anna said that a man asked him for something, and he gave him all the sheep between two mountains. The man returned to his people and said, Become Muslim. Muhammad gives the, uh, gives the gift of a man who does not fear poverty. I think there's a problem here. There we go. I'm sorry about this lighting today. It's a little strange. We're probably going to end a little bit early this session. We'll probably just go another five minutes because I'm having some technical difficulties here. <clears throat> he continues. Let's see. He gave a hundred camels to more than one person. He gave Safwan a hundred, then a hundred, and then a hundred. This had been his character since before he was entrusted with the message. Waraka bin Nofo told him, you bear all and attain to what others are denied. So this was the attitude, <clears throat> the character, the, the khuluq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even before uh, the, the message has descended upon him. This is just how he was created as a generous person. He returned the captives of Hawazin, who numbered 6,000. <clears> he gave al Abbas so much gold that he could not carry it. 90,000 dirhams were brought to him, and he placed them on a mat, and then got up and distributed them. He did not turn away anyone who asked him until he had given them all away. <clears throat> a man came and asked him for something. The Prophet said, I do not have anything, but buy something on my account, and when I get the money, I will pay for it. So this hadith is in Tirmidhi. And Umar said, Allah has not obliged you to do what you're not able to do. The Prophet disliked that. So the man of the Ansar said, Messenger of Allah, spend and do not fear a lessening from the master of the throne. The Prophet smiled and the pleasure could be seen in his face. He said, I am commanded to this. <clears throat> it, is mentioned by, uh, it is mentioned that Mu'awwid ibn Afra said, I brought the Prophet, peace be upon him, a plate of fresh dates and cucumber, and he gave me a handful of jewelry and gold. So that's the end of, basically that's the end of section 13. So I think I'm going to stop at this point, because there's, like I said, we're having some technical difficulties here. Um, uh, I'd like to do sections, probably finish the, the chapter next time, inshallah. So we have three sessions left. No, we have two sessions left, session nine and session ten. So we will return, inshallah, next week, Wednesday at eight, and we'll make a push to finish um, chapter two by the end of the tenth, the tenth session, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah rahman rahim welcome to another session of uh, acquainting ourselves with the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam this is our ninth session out of ten. Next week uh, is our final session, inshallah. And we will end uh, next week, inshallah, in the blessed month of Ramadan. So I want to wish everyone um, an early Ramadan kareem. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a month of immense benefit um, for us and our families and for um, all of the Muslims around the world, as well as all of humanity. And inshallah ta'ala, the trials and tribulations that we're all going through um, due to the pandemic, inshallah, will be <clears throat> um, lightened upon us uh, by our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are uh, part one. This is chapter two. This uh, chapter is called The Prophet's Perfect Qualities of Character. And we're going to start here with section 17, inshallah ta'ala. So in my translation, Ba'aisha Buli, this is page 64. Section 17 is called Compassion and Mercy. 
And of course, this is very important uh, section uh, encompasses or epitomizes the khuluq, the character or ethics of the Prophet wasallam. As I mentioned in the past, we quote the famous hadith of Rahmah, um, um, that the most beneficent, the most compassionate, the most merciful shows mercy to those who show mercy. Show mercy to those on the earth and the one in heaven in no anthropomorphic sense will show you mercy. And we said that this is the hadith that children learn at five years old. This is the hadith that sets the foundation uh, for their uh, education. Islamic education for this is the hadith that first acquaints them with the Prophet ﷺ because rahmah is a great uh, virtue that we want to cultivate. So it begins as for compassion. Qadi Iyad rahimahumullah, he begins section 17. As for compassion, tenderness, and mercy to all creation, Allah said about him, and here he's quoting again, and the translation here says Surah Yunus 128, but this is at Tawbah. This is the very end of Surah Tawba, those two beautiful verses at the very end. لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ And he quoted these earlier, we quoted them in the past. Um, he quoted them there for a different reason. But these verses begin, Verily there has come unto you a messenger from among yourselves. And we said, أَنفُسِكُمْ is also read as أَنفَسِكُمْ from, from the most uh, noble among you. And the latter reading is considered a uh, shath reading, it's not multiply attested, so it's not recited in prayer. Um, it's not considered authentically Qur'an, because it could not be established through multiple channels, but has the strength of a hadith. And then he says, Azizun alayhi ma'anitum. So she translates, grievous to him is what you suffer, or it grieves him that you should perish, that you should suffer. So the him here refers to the Prophet wasallam. And then it says, Harisun um, alaykum. <clears throat> Harisun alaykum. Anxious for you or deeply concerned is he about you. Bil mu'minin ra'uf al rahim. Compassionate is he. Uh, merciful to the believers. Right? So that's at Tawbah verse 128. Uh, a beautiful uh, ayah um, describing. The, the, the character, the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Then Allah says, He says here, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ We only sent you as a mercy to all the worlds. And we said in previous sessions as well, that this is the quintessential prophetological verse in the Qur'an. This is the equivalent of our John 3.16. Remember we said that whenever a Christian wants to make a convert, um, <clears throat> very quickly, he wants to give him something like, for example, if he's on the, the BART train or the subway, something like that, and he wants to make some da'wah to a non-Christian, he'll quote John 3.16, which is basically uh, Christian uh, theology or Christology in a nutshell. I would say this is comparable to that, that this is a beautiful summation of the, the, the very essence of the Prophet Sallallahu And we said that Allah describes him with a noun, saying Rahmatan. We did not send you except as a mercy, not we did not send you except that you might show mercy. He doesn't use a verb. He describes the Prophet as Rahmatan. And a noun or a mustar, an ism in Arabic, describes the very nature of that thing, that that's who he is, that he is essentially mercy. Um, Rahmatin lil alameen. What is lil alameen? There's difference of opinion as to what lil alameen is. We did not send you as, uh, except as a mercy to the worlds. What is the worlds mean? Some of the Mufassirin say the meaning of this is kullu ma siwa Allah. Everything other than God. In other words, all of creation. That the Prophet wasallam is created, but he is sent as a mercy to the rest of creation because he's the best of creation. That he's better than, and this is by consensus. He's 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 greater than the Kaaba. He's he's greater than the Loh. He's he's better than the Arsh and the Kursi. He is the best of creation. He's better than Jannah. And then the question arises: If he's better than Jannah, then what's his reward? Right? If he's better than Jannah, what's his reward? How can he be rewarded with something that is inferior to him? And of course, the answer from the ulama is. 
well, he will get to Jannah, but he will be in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he will enjoy the highest type of union with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So his, his Jannah is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Jannah of Jannah is actually the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Jannah itself is honored by having the Prophet within itself. <clears throat> so another uh, um, opinion is that Al-Alami means jinn and ints, al-thaqalain, as they are called in the Quran, the two weighty things, jinn and ints. So you think about the four elements, human beings are made of the two elements, water and, and earth, if you will. And then you have our counterpart, the jinn, wind and fire, right? So they can see us, but we can't necessarily see them. But we believe in their, in their existence. And we believe in the uh, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he tells us about the jinn. So some uh, modern hermeneutes of the Qur'an that want to sort of um, read the Qur'an through the lens of modern science, there's a few things you can do with this, but some people take it to extreme measures and say, well, the jinn are actually uh, microbes or something like that. Um, we'll leave these uh, weird opinions of some of the modernists uh, today. And uh, say, Salakallahu al Adim, Salakal Rasulullah. Allah and His Messenger know best, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as well, as well as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has described uh, the jinn in numerous uh, ahadith. And that the jinn not only have sentience, right, like all um, living things, sentience, the Latin word meaning that they feel things. They, they can sense certain things, right? So even animals have sentience. They feel pleasure, they feel pain, they have senses. But here, al-alamin means uh, the sentient as well as the sapiential beings, sapiens, which means wisdom or aql, right? So here, al-alamin, lil-alamin, according to some of the exegetes, means jinn and ints, in other words, those created entities that not only have sentience, but have sapience, they have intellect. And that the revelation, the wahi, any wahi, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always understood through the intellect. The intellect is primary. That's why if, if, if somebody receives the Qur'an and they don't have sound intellect, they're not responsible to believe in the Qur'an because you need an intellect to understand the Quran. So the Prophet وسلم, then is the bridge, if you will, between a basic awareness of God, a basic awareness of the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which many philosophers and theologians argue is something that is innate, something that is natural to the human being, any human being, um, uh, using their intellect, using their mind, will come naturally to the conclusion that there is a singular creator. Uh, to everything. Um, so the Prophet then is a bridge between this uh, this basic natural awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every human being possesses and a deep gnosis, a deep sort of intimate knowledge or what we call ma'rifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet is a bridge between that because he brings us the revelation, that he is the means of the revelation. So in this sense, the Prophet ﷺ is rahmatin lil alameen because he's giving us the wahi, the kitabullah. He's teaching us by example how to have a deep, intimate ma'rifah, gnosis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as we said, ma'rifah leads to mahabbah, to unconditional love. And when, when one has unconditional love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then one is saved, inshallah ta'ala, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if one has mistakes in aqidah. Now we try our best to correct our aqidah, and this is something that is important and we shouldn't downplay. But ultimately, uh, we may say things, we may uh, uh, do certain practices that are actually counter uh, to uh, our tradition out of ignorance, and that's why we... Um, we ask, we make toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask Allah to forgive our shortcomings. Uh, and ultimately, it is our love of Allah and His Messenger uh, that will save us. There's a famous hadith of a man who, um, who was a sinner and he died. But before he died, he instructed his 
two sons by saying that when I die, uh, cremate my body and then climb to the highest mountaintop you can find and scatter my ashes to the wind. And his son said, uh, why would we do that? And he said, I don't want Allah to be able to uh, reconstruct my body on the Yom al uh, um so that I won't have to stand judgment. Now, that is an incorrect belief. If you believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not have the power to reconstruct your body, even after it's been um, uh, incinerated and scattered to the wind, then that's kufr. That's technically uh, infidelity. Now, the hadith continues that uh, this man on the Yom al Qiyamah, he was reassembled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al Qadir, He is omnipotent. Inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. So he reconstructed this man. And when he asked, and Allah knows best, this is for our own edification. Allah is not asking a question because he doesn't know something. Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is certainly omniscient. But when he asked the man, why did you do that? Why did you instruct your sons to do that? He said, I was ashamed. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave the man, even though he had this error in his, in his aqidah. So this is something that uh, it's, it's obviously important for us as Muslims to understand uh, theology at a deep level. Um, but we have to also understand that by and large, the awam, um, you know, the masses of people, this is not something that's a priority for them. And we should keep the religion quite simple. And Islam is, is, is a simple religion, not, not a, a religion for simple-minded people. There's a difference here. But Islam has a, has a basic creed. And salvation in Islam is not a difficult thing. We'll get in more into that uh, uh, later. But the essence of our theology is al-ikhlas. And this is just a few verses long. And this is what we should teach people. And um, unless you're going to be, you know, a discursive theologian or a polemicist or something like that, or if you just simply have an interest in studying theology at a deep level, which is certainly uh, possible, um, you don't need to get into the debates of the relationship between the that of Allah, the essence of Allah, and his sifat, and his attributes, and, and the kalam of Allah, uncreated or created. Um, really, this, these topics don't enter, into, don't enter into the discourse of the vast, vast majority of human beings. And um, the ulama, as ulama, we should know, and as professors, we should know that, we should know that um, sometimes that we delve into these things, uh, they could cause actually more confusion amongst the people. Now we should stick to broad-based principles. Qul uh, Allahu Ahad, say God is one, Allahu Samad, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, God is independent, he did not beget, nor was he begotten, meaning he's not somehow caused uh, by something, he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't make an effect that's equal to him. Walam yakun lahu kufu an ahad. There's nothing comparable unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as we said, the Prophet ﷺ then is that bridge between the basic knowledge of God, awareness of God, that is innate with, within all human beings, just from the intellect, the mind, and a deep ma'rifa, intimate knowledge leading to mahabba, leading to unconditional love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's nurun ala nur, according to Imam al-Razi and others when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says nurun ala nur, in Ayatul Nur, chapter 24, verse 35, I believe, the meaning of this is naql and aql, right? Revelation and intellect working together. Wallahu alam. He continues here, Qadi Iyad, he says, part of his excellence is that Allah gave him two of his own names. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam two of his own names, saying, bil mu'minina ra'ufur rahim. And the ulama specify here, many of the mufassirin, they say, this part of the ayah, uh, is is khas, it's, it's for the believers, because that's what it says, but before that, the Prophet's concern, حَرِيثٌ عَلَيْكُمْ What is it? لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولُ مَنْ فِزُكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِمَ عَنِيتُمْ حَرِيثٌ عَلَيْكُمْ It grieves him that you should perish, deeply concerned is he about you. This is more universal, this is a amma, this is for all of humanity, this is all for jinn, for all of jinn and ins, but then بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَعُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ This is for the 
believers. This is a special type of concern. Merciful and compassionate is he to the believers. And these are two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is Ar-Ra'uf, he's Ar-Rahim. Now notice with Allah, there's definite articles. He is the most compassionate, he is the most merciful. The Prophet sallallahu however, is a reflection of these divine names at a human level, right? So we should all try to emulate, as it were, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine qualities. doesn't make us divine. Uh, it makes us... Uh, um, uh, pious believers right? this is a hadith there's weakness in the hadith but the ulama quoted adorn yourselves with the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we mentioned this before in the past as well many many ulama in, in, including Imam al-Suyuti and Ibn Ajiba and Imam al-Ghazali they've written commentaries on the asma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the, the, the glorious majestic names uh, the majestic and beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they said that with all of these names there's a there's a there's a human element that we can uh, there's not necessarily not a human element there's a there's a there's a um, there's a uh, understanding of these names that we can appropriate into our lives at a human level right so if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ar-Rahman and he is ar-Rahim you know, the infinitely merciful, the infinitely loving and compassionate, we can also be people of compassion, mercy, and love uh, in a limited hu limited human sense, in that, in that way, mirroring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> it is related that the Prophet sallallahu said, <clears throat> none of you should come to me with anything about my companions, for I do not want to go out to you except with a clear heart. So the hadith is in uh, Abu Dawood and At-Tirmidhi. That the Prophet sallallahu he wanted us to formulate, that, sorry, he wanted him, uh, he wanted to formulate his own opinions uh, about people, right? That he didn't like this, what's known as qila wa qala, he said, she said, what we would call sort of gossip or hearsay. The Prophet Sallallahu did not want to hear things about people without going out and meeting them first and formulating his own uh, his own ideas about the person. Part of his compassion, Qadi Iyad continues, part of his compassion towards his community was that he made things easy for them. He disliked doing things, he disliked doing certain things out of the fear that they would become obligatory for them. He said, uh, if I had not been compassionate to my community, I would have commanded them to use the siwak, right, the tooth stick, the toothbrush, if you will, every time they did wudu. The hadith is in Bukhari uh, and Muslim. So what he's saying here is that the Prophet wasallam would sometimes leave certain practices on occasion because he knew that if he, that if he was unwaveringly consistent with those practices, and future jurists, Muslim jurists, the, the jurists, the fuqaha, uh, would have considered them as farm, as obligatory. So he wasn't totally consistent in those practices. And this is from the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu So one of the things is the, the use of the siwak or the, or the tooth stick, that he would use it quite often, but not always. Uh, another thing, Ramadan, that's, that's mentioned here by Qadi Iyad, Ramadan prayers, the tarawih, sometimes he would do those uh, prayers, perform those prayers in his house and sometimes in the masjid, that he didn't fast every single day. Uh, his dislike of entering the Kaaba itself uh, during the pilgrimage, lest it become obligatory and become a hardship for the Ummah. That he would shorten the prayer, Qadi Iyad mentions, if he heard a child crying. And that's a practice that he would do to make things easier uh, for us. Aisha said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi was never given a choice between two things, but that he chose the easier of the two, right? And this goes back to the hadith we quoted, the beautiful hadith we quoted a couple of weeks ago. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru wa bashiru wa la tu'nafiru. And we looked at some of the rhetorical structure, the parallel structure of this hadith and some other hadith as well, and how they're, they're in, incredibly composed, beautifully and exquisitely composed. Um, in, in their syntax and uh, their rhetorical power. So this hadith, the translation is something like make things easy for people and don't make them difficult and give people glad tidings and don't scare people, right? Don't use a scare tactic. 
give people glad tidings. It doesn't mean, you know, not to tell people the truth. And, you know, there's, there's certainly things that we should be concerned about. Uh, the punishment in the grave and the Yom Al-Qiyamah, right? The Adab Al-Qabr and the Hisab on the Yom Al-Qiyamah and, and the fear of Jahannam and things like that. That's true. Um, but generally, we should be giving people glad tidings because ultimately, uh, the, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a means of salvation for people. And salvation for, uh, for um, our understanding of salvation is that is that it never ends. Khalidina fiha abada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran about the denizens of paradise, about Jannah, that they will eternally abide or perpetually, probably a better translation, perpetually abide therein because nothing is nothing is intrinsically eternal. Nothing has al qidam al-dhati except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he gives Jannah the, which is a created thing, the quality of perpetuity or immortality. So he will also give that quality, inshallah ta'ala, to our souls in Jannah so that we will continue in perpetuity to live in Jannah by the permission uh, and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> so he was easygoing, right? Sahalul khuluq, as his, as his companions uh, have uh, described him, easygoing. Uh, disposition. Ibn Mas'ud said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was careful when he admonished us, fearing he would tire us. And the hadith is Muslim and Bukhari, uh, according to the translator here. Admonish means to teach or to advise or to warn, right? That he did not want to overwhelm his uh, students, the Sahaba. And this is a mark of a great teacher. A great teacher is very patient. A great teacher um, will knows how to build upon uh, um, previous lessons. Um, doesn't get to the conclusion of things or to the answer of questions. Even if there if there are students in the class that are asking questions uh, that are not related completely to the topic, or um, if you know that the professor is. Or teacher is speaking about very basic things, introductory things, and there's a student who wants to know advanced things, then the teacher knows not to answer the questions at that time. It doesn't mean that the teacher doesn't know the answer. It just means that it's not beneficial at that particular time to reveal the answer. And this is, again, part of the wisdom uh, of being a, a teacher. So the Prophet وسلم, he was very careful about about um, tiring out certain the, the, the Sahaba um, when he was admonishing or teaching them. He would give them things and dosages, if you will, so he can digest them, think about things, and then he'd give them more. It was really an art form. Teaching is, is not an easy thing, and it must be done uh, very carefully. All right? And the, the Greek word, obviously, for teaching a child is pedagogy. Pais, meaning child, and Ago in Greek meaning to lead, so you're leading a child, right? Um, so it's, it's a very, very delicate process, especially if they're children, because those, those are things that children don't forget and you're setting a strong foundation. He says here, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was riding an unruly camel, which was recalcitrant, and, and she started to hit it repeatedly. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you must have compassion. The hadith is in Bayhaqi, right? So here he's talking about a camel, an animal, right? Rahmati lil alameen. So he is a mercy to, um, to all the worlds, including the, the animal kingdom. That the Prophet ﷺ said in another hadith, لا تتخذوا um, that don't take uh, the backs of your riding beasts, whatever they are, uh, horses or camels, don't take them as being pulpits. In other words, don't just sit on your animal and start, uh, you know, pontificating and giving these long sermons because that's, that tires out the animal. That's, that's, um, that's, that's putting undue stress on the animal. So here he's talking about uh, animal rights. He censured the Sahaba ones because they burnt an anthill. He censured the Sahaba ones because they took eggs from a mother bird and the mother bird started flapping its wings and he said, return these eggs uh, to the mother bird. So he did not approve 
of of animal abuse. This doesn't mean that we should all be vegans and you know really interesting some um, some modern people how uh, they prioritize certain things. I mean, you know, it seems like the intention is in the right place, but then you think about the, the contradictions of some of their positions. You have people that go into, you know, restaurants and, and, and uh, start yelling at people because they're eating eggs and saying, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a, a, a life and you're, you're eating something that's alive and it had a name. But some of these people are also completely pro-abortion uh, even in the third trimester, I mean, it is very, very strange, you know, save the chicken, save the whale, save the trees, but kill the babies because my body by choice, right? I have bodily autonomy. So this is a, it's very interesting. I and mean, it's really a worship of the nuffs, right? They couldn't control themselves. They, they act irresponsibly. They do things, they fornicate, and then they get pregnant and then they want to justify to themselves um, that, uh, this is this is a, a moral thing I'm doing because it's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. But they know deep down inside that uh, there's certainly the, the conscience right, uh, is 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 bothering them, and you can you can and this is something that you can uh, see with with their testimonials. And some of them are not bothered, and you and you wonder about their humanity. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. so the prophet says, Aisha here you must have compassion." <clears throat> that's the end of section uh, 18 sorry 17 was brought to the prophet and sorry this 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 section is called integrity probity and contracts and maintaining ties of kinship and in the highlights of the chapter of the sections uh, before um uh the end of class next week and I said, once uh, when a gift was brought to the Prophet Sallallahu he said, take it to the house of such and such a woman. She was a friend of Khadija. Uh, she, uh, she loved Khadija. And Aisha said, I was never jealous of any woman the way I was jealous of Khadija when I heard him mention her. If he sacrificed a sheep, he would send it to her friends. Her sister, Hala, Hala bin to Khawailid, asked for permission to enter, and he was happy to see her. A woman came to him, and he received her with kindliness, and asked after her very considerately. When she left, he said, she used to come to us when Khadija was with us. Maintaining ties is a part of belief, and the hadith is in uh, Bukhari. So the Prophet Sallallahu first wife, Khadija, passed away. Um, she was his first disciple. She passed away in the Meccan period. And Aisha was saying that, that even as late as the Medinan period, the Prophet ﷺ would maintain uh, ties with uh, relatives of Khadija uh, as well as friends of Khadija. He would continue to uh, honor them um, um, and show them uh, kindness. The Prophet used to carry Umama, his granddaughter by Zainab, mm -hmm. on his shoulders. When he prostrated, he would put her down. When he stood up, he picked her up. <clears throat> so this also reminds me of the famous story where the Prophet Sallallahu was standing on the pulpit and he was giving a khutbah on Jum'ah and his very young grandson, Imam al Hussein, following his grandfather's voice, wandered into the masjid. And the Prophet Sallallahu descended the minbar and picked up his grandson and hugged him and went and then reascended the, the pulpit and finished his khutbah while holding Imam al Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, in his arms. Um, this is a testament to the merciful and, and tender nature of the Prophet um, with, uh, with his, you know, not only his wives, his companions, not only with animals, uh, but also with, uh, with children. And as we've spoken about in the past, the Prophet وسلم, he continued to show good character to even his enemies that were trying to attack him and this is what was so astounding to abu sufyan ibn harb who um just before the conquest of mecca became muslim and uh he was just absolutely smitten that the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh um continued to speak to him with respect um and and then he said to him uh, you know may my parents be your ransom you you still speak to me with respect after all these years where i've uh 
try where I've tried to you know kill you and and um, and led you know these military campaigns against you and have killed many of your uh, companions in battle, but the Prophet Sallallahu did not give up even on his uh, worst of enemies. He continued to show them good character. And there's a lesson in there uh, for us. Again, this is a difficult thing to do, but he is our ideal, and we should try to strive for this type of perfection. So the excuse of, well, that's the Prophet, and I just can't do that. He's just so great. He's still a human being. I mean, the Prophet Wasallam. he still got angry. He, he became depressed at times. And, you know, when he met Wahshi, the man who killed his beloved uncle, Hamza, uh, he, the Prophet Wasallam. he just, he, he, he became very, very angry. And he said, man, never see your face uh, again. I mean, that's, that's a human being, right? Um, and then eventually um, he welcomed Wahshi and, and um, and uh, he he showed him kindness and, and and mercy as well. So using this excuse of well that's the prophet and he's perfect and he's immaculate and who am I I'm nothing. Uh, the Prophet sallallahu is also a human being and many of his um, many of his um, uh, reactions to certain situations are 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 very similar to what any human being do uh, initially, um, but. Uh, if we see how he uh, treats situations, um, eventually, uh, in his wisdom behind dealing with certain problems in the society, even within his own household, uh, that's certainly something that we can emulate and at, at a certain level and strive towards this uh, perfection. You're never going to hit perfection. We're not going to reach the khuluq of the Prophet wasallam, but that's not the point. We strive towards it. It's like an old football coach named Bill Walsh, um, who was the coach of the San Francisco 49ers in the 1980s when the 49ers were a dynasty, and um, he used to tell his quarterback, uh, Joe Montana, he would say to him, when you throw the ball to a receiver, aim 12 inches right in front of the numbers, and anything other than that is imperfect, and you've missed the target. Now, 12 inches in front of the numbers, can you imagine that on a 40-yard pass? Because that was perfection. You aim towards perfection, um, and you're obviously going to come short, but you you might come close to it. Um, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is is our perfect role model, and we should try our best to emulate his character and not make excuses. And we fall short. We fall short. We make toba, but we we keep trying. Now he said, Abu Qatada said, a delegation from the Negus, that's the king of Abyssinia, Najashi, arrived and the prophet got up to serve them. His companion said, let us do it for you. And he said, they were generous and honored my companions. So I will do the same for them, al Haqi. So the prophet uh, was himself uh, serving the people, right? That he was doing that himself. In a hadith of Khadija, she told him, May Allah, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may Allah bless him and grant him peace. So Khadija says to the Prophet, Rejoice by Allah, Allah will never bring you grief. You maintain connections with kinsfolk. You bear all and you give help to those who are in need. You're hospitable to the guests and you help people to get what is their due. Um, and uh, this was after the the um, the context of this statement of Khadija is after the descent of the initial wahi on um, later to Qadr in Mecca. So the Prophet sallam, this is something else that's astonishing about the Prophet sallam, again, showing his humanity that he didn't know initially what had happened to him. He's Nabi al-Ummi. He doesn't have this formal education in religion. He's not familiar with Ahl al-Kitab and their beliefs necessarily. Uh, he's an unlettered prophet. And he has this experience in this cave, um, and he is very, very sincere, um, in thinking that maybe something bad has happened to him. Maybe he's been possessed by a jinn or something uh, like that. This is a very honest reaction, and this is something that's um, pointed out. Uh, for example, this book by Leslie Hazelton. It's a very good book she wrote, non-Muslim as far as I know. She wrote on the psychology of the Prophet Sallallahu saying that this reaction shows the great sincerity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, 
that a, a charlatan of some sort would not have this type of initial reaction if someone's trying to pull the wool over your eyes and claim to be a prophet when they're not. Um, they, they would come down the mountain with their chest out in the air and proclaiming that, he, that you know, I am a prophet and, uh, and you must obey me. And, but the prophet's reaction was one of distress. So he went to his wife Khadija al Kubra, radiallahu ta'ala anha, his wife, and it was Khadija who reassured him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not humiliate you uh, by this type of demonic possession or mental illness or something. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, knows, certainly knows, that you maintain ties of kinship, you're good to the orphans. Uh, that you're good to the guests, that you provide things to people who need things. But here's the thing also is that she's no expert in matters of religion. So what do they do? They go to an alim, and this is the proper method. All right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of ad dhikr Ask the people of ad dhikr here probably means revelation, revelation in general or the Qur'an in particular, of course the Qur'an is a revelation, but ask the people of revelation if you don't know, right? So she's not an alima, but Waraqa bin Nawfal, her cousin, a Christian scribe, he was an alim. So they go to Waraqa, and the Prophet ﷺ recounts what had happened in the cave. And Waraqa, he says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكَ النَّمُوسُ الْأَكْبَرُ Musa alayhi salam. This is his judgment about as to what happened to the Prophet in the cave. Indeed, the great Namus, the great Nomos, Nomos is the Greek word for Sharia or sacred law. The great law has come to you. Others say Nomos or Namus is that others say that Namus here is actually the Arabic of Penuma, which means the great spirit has come to you, the spirit of inspiration just as it came to Musa alayhi salam, right? And of course, we have the famous prophecy of Deuteronomy 18.18 18, that a prophet will come um, from the brethren of the Israelites who will be similar to Musa alayhi salam. Deuteronomy 18, verse 18. Now, that sounds like a, a valid part of the Torah. Wallahu uh, alam. We cannot confirm nor deny, but certainly there is a prophecy in the Torah that sounds like it finds its fulfillment uh, with the Prophet ﷺ. So that's the end of section 18. Now section 19 is called his humility. In spite of his high position and exalted rank, he was extremely humble and not in the least proud, says Qadi Iyad. There is proof enough of that in the fact that he was given a choice between being a king prophet and a slave prophet. And he chose to be a slave prophet. Right? The Prophet ﷺ lived in a state of self-imposed poverty, right? He could have been a king prophet, like Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, huge palaces, servants, right? But he chose to be a slave prophet uh, because the majority of his people, all of his people were living, well, actually most of his people were not, were not affluent people. And he was a man of the people, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So he lived among his people. He was a man amongst men. When he did that, Israfil said to him, Allah has been generous to you because of your humility to him. You are the master of the children of Adam on the day of rising, and the first for whom the earth will open up on the day of rising, and the first to intercede, Abu Nu'im. So the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, مَنْ تَوَادَ عَلِ اللَّهِ رَفَعَهُ اللَّهِ وَمَنْ تَكَبَّرَ وَدَعَهُ اللَّهِ Remember this hadith. Uh, it's a beautiful hadith uh, that is has incredibly incredible ethical uh, import uh, that whoever humbles themselves before God, tawada'a, before God, rafa'ahullah, Allah will raise whoever humbles themselves before God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise the rank. Woman takabara. And whoever takabara, right, this form five verb the meaning patterns of form five uh, is, is to consider, it's considerative. Whoever considers oneself um, to be 
to be kabir, to be great, to be high and mighty, Allah Allah will debase and humiliate. And we find uh, an echo of this statement as well in the New Testament Gospels and the synoptic tradition. Uh, that whoever is whoever is is low will be made high. Whoever is uh, high will be made low. This type of thing. Have mercy. Have have ability with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will raise your rank. But if you deem yourself big and high and mighty, uh, then Allah Subhanahu wa Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will debase and humiliate you. And we see that with people like. Uh, Nimrud, very interestingly, uh, Nimrod, which according to the ulama was the first man ever to claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first one who ever made a claim to deity was this king of Babylon at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And according to the exodus, uh, Allah sent his servant a mosquito or a gnat or something that flew up his nose and bit him. And the pain was so intense that Nimrod would have his servants come into the room and, and beat him over the head with their shoes as a way of sort of dulling the pain, you know, going into sort of a, a, a daze. And then the pain one day was so intense that he ordered his servants to beat him harder and harder until they beat him to death. This is the end of the man who claimed to be God, right? Allah sent a tiny servant. If you look at the world today, as one of our teachers said recently in an amazing talk, that um, the king of the world today is this coronavirus, this thing that you can't even see. A servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is in everything is is in, in, in service and a servant subservient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, that is just um, you know, it's it's put us all on time out, as it were. Uh, we have to think deeply about these things: the state of the human, um, uh, the, the state of the human mind, the state of the human heart. When it comes to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, um, what's happening in the world? Um, what's happening with uh, with religion, with faith? Um, um, I mean, something like this should 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 uh, provoke deep contemplation within ourselves as to why these things are happening and how we can improve, improve ourselves. <clears throat> and that's, you know, the Prophet ﷺ was a very, very deeply reflective person. And the ulama and the awliya and the sahaba were very deeply reflective. And they were also very um, uh, self-censuring, um, that they were constantly trying to work on their faults. They, they were not people that were satisfied with themselves and they would turn the finger inwards. And if something would happen in their lives, a trial or tribulation of some sort, um, they, they would uh, take it as a, 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 a means by which they can make toba and, and in, improve their character and improve uh, their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and come back into the good graces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, when things like this happen to a prophet, it's never a type of punishment. The prophets are not punished because they can't perform conscious sin. It's always a way of raising their rank. But even with believers, it could also be a means of raising our rank. Now, it could initially be a type of punishment, right? But then we recognize that and we try to rectify our behavior. And by doing that, making tawbah and making that rectification, it'll be a means, inshallah ta'ala, by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise our ranks uh, as well. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said the affair of the mu'min is always good. It's always good. Even if there's some sort of disaster or trial or tribulation, we understand why uh, things like that happen. We live in the dunya, but we try to learn from those things. And these types of things should provoke a type of toba and return. You know, toba, taba means to turn, to reorient ourselves towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, everything is good for us. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am a slave. I eat as a slave eats, and I sit as a slave sits. All right? And um, there's a story mentioned that he was sitting on his knees one time, and he was eating something, and a Jewish woman passed by him, and she started to mock him and say, look at your prophet. He, he eats like a slave. I mean, this is how he's sitting on the ground eating something. And the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allah, to be abd, am I not a slave? Right? Am I not a slave? Of course, he's a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and he is um, he is a, a servant that has this beautiful tawadur, this beautiful humility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not doing these things out of ostentation. And that's another thing we should check our intentions when we do certain things. You know, that um, why are we doing things? Is it, is, it, is, it simply, is it simply for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or are there other things that are operating within us? So we have to really take ourselves to a task and, and be honest with ourselves. Very difficult for us to be honest with ourselves. There's a, uh, a saying of uh, Ibn Ata'illah Sikandari, a very beautiful saying that I'll mention here. It's not mentioned here by Qadi Iyad, but uh, Ibn Ata'illah, he said, an act of sin that leads to humility, right, tawadu and brokenness, intisar, right, brokenness, what Catholics would call contrition. It's a beautiful word, contrition, to be contrite. Is one of the um, the prerequisites of, of toba of repentance and Catholicism is to feel a sense of brokenness. The word contrition means to be broken. A sin, uh, an act of sin that leads to humility and brokenness before God, is better than a good act that leads to arrogance. It's better than a good act that leads to kibr, to arrogance. And there was actually a debate amongst the ulama as to which state is better. If you believe this or not. Which, which state is better, uh, the state of a person who never sinned or the state of someone who did sin but made toba? right? Now, ultimately, they said the former because that's the, that's the, um, that's the, uh, the, the way of the prophets, that they don't sin consciously. But the fact that there was a debate on this issue, it's quite telling that... that um, that human beings sin by nature. And the ulama say here, is, 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 needs a nuanced meaning there that it's, it's not including the, the prophets. All of the children of Adam are sinners and the best of sinners um, uh, are, are those who make toba, tawabun, those who reorient themselves back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of my teachers said there are two kinds of people uh, in the world. The one who enters a room and says, Salam Alaikum to the people in the room. And when they don't answer him, he thinks to himself, what's wrong with these people that they're not answering my Salam? That's one type of human being. Another type of human being is the person who enters into a room and says, Salam Alaikum, and the people don't answer him. And then he thinks to himself, what is wrong with me? that these people are not answering my salam. What did I do? Did I wrong them? What, did I break decorum of some sort? Uh, did I show bad adab of some sort? Right? Two kinds of people. The prophet used to ride a donkey and would have someone ride behind him on it. He would visit the very poor and sit with the poor. Again, these very difficult things to do. You know, we, we read these things in books and and we think, well, I, you know, how many times have I sat with the poor? And um, We should strive to do these things. He answered the invitation of the slave and sat among his companions, mixing with them. He would sit down among whichever part of the company he came to so that, you know, if you walked into a room and the prophet was there, you, you wouldn't even know which one was the prophet, you know. It's not like the, the one sitting on the throne or the pulpit or the, you know, the the... The, the fancy green cushion or something like that. He was just, he was amongst the people. He's amongst the men. He was a man among the men, uh, as I said. In a hadith written by, by Umar, the Prophet said, Do not lavish praise on me as the Christians lavish praise on the son of Maryam, alayhi wasalam. So this hadith is in Bukhari. It's mentioned by Imam Tirmidhi in the Shema'il, uh, I believe, as well, that uh, don't. You know, the translation says lavish praise on me, but really flatter me in terms in which Isa alayhi salam, uh, kama, in terms of, or similar, or just as Isa alayhi salam, uh, was flattered or given titles that he did not merit or that breached the um, parameters of acceptable theology. Because there really is no way of overpraising the Prophet, right? 
praising the Prophet had, is limitless. The the poet said, in the فَإِنَّ فَضْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لَيْسَ لَهُ حَدْ There really is no end to the uh, to the virtue, the virtues of the Prophet ﷺ. But don't make him into more than a man, right? And this is what, the, so what did the Christians do? We have to ask this question. When we read this hadith, you know, what did the Christians do with Isa alayhi salam? Some of our brethren, they say, well, you're celebrating the birth day, the molid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. This is what the Christians are doing. And what, is, that, is that what he's talking about? Celebrating uh, a birthday? And um, I mean, that, uh, I think that's a pretty uh, weak argument. Um, the, the point here is not to make him more than what he is. Right, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, when he entered Medina and he realized that, or he was told that the Jews were fasting on Yomi Ashura, he says we should fast too, you know, um, and a day before or after. Right. Um, so, um, you know, this 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 certainly doesn't mean, you know, that you know, oh, you know, he's he's imitating what the Jews are doing, and I mean, this is the Prophet himself giving the command to the Muslims. We have a greater claim on Musa alayhi salam. He said, "Right, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is by consensus greater than Isa alayhi salam." Surat Maryam is basically a molid. It's a narrative of the birth of Isa alayhi salam. Allah is praising the birth of Isa alayhi salam. How much more should we praise the birth of the best of creation, sallallahu alaihi wasallam? If if Musa alayhi salam's exodus from Egypt is is commemorated by the Jews, how much more should we commemorate the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or the command of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? So that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about giving the Prophet a rank or a station of some sort that that is outside the bounds of acceptable theology. So what did the Christians do with Isa alayhi salam? They made him into the literal son of God. And what does that mean? That means that they said that Isa alayhi salam, his essence, that the, that the essence of Isa alayhi salam is divine. That Isa alayhi salam, when he was a human being, is really what's known as a hypostatic union of two persons, the human Jesus of Nazareth, but also the Logos or the son of God who has an eternal who has an intrinsic pre-eternality. So they're ascribing to Isa alayhi salam a divine quality. So don't do that with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. Don't say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam uh, has an inherent uh, divine quality that he's all hearing, he's all seeing, he's all powerful, this type of thing. This is what the Christians did with Isa alayhi salam. And this is what we're told to avoid. We're not giving any divine qualities to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Everything that he has is from Allah subhanahu wa taala, who is the ontological source of everything. Period. Uh, so, this is a good place to stop. Inshallah taala, we are in section, the middle of section nineteen. Inshallah, next week uh, we'll finish. Um, inshallah. I think there's 24 sections in this chapter, if I'm not mistaken. 25 sections. It'll be a bit difficult, but maybe we can manage it. So we'll see you next time, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم. so إن شاء الله تعالى we're going to finish our sessions tonight. this is our tenth session of the كتاب الشفاء by قاضي عياد. I hope you benefited from this course. Um, I hope you're inspired to learn more, inshallah ta'ala. There's a lot of great literature out there um, on the topic of the, the Shema'il of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and the Khasa'is, the special, unique qualities uh, of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And of course, this book uh, is, is great because it's very comprehensive and really a combination of all three genres of literature. So, 
you should have it at your house, even for baraka. Just have it on your shelf, pull it out every so often, and read a section of it. Inshallah ta'ala, Allah will bless you, uh, and put the love of the Prophet wasallam, increase the love of the Prophet wasallam, uh, in your heart. So we are on section 19, um, chapter 2, part 1. Uh, in my translation, page 68, the second full paragraph, that Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu used to ride a donkey and answer the invitation of the slave. So here, the section is again on the humility, the tawadu of the Prophet sallallahu In the battle against Bani Qurayda, he rode a donkey with a saddle cloth, which was haltered with a rope made of palm fiber. He said, uh, Anas said, that the Prophet ﷺ would be invited to eat barley bread and rancid butter and would accept such an invitation. He said that the Prophet ﷺ went on hajj on a shabby saddle on which was a fringed cloth that was worth four dirhams. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allahumma hijjatun la riya fiha wa la suma'a. That the Prophet ﷺ said, and this hadith is mentioned by or related by uh, Ibn Majah and others, that the Prophet said, Oh Allah, make it an accepted hajj with no riya, with no ostentation, with no showing off, or sum'a wa la sum'a, with no desire for reputation. So this is the Prophet ﷺ, this was his humility. When he conquered Mecca to Muqarrama, he entered it with the, with the armies of the Muslims. He bowed his head down while sitting on his conveyance, so that he nearly touched the front part of the saddle. His beard was almost touching the front part of the saddle out of humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this very powerful image of the Prophet sallallahu coming into Mecca during the conquest of Fath Mecca. And a hadith in Bukhari tells us, Abdullah ibn Mughafil, he says that I saw the Prophet sallallahu on that day and he was sitting on his camel, his she-camel, and he was coming into Mecca, and he was reciting Surah Al-Fatih, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ which according to many of the exegetes of the Qur'an is the final complete surah of the Qur'an uh, revealed. Um, when the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُرُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا And you see humanity entering the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, al-Islam, um, the religion that was perfected by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the religion that he brought is called al-Islam. And you see mankind entering in throngs uh, by the dozens. فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask his forgiveness. Innahu kana tawaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed is oft relenting, the one who is constantly turning towards us and accepting our tawbah. He is a tawab. That's why when we pray, we say, Ya tawab tub alayna. O oh, relenter, relent towards us. So this was his demeanor, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam coming into the conquest of Mecca. Again, this is a city that had kicked him out, that had persecuted him. Of course, he was raised in Mecca, so it had a place near and dear to his heart. Um, and when he came into the city, as we know, as we've said in previous sessions, he was well within his rights to extract vengeance uh, from those who had persecuted him. But he came into the city, and as we said, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Yawma Yawm Al-Marhama Today is a day of mercy, the exaltation of the, Qur of the Quraysh. And he came in sitting on his camel with his head bowed in humility, reciting Surah Al-Fatih. <clears throat> Qadi Iyad continues, one of his signs, one of the signs of his tawadu or of his humility <clears throat> is that he said, do not prefer me over Yunus ibn Matta. So Yunus ibn Matta is the, the prophet and Nabi Yunus alayhi salam. And do not create rivalry between the prophets and do not prefer me over Musa alayhi salam. And then there's a hadith here, which is in Sahih Muslim, when someone said to him, Ya khair al-bariya, O best of creation, 
the Prophet وسلم, said, Thaka Ibrahim السلام, That is Ibrahim السلام. So how do we deal with these hadith? Because it is absolutely um, a uh, cornerstone of our aqidah as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah to believe that the Prophet وسلم, is the best of creation. Imam al Laqani says in the Jawhara at Tawheed that the Prophet وسلم, is Khayr al Khalqillah. So how do we square this belief? which is absolutely essential with these hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. So Qadi Iyad actually says here that he's going to explain these hadith later, but we don't have time to do that because we don't have any more sessions, at least in this course. So I'll just give you some previews as, as to what he says the ulama do with these, with these hadith. So according to Qadi Iyad, either the Prophet ﷺ did not yet know at this point when he made these statements, he did not yet know that he was Sayyidu Waladi Adam, that he was the master of the children of Adam. Um, and thus this uh, prohibition uh, occurred before his full knowledge of himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is one possibility. Another possibility is that the Prophet sallallahu is making these statements purely out of his tawadur, out of his humility, although this is debatable. Uh, the third um, uh, possibility is that it is simply cautionary, right? That if we make these, or if we insist, if we emphasize these disparities uh, between the prophets, then that could lead to a type of uh, diminution or a type of a lessening of the rank of some of the other prophets and could actually lead to a type of disrespect uh, of the other prophets. So we should simply be careful. Maybe this is the meaning of it, that it's simply precautionary. But at the end of the day, we know the reality. And the Prophet ﷺ explained the reality, that he is in fact the best of creation. He's better than any prophet. He's better than the Kaaba. He's better than Jannah. He's better than the Arsh and the Kursi. He's Khayr al-Khalqillah, Khayr al-Bariyah. That the Prophet ﷺ is Sayyidu Waladi Adam, Wala Fakhr, he said, and I do not boast, and this is something that is absolutely essential in the aqidah of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. And also that the Prophet ﷺ is the universal messenger, that his sharia supersedes and cancels, abrogates all of the previous shara'ir. And this is also something that is essential, this is something that is grounded in the Quran, as we recited the Mithaq al Nabiyin. Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 81. You have some modern intellectuals who go by the name of perennialists, perennial philosophers who deny this aspect of the Prophet ﷺ, and they say that, that all of these covenants, all of these shara'i, all of these sacred laws that were revealed before the Prophet ﷺ are not abrogated and that all of these religions are valid paths uh, to salvation, valid paths to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that one really does not need to even believe in the Prophet ﷺ. Even if one is exposed to a sound prophetic summons, even if someone met the Prophet ﷺ and got to know him and knew the truth of his message, according to these perennial philosophers, that person can simply uh, res have respect for the Prophet, but continue worshipping Isa ﷺ as a Christian, continue believing in the Trinity, this is absolutely against the Qur'an. This is absolutely against the ijma' of all of the ulama according to Imam al-Ghazali, according to Imam al-Nawi, according to many, many others, according to the four madhahib of Ahl sunnah wal jamaah uh, and that this is a considered a, a, a clearly deviant position. It, it trifles with the very first pillar of Islam, not the fifth pillar or the fourth pillar, but the very first pillar of Islam, the definition of a Muslim is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. And it's true, and the perennials point this out, what about in the Quran, Isa alayhi salam is called a Muslim, the Bani Israel are called Muslim, Ibrahim alayhi salam is called, yes, they were Muslim. They were Muslim at that time and their sharias were valid for that time. But when the universal messenger comes, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when there comes to you a messenger confirming what is with you, do you believe in him and render him help? In other words, obey him and all the messengers and their ummah. Remember that Imam al-Razi said that because this also includes the ummah of these previous messengers. And that's indicated by the very next ayah, chapter 3, verse 82. 
uh, that when this messenger comes, you must believe in him and render him help. Do you take this covenant as binding? And they said, yes. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, uh, and, um, and I ratify this covenant. And I am amongst the witnesses. So the Prophet sallallahu is the best of uh, creation. And uh, uh, all of the, all of the prophets, all of the prophets considered him, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to be uh, their master. Now continuing having issues with lighting here. Um, please bear with the lighting issue. I don't know why that's happening. Maybe because the open window behind me has something to do with it. Okay, <clears throat> continuing inshallah ta'ala. That Aisha and Al Hassan ibn Ali and uh, Abu Sa'id al Khudri and others described the Prophet. Sallam, they said that he would uh, work in the house with his family. That he would, it says here, Qadi Iyad says he would delouse his clothes. Now, this is an important caveat that the ulama point out here that the Prophet ﷺ did not have lice. He's not delousing his own clothes, that he's actually delousing the clothes of his companions. And this is something that the ulama again make clear. But he would mend his own sandals, he would serve himself, he would sweep the house, he would hobble his own camel. He would take the camels to graze and eat with the servants, he would knead bread with them and carry his own goods to the market. Uh, this is based on a hadith of our mother Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. This is a hadith that's found in multiple books in different different wordings or versions of the hadith in Bukhari and Tilmidhi and others that the Prophet said that, that our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was asked, Ma kana nabi yasna'u fi bayti? That uh, what did the Prophet, what was the Prophet doing? What did he used to do in the house? And the Prophet and, and Aisha said, Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. But the Prophet ﷺ was in the service of his family, the service of his household, doing these types of jobs, mending his own sandals, right? Mending his own clothes, you know, cleaning up the house. Um, the equivalent of men today in the house, you know, washing the dishes, mopping the floors, uh, vacuuming the house, helping out with cooking. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was doing in his house. He was in the service of his family. I remember, I remember years ago, <clears throat> I was in a uh, Christian church, a Methodist church, and we were having an interfaith, a dialogue, and there was a female pastor, and she was an expert in the Old Testament, and she gave us like a 15-minute sort of tutorial on the Old Testament. And then afterwards, she asked her husband, she said, can you bring me a cup of water? And her husband went and brought her some water. And then another parishioner looked at me, and my wife was sitting next to me, and he said, that must be real culture shock for you. And at first I didn't know what they were taught, what he was talking about. What do you mean culture shock? So I kind of smiled, and, and then a few minutes later, I just I had to ask him, like, what do, what do you mean by that? And he said, you know, a, a husband serving his wife, isn't that kind of strange for someone from your culture, right? And certainly there are, uh, there are cultural, cultural aspects that are found in, in, in Muslim-majority countries that are problematic. Uh, but I explained to him that the Prophet wasallam is our role model, and he's really the person that we're commanded to emulate. And I quoted this hadith. I said there's a sound hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu where his wife was asked, and I say this many, many times, I've said in many, many khutbas, no one knows a man better than his wife. You know, whatever type of persona, which really means mask in Latin, whatever type of mask or persona he's presenting to the public, the wife knows who's under the mask, right? So she was asked, ma kana nabi yasna'ufi bayti. What, what was he doing in the house? Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. Yani kana fi khidmati ahlihi. That he was in the service of his family. This is our role model. The Prophet sallallahu was a very fa'al person. He was very active, energetic, was not lazy, you know, wasn't complacent, very active, doing things, going somewhere. Fa'ina tadhabun. The great one of the great questions uh, of the Quran that Allah will ask us. You know, he's asking us, where are you going? What are you doing? 
How's your life going? We should be progressing every day. We should be better. One of my teachers said uh, that if you, if somebody says to you, Kayf al and you say, same old, same old, then you've, you've failed. You should be, uh, you should be uh, improving on a daily basis. Even learning one word, you know, open a dictionary, English, Arabic, whatever you want, or do Spanish, and just learn one word. Increase your vocabulary. Increase your uh, ability to communicate effectively. You know, do something, do something around the house. Sell, help someone around the house. Go out and do something for someone. Buy someone a gift. Always be active. Don't be lazy because life is short, right? And, you know, Mama Ghazali points this out. You know, if you live 60 years in your life, um, which is about average, I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the reaping of my ummah is being a satin wa sabi'in, is between 60 and 70. Most people of the ummah will die between 60 and 70. That he himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, passed into the mercy of his Lord at 63 years old. So if you have a 60-year life and you sleep eight hours a day and you work eight hours a day, that's 40 years gone. So you have 20 years left. But you eat, you wait in line, you watch movies, you play on the internet, you engage with your social media, you know, whatever you do. Um, you drive in your car, some, some people drive in their car three, four hours a day. So what is really left in terms of study, of reflection, of worship, you know, don't think to yourself, well, you know, I got a long life. Just put it off. It's okay. We'll do it later. We'll do it next year. We'll do it in 10 years. I'll do it when I'm 40. I'll do it when I'm 80. This type of thing. We should be active. Very, very active. I remember like yesterday, the Y2K scare. That was 20 years ago. 20 years gone. And I remember it like it was yesterday. You know. So be active. Okay. A man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A Bedouin came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, uh, Qadi Iyad is mentioning this now. That and this man began began to tremble out of awe. He was awestruck by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Ali mentioned this earlier that when you first encountered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you were awestruck by him. Right? It, was, it was quite an awesome experience, an awesome spectacle, because not only was, did he demand this, had this, had this sort of regal quality to him, but physically he was very beautiful as well, sallallahu alayhi wa But then he said when you get to know him, you begin to love him. So this Bedouin was trembling, and the Prophet said to him, he said, Hawwun alayk, like, relax, take it easy. For inni less to be malik. And the hadith is in Ibn Majah that, that's related here by Qadi Iyad. That he, the Prophet said, I'm not a king. Now the Prophet is greater than a king. Right? He's better than a king. He's a Nabi. He's a Prophet. He's a Rasul. He's Khayr al-Khalqillah, as we said. He's a master of the children of Adam. He's the best of creation. So he's not a king, meaning that you know he's not a tyrant. Right? He's, he's not a tyrant. He's, 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 he's a Prophet. Right? Um, and so he has this type of humility. Innama ibn imra'atin ta'kuru al qadid. So he said that I'm only the son of a woman who used to eat like dried meat, right? Like like jerky meat. That's all I am. And again, and that's true, right? And that's that's who he is. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he's he's not telling a lie to this man, right? Uh, but he's trying to calm the man down because the man understood uh, the, the, the awesome presence before whom he was standing. Um, but the Prophet from his tawadur, this is how he made the man relax. Right? And this is from his, from his humility. <clears throat> the Prophet وسلم, now that, that's basically the end of the section 19. I'm going to move to section 20, which is, on, which is called his justice and trustworthiness. Decency and truthfulness. He says the Prophet وسلم, was the most uh, trustworthy, just, decent, and truthful of people. And even his opponents and enemies admitted that. He was called Al Amin, a Sadiq Al Amin, even before he was a prophet, or even before he was commissioned as a prophet, or you can say 
even before uh, this, the descent of the Quran, because the Prophet Sallallahu uh, was a prophet uh, when Adam is between ruh wal jasad, according to the hadith, between soul and body. So even if, so, here we're talking about before the commissioning um, of his nabuwa, which was in the year 610 of the Common Era. Ibn Ishaq said he's called Al-Amin because of his sound qualities, which Allah had concentrated in him. And Allah said, and he quotes these ayat again from Surah Al-Taqweer, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْرُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ ذِي قُوَّةٍ عِنْدَ ذِي الْعَرْشِ مَكِينٍ That indeed, this is the word or the speech of a noble messenger, possessing strength before the possessor of the throne of high rank, Muta'in thamma amin, obeyed then trustworthy. Most, he says, Qadi Iyad says, most of the commentators say that this Rasul refers to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, and some, and Imam Qurtubi mentions this as well in his tafsir, uh, and some say Jibreel alayhi wa sallam. So he's obeyed, right? Muta'in means obeyed. Right? He must be obeyed, or else one does not become Muslim. Part again, part and parcel of becoming a Muslim is to obey the Prophet Sallallahu Taslima. So again, the perennial philosophy: these people who who uh, who have infiltrated academic circles. Um, and um, give this strange interpretation to the Quran. Uh, they really have nothing to stand upon. By your Lord, they don't really believe, right? Until you, they make you a judge in all of their affairs, and you find no resistance. They find no resistance in their hearts uh, to your judgments, and they come to you salimu taslima in total submission, right? And that the Prophet is the obeyed Prophet. Muta'in thamma amin. He must be obeyed. If one disobeys the Prophet, such a person is not considered to be a Muslim. This is absolutely fundamental. This you would think is very axiomatic, very basic, um, very uh, um, common sense, commonsensical. When Quraysh disagreed and formed factions about who would put the black stone in its place when the Kaaba was being rebuilt, they decided that the first man who would, who would uh, come into the Haram would be the judge. Right. So this is a reference, of course, we read in the Sirah. There was something that happened to the Kaaba. Some sources say there was a flood that damaged the Kaaba and dislodged al Hajar al Aswad, the black stone. Others say that. The Quraysh were renovating the Kaaba. Allahu Alam, this happened around the year 605 of the Common Era. And so the clans of the Quraysh, um, there was almost a war over who was going to replace the Black Stone. And so the leaders of the Quraysh, they met in the city council, if you will, the Dar al Nidwa and Al Walid ibn Mughira. He decided that the first man to walk into the haram would be the judge. And of course, the Prophet Sallallahu he walks into the haram, and the Prophet is only 35 years old, and you needed to be 40 years old to serve on the council. Uh, but this did not preclude the members of the council from, from making him their judge. And in, fight, in fact, they were quite uh, delighted when they saw him opening, when they saw him coming through the gate, and they began to shout, Sadiq al Amin, Hada Muhammad, Sadiq al Amin. So they made him uh, their judge. It is said that Al Akhnas ibn Shuraiq met Abu Jahal on the day of Badr and he said to him, Abu al Hakam, there is no one here to hear what we say. Tell me about Muhammad. Does he tell the truth or is he a liar? And Abu Jahal said, By Allah, Muhammad is a truthful man and he never lies. And uh, obviously somehow this statement reached us from Abu Jahal, if it's an authentic statement. It's not cited here by the uh, translator. Uh, but the point here is that 
they knew his character. The Mushrikeen, they knew his character. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, which is a dalil qat'i, uh, which is mutawatir, that he's, Allah commands the Prophet to say, لَقَدْ لَبِثْتُ فِيكُمْ عُمْرًا مِنْ قَبْلِهِ Indeed, I have lived an entire lifetime, 40 years. Uh, you know, do I, do I make up stuff? Am I a liar? Do you know me to be a liar? Do you know me to be a sahir, a sorcerer? Am I a sha'ir? Am I a poet? You know, um, you know, how is my reputation, basically? And we talked about this also in previous sessions, that a man's reputation is very, very important. You could follow him potentially for the rest of his life. If somebody makes toba and they move on, right? And obviously we shouldn't dredge up people's past. We should always oh, sort of um, uh, just assume that this person has made toba and don't and don't talk about a person's past transgressions. But but those memories are always going to be there. And if one is a prophet, a prophet has enemies, and those enemies will not uh, uh, will not miss an opportunity to bring up things from the past. Um, it's like when uh, Musa alayhi salam, remember he was in the court of the Pharaoh. And he said, remember you did that thing, that thing that you did? And he doesn't, you can almost see him sort of going, remember you, remember that thing? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell the other people. But, you know, just to let you know I have some leverage over you. If I, I, I'll tell these people you killed an Egyptian and then how are you going to look? And of course, Musa alayhi salam did not intentionally kill the Egyptian. We covered that in previous sessions. And Musa alayhi intention was to break up a fight. He punched the man with his fist. He didn't stab him or something, like throw him off a cliff. Nothing like that. Nothing like the biblical version where it seems like he did have intent to kill the man and then he buried his body in the sand. Musa alayhi struck the man. He happened to die. So he makes toba to Allah because of a lack of restraint. He lost his temper, right? And the man happened to die. Certainly his intention was not to kill the man. It's more manslaughter any type of murder. Now, <clears throat> so, the, you know, they knew his reputation. In the Ahlid Kitab, they knew him as well. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah number 6, Ayah number 20 of the Quran, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ يَعْرِفُنَهُ كُمَا يَعْرِفُنَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ Those to whom we gave the Kitab, the revelation, could mean the Bible here. The word Bible means... The word Bible means kitab, biblion means book. Those to whom we gave the Bible or book or revelation in general before, they know him, ya'rifunahu, right? And ma'rifa or irfan is a higher type of, of gnosis. It's more of an intimate type of knowledge that they knew the Prophet intimately, as just as they know one of their own sons, the Quran says, right? So when the Prophet wasallam came into Medina to Munawwarah, uh, a Jewish man, um, he was first spotted by the Jews standing on their roofs. And then a Jewish man named Abdullah ibn Salam, who would later become a Muslim, anhu, he said, Araftu anna I can tell from his face, Araftu means to recognize, recognition, right? I recognized his face. I recognized that his face wasn't the face of a liar. So, so the ulama say that, it's possible that the Prophet ﷺ just had an honest face. And others say that, in fact, Abdullah ibn Salam, he recognized the description of the Prophet ﷺ because he was described in Jewish sacred text. So they knew him as well, and they knew his character. And we mentioned in the past Isaiah chapter 42, probably a very good candidate for what uh, Abdullah ibn Salam was referring to. Heraclius, the emperor of Byzantium, once had Abu Sufyan in his court, and he asked Abu Sufyan about the Prophet Sallallahu And so he said to Abu Sufyan, did you suspect him of being a liar before he said what he said? In other words, before claiming prophecy. And Abu Sufyan said, no, we did not suspect him of being a liar. Another Ibn al-Harith said, said to Quraysh, when Muhammad was a young man <clears throat> among you, he was the most pleasing, truthful, and trustworthy <clears throat> of you until he had white hairs on his temples and he brought you what he brought you. Then you said, a magician, 
No, by Allah, he is not a magician. One hadith says that the, the hand of the Prophet ﷺ never touched a woman over whom he did not have rights. In hadith in Bukhari and Muslim from Aisha, she said, Ma masat yadu Rasulillahi yadu imra'atin qat. That the, the hand of the Prophet ﷺ did not touch a woman ever um, unless he had rights over that woman. Sayyidina Ali describes him by saying he was the most, most truthful of human beings. Abu Jafar al-Tabari mentioned that Ali said, that the Prophet said, I was never attracted to anything that the people of the Jahiliyyah used to do, except on two occasions. It was mentioned by the writers of Sirah. And he says, both times, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came between me and what I wanted to do. Ever since Allah has honored me with the message, I have never even considered doing anything like that. So one night I asked a slave boy who was herding with me if he would watch the sheep for me while I went to Mecca to spend the night as the young men spend the night. I went out to do so. When I came to the first house of Mecca, I heard flutes and drums playing for someone's marriage. And I sat down to watch. I was suddenly overcome with sleep and only woke up after sunrise. So he's so, so watching this frivolous behavior and suddenly he basically falls unconscious and the the heat of the sun on his back actually woke him up and he said i went back without having done anything the same thing happened another time i have not considered doing anything like that uh, since so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from birth uh, to death right and that's why we have uh, these pre-commissioning miracles before his bi'atha, before his commissioning. There are, there are miracles called irhas. These are a type of mu'jizat, but before the bi'atha that are attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. For example, the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in his uh, early 20s probably, he went on a business trip with Maysara, a servant of Khadija, to Bostra in Syria, and there was a monk there, Nestorius, and the Prophet ﷺ, he sat beneath a tree there, and uh, Nestorius was looking at him in amazement, and uh, he took, he grabbed Maysara, and he said, who is this man under the tree? And Maysara said, he's a man of, of the Quraysh, one of the protectors of the Kaaba, the house of God. And Nestorius said, there's none other than a prophet seated beneath the tree. And then Mesara looked and some of the veils had been lifted and he noticed that there were two angels flanking the Prophet ﷺ. There's many stories like this. Of course, we know years earlier in the same place in Bostra, when the Prophet was 10 or 12 years old with Abu Talib, Bahira the monk noticed strange phenomena as well, supernatural type phenomena. This is an indication that the Prophet, um, his, um, his demeanor, his character, his actions um, were always protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Section 21, his sedateness, silence, deliberation, manly virtue, and excellent conduct. Umar ibn Abd Aziz ibn Wahhab heard uh, Kharijah ibn Zayd said that the Prophet ﷺ was the most sedate of people in the assembly. He almost never moved his limbs. So there was a tranquility about him, ﷺ. You know, sometimes you see people and they're jittery and they're tapping their knees and legs and, you know, they can't sit still. There's something, there's something off about him. The Prophet ﷺ was very tranquil, almost like he was in a meditative uh, state. Um, one can say that his heart was always in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in sleep, he said, Aineya, Aineya, Tanamani, Walaya Namu Kalbi. He said that my eyes sleep, but my heart is always awake, that his heart was uh, continuously raptured in the presence uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Sa'id al Khudri, he's related to the Prophet sallallahu sat in an assembly, he sat with his legs pulled up against his stomach by his hands. This is how he sat most of the time. 
And Jabir ibn Samura said that he sat cross-legged, like uh, in what's called the lotus position. It used to be called Indian style, but it's not politically correct anymore to say that. Now it's called the lotus position. And sometimes he sat squatting. This is also mentioned in the hadith of Qayla. He was often he was often silent and did not speak except when necessary, avoiding people who did not speak well. So we mentioned this in the past as well, and Qadi Iyad mentioned it in passing that the Prophet ﷺ was quite taciturn in his speech, meaning he didn't speak um, he didn't speak much at all unless it was unless it was necessary. And of course, we have multiple hadith that. Uh, that highlight the the excellence of the virtue of of silence, not taking vows of silence. That's considered a bid'ah to take a vow of silence. It's something that the previous ummah did uh, as um, as a type of vow. It's mentioned in Surat Maryam uh, that she did that. She took a vow of silence, as well as Zakariya alayhi salam. But this practice has been abrogated. Um, so, so there's many many hadith that 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 highlight the the virtue of of speaking little, right? Man kan yu'minu billahi wal yawm al akhir fal yaqul khaira aw liyasmut. Whoever believes um, uh, in Allah and His Messenger uh, should say what is good or be silent. Say good things or be silent, and you know. That doesn't mean you can't criticize because some because if it's if it's criticizing with a good intention and with adab then that's good that's good speech. Sometimes people or we need to need to be criticized. So it's not saying just say all good flowery things and if not then shut your mouth. No, if you're going to criticize, if you're going to raise an issue of some sort, defend something, do it in the best manner, right? Um, of course, man samata naja, the Prophet ﷺ said um, that uh, that uh, whoever uh, is silent is safe. Right? Of course, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever can guarantee for me the proper usage of that which is between his jaws and that which is between his hips, meaning his private parts, then I can guarantee for him entrance into Jannah. Right, entrance into Jannah. Right, controlling what you say and controlling your shahwa, your promiscuity. Right, and this is an age we're living in. Right, it used to be the pre-modern age where people had restraint and people knew things. And it, of course, we're not going to romanticize the pre-modern world. It was also extremely violent and in many ways as well, and and uh, and problematic. But people generally, their epistemology consisted of naql and aql, right? Of revelation and reason. And these things worked together, nurun ala nur, as we said. We move into the modern age, and naql is completely thrown away, and everything is aql, everything's rationalism. In fact, a type of empiricism uh, really is what it is. Um, a rigid type of imperial, uh, empiricism that if you can't prove it scientifically, you can't see it or smell it or taste it, touch it, then it doesn't exist. And then we move into the postmodern age where it's there's no truth. You can't take this. So it's not truth from knuckle and uckle. That's the pre-modern world. Truth is not taken from science, materialistic, mechanistic, like Newtonian physics. That's the modern world. Now, the postmodern world is there's no truth, capital T, and it's your truth, whatever you want to be true, and it's taken from feelings. It's how you feel. So you feel, if you're a man and you feel like you're a woman, then you're a woman. You know, it's all based on feelings now. Very, very strange time we're living in. But postmodernists and Satanists have something in common. Do what thou wilt. That's what Aleister Crowley says in the Liber Leges, the book of the law, which he contends was a satanic revelation uh, revealed to him from some demon, um, and that's the entire law. It says this is what this demon revealed to Crowley: "Do whatever you want, do what you, do do what thou will." Shall be the whole of the law. The Prophet ﷺ says in a hadith recorded by Imam an nawawi in the Arba'in, he said, "All of the prophets, all of the prophets said to their people, 'Ida lam tastahi fasnagma shi'ta.'" 
O Kamakala, that if you don't have shame, then do what thou wilt. So the meaning of this hadith isn't, okay, I don't have shame, I can do whatever I want. No, you should have shame. That's the point of the hadith. You can't do whatever you want. Um, but they always add this caveat, like people who live a promiscuous lifestyle, people who laugh at traditional morality, or, you know, um, marriage and, you know, just, you know, relax. What is this, um, uh, um, you know, relationships only, only in the confines of marriage? It's time, that's, you know, that's caveman stuff. It's time to come into the new century, man. You're not woke anymore. You need to get woke and, you know, uh, leave these archaic, divisive, traditional values behind. Well, you know, so these people are very promiscuous. And promiscuity, this is something that science has proven. Promiscuity, in many, many studies, leads to an epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. It even increases cancer risks. Um, multiple studies have linked promiscuity with clinical depression, because that's what they say. Do whatever you want, engage in any type of debauchery you want to, and they always add the caveat, as long as you don't hurt anybody, as long as you're not hurting anybody, how do you know you're not hurting anybody? Live, live, living a, prom a promiscuous lifestyle, multiple studies have shown, brings STDs, brings cancer, brings, uh, as we said, clinical depression, suicide, suicidality, which leads to domestic violence. Pr promiscuity leads to, to, to in, an increase in domestic violence, which leads to an increase of traumatic childhood for many, many children, which leads to mental illness and many of those children who become adults. And it's a vicious cycle. It's all based on promiscuity. People can't control what they're looking at. People can't control what's in their, between their hips, as the Prophet Wasallam said. Right? How do you know you're not hurting anybody? How do we know? Because we believe in revelation. In Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Bi kulli shay'in alim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows ultimately what is good for us. Okay. His laughter was a smile, and his statements were incisive, neither too long nor too short. His companions smiled rather than laughed in his presence out of respect for him and to imitate him. His assemblies, uh, his assembly was one of forbearance, modesty, good feelings, and trust. Voices were not raised in it, and disrespect to sacred things did not arise in it. When he spoke, his companions bowed their heads in silence as if birds were perching on them. So this is how they were completely raptured in the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And when, when he spoke, they were, their heads were would go down as if as if they were statues, as if birds would come and perch upon them. And this is something else that's that's lost. People, you know, because there are again these kind of postmodernists, many of them Marxists, communists, that want to equalize all of society, that we're all exactly the same. There's no differences whatsoever. So they want to destroy every type of social hierarchy, even in academia. You know, you go to academia, you have these, these professors that show up with flip-flops and tank tops because they just want to be one of the guys, one of the, you know, one of the young 19-year-old students. This guy's like 60 years old and he's dressed like a 19-year-old and call me Bob, you know, forget about teacher or doctor, this and that. Just call me Bob and this type of thing. Um, and this is dangerous because hierarchies work and history has shown that hierarchy, social hierarchies, they tend to work, and they work in the workplace. They tend they work in the family. It leads to healthy types of interactions between peoples, um, and they just simply work, right? And this this leveling of society, everyone's exactly equal. I mean, they've tried this in many countries, and uh, doesn't it doesn't work at all, right? And so the Sahaba they they knew they knew the the rules of the game. They, they knew who who he was. Sallallahu said them. And they knew that when they, went, when they were in his presence, it was not like in the presence of another one of them. They knew that this was the messenger of God. and He outranks all of creation and he would act uh, in his presence accordingly. Breaching adab, right, with, 
with the Prophet sallallahu is is as if one is breaching adab with Allah subhanahu wa taala. So we treat people according to their ranks, and this is a good way of dealing with people. Anzilun nasa manazilahum. The Prophet sallallahu treat people according to their ranks. This is also something that Confucius taught. He said, if if you if you treat everyone with compassion, you treat everyone the same. And you waste your compassion, and at the end of the day, you're not compassionate to anybody. He says one of the things that it is said about him is that he walked inclining forward. Like he was walking down a slope. In another hadith, when he walked, he walked with concentration. He was known neither to press forward nor falter in his gait, i.e., he was never he was neither impatient nor feeble. So the Prophet وسلم, he would walk with an intention, right? Luqman al Hakim, he gave advice to his son. Waqsid fi mashiq, waqdud min sawtik. Walk, and some have translated this like walk moderately, a moderate pace, but it also can mean walk with an intention. Walk uh, with, with, um, with, with uh, a clarity in your mind that you know exactly where you're going and don't let anything distract you. Right? Just to finish that second part of that statement in the Quran and lower your voice. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud he said the best conduct is that of the Prophet. Jabir ibn Abdullah said the words of the Prophet contained both elegant phrasing and easy flow. This hadith is in Abu Dawood, and we gave you already several examples in a previous class of. Uh, some hadith and looked at the absolutely exquisite rhetorical composition uh, uh, of those hadith, demonstrating the unbelievable eloquence of, of the normal speech. We're not talking about Quran. Quran is on a whole different level. We're just talking about the normal everyday speech of the Prophet وسلم, which again is also a type of wahi. Everything the Prophet said uh, is um, is revelation. وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوحَىٰ so uh, it's seven o'clock now. So, Jazakallah um, Khairan. I encourage you to um, continue in your education of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and remember and memorize many of these iconic verses in the Quran. Remember, we said twenty-one one o seven. Right, you have to you have to memorize this ayah. Look at the tafsir, uh, thirty-three twenty-one, thirty-three sixty-three, thirty-three forty, sixty-eight four, um, uh, chapter six verse twenty, verse chapter seven verse one fifty-seven. All of these beautiful uh, chapter three verse verse one fifty-nine, uh, describing the character of the Prophet Sallam, the rank of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, the. Uh, the, the beautiful attributes of the Prophet وسلم, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the Prophet وسلم. this is how we get to know him our primary source, the Quran and, and many of those hadith we mentioned as well um, the hadith of Rahmah the hadith of his mastery over the children of Adam these are things that every one of us should have memorized uh, so that when an opportunity presents itself to somebody we can explain and, and present uh, accurately uh, the Habib, the, the, the best of creation, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So please keep us in your dua. May you have a beautiful um, rest of your Ramadan. Uh, may you catch the night of power. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala give you a very joyous uh, Eid uh, and increase you and increase your family. Amin. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Muhammadin wa Alihi wa Sahih Wasallam. Wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa Sallamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh.